Right, and we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Phineas Flynn's Law. I'm here tonight with Robert Hughes, director on Phineas and Milo, and he's done a bajillion other things, too. So uh, why don't you just <laughs> go ahead and give a little introduction to yourself? Well, I've, I've done a bajillion things. Um, uh, I, I'm from uh, the Detroit area originally, and um, there was no art in Detroit unless you want to draw cars and I don't like drawing cars and I didn't discover animation until I was like in my mid twenties, probably. Yeah. Like my mid twenties. And that was in Chicago. And I picked up uh, freelance animation for, from a lot of shops and, and then uh, I moved out here to LA and I started picking up freelance animation. So I was one of the few people in animation who actually animated. Oh, just, yeah. Now it's like, if you want to be a director, all you have to do is storyboard. And, and then you work your way out. I've done pretty much every job in animation. I started as a cell painter. I don't have any of the cells that I painted, but uh, that was really fun. I, back, I couldn't believe it was. Back in the olden days. Back in the olden days, yeah. <laughs> now um, I just send everything off to the other overseas to get done. Well, there's a uh, program called U.S. Animation that uh, was an animation program and uh, it was a, a digital scan and paint function. I was working oh. on, uh, I was working at US Animation on uh, Beavis and Butthead, the new, this new show called Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> and we were all like uh, scan and paint and I was doing the X sheets and uh, it was funny, the crew was like, what is this crap? What is this? <laughs> you know. And I'm, I'm reading the X sheets going, wait, 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 it's going to be funny. It's going to be funny, you guys. And they're like, no, it isn't, you jerk, you know. <laughs> but uh, so at Composite, Composite took, back in those days, Composite took a really long time. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. You don't just throw it into After Effects. You got to. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, the, yeah, uh, I won't get into it, but uh, it did take about six hours. So To do like a single frame? Well, to do to do the sequence that we were working on. So, oh, it'll be ready at nine o'clock, and you know we're all done at six, and it's like, hey, let's get some beers and wait. I want to see this. You know? <laughs> so we all we got some beers and we hung out with the editor, and uh, you just kind of hang out and talk while they sit and edit it, and then oh, you get to see yeah, the finished yeah. work. Actually, everybody's waiting. We were all just waiting. It was in and it was compositing, yeah. and it's like it's up, it's up. All right, all right. You know, so we're all like half in the bag, and then we just pooped our pants laughing at it. It was so stupid. <laughs> yeah, so um, transitioning anyway, into uh, digital animation, though, like, what was what was the first thing, project you did that was digital? First digital was on Phineas. Actually. On Phineas, really? So before yeah, we that, started, like... uh, well, technically, I mean, uh, the U.S. animation thing would have been, and that was before Phineas. Yeah. Um, after uh, running around town and picking up animation, uh, some friends got me on Rocco at Nickelodeon, before it was Nickelodeon, where I was a, a animation timer. That was one of their first shows, right? Rocco's Modern Life? Yeah, it was It was so early on that it wasn't even called Nickelodeon. It was called, the, uh, the animation studio it was called Games Animation. And eventually Nickelodeon took over the anime. They would, <laughs> uh, they'd commission stuff from other studios. But eventually Nickelodeon started making their own stuff. Like, yeah, it's kind of like certain studios now where they'll farm animation out to just like a different company and then put it under their brand. Oh, yeah. I mean, Netflix is doing in-house and out-house and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So I worked, uh, I was an animation director on Rocco for the full run of that. I rode that one to the beach. I worked on a show called The Critic in between. I went over to another studio and directed a show that I is just horrible and I won't talk about it. <laughs> Uh, Those shows happen. Well, yeah, it was just dumb. It was a ripoff of Aladdin, and I'm like, whatever. But three of us, three of us ran that whole show. One of the guys that I worked with, and it really was uh, like a mash unit. We really were just three guys just, just go, get go, it go, out, go. get it. <laughs> yeah, Maurice, a guy named Maurice Morgan, who did all the layouts. I still work with Maurice occasionally. A guy named Kyle Minky, who who did uh, uh, all the designs. The legendary Kyle Menke would love that. Storyboard, storyboard supervisor. Everybody talks about him, man. He's 
Well, that's where I met Kyle. I brought Kyle over to uh, television. He didn't want to leave Fred. Wolf. Really? I dragged him over to Angry Beavers. Bravo. And, uh, well, not not Angry Beavers. I dragged him over to uh, to uh, Phineas. Uh, Maurice. I dragged Maurice over to Angry Beavers. So I worked on Angry Beavers for the full run of that one, and then uh, I I worked on Family Guy briefly. Did you meet uh, Dan while you were working on Family Guy, or did you meet him on Rocco? I met Dan on Rocco. Dan and Swampy were a board team on Rocco, so I knew I knew their style. I knew what they liked, and we all liked the same thing. Oh yeah, but we liked animation, you know. Exactly. Uh, one of the other board teams was had Steve Hillenberg on it, and uh, Steve eventually took over running Rocco. So that's how I knew all these guys. It was kind of neat. The we have a crew photo from Rocco, and you just look at everybody and go, "He had his own show. He had his own show. They had their own show." You know, no, 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 no. Everybody kind of started out there. And then there's Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I freelanced for a while, and then I worked in Europe uh, for a little while, and then I got a call from Dan and Swampy because the show that they had been trying to get done forever, finally got a pickup. And I was like, uh, I didn't even know about it. I came out to uh, Las Vegas to meet up some, with some people. And Just I'm have like, lunch and be like, what, is, what even is this show? What is this job? Why am I leaving Europe for this? I'm like, why? As long as I'm in Vegas, I might as well pop over to LA and see everybody. So I had lunch <laughs> with, with Dan and Swampy. And then Dan's like, are you going to take the job? I'm like, what job? You know, they didn't even bother offering it. <laughs> It's just like I'm supposed to know. So I called my wife and I said, well, they want me to do all the, uh, I was going to be the animation supervisor on the show. And I don't know if I want to move back to, and I didn't even finish the sentence. My wife was like, take the job. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, all right, fine. Um, I started, I said I was an animation director, which is what we used to call it on Nickelodeon. And uh, Disney didn't have a job called animation director i found out later they have a timing supervisor which is kind of the same thing but the animation director sits in on animatics and helps out with that so is that like uh as far as like timing director versus like animation director is that like making sure that each individual piece of animation is timed properly or is that like timing the whole scene timing the whole thing okay basically um um an animation timing director uh, translates the show's intentions to the overseas studio. Gotcha. It's like the, it's like the catcher on a on a baseball team. They're the only ones who can see everything. And the timers, we had the board, we had the designs, we had the soundtrack, we had the animatic. So we could put all that stuff in there and translate all that frame by frame into what the board artists need, or not to, to the what the overseas studio need to have. Right. Oh, I thought I had next sheet handy, but I don't. <laughs> um, and by then, I had been to Europe. I had been overseas. I have seen, I have been in the animation studio when the delivery was sent. And they opened the box and go, we don't understand what these Americans <laughs> want, you know? Yeah, because there's the but language the barrier, too. Of, well, our X sheets, there was always a delay. You'd send the X sheets, and then it took a week for them to translate it. So oh. anything we said on the exposure sheets had to be translated. So Oh man. Yeah, you can't the translation is uh it's a tough it's process. A real mess. Yeah. So yeah, it's not an exact science. Nobody you know, we we all just kinda made it up as we went along. It's like you're supposed to use the light overlay on this part of animation. Why did yeah. that not translate? So my tribute, my tribute to the translation was uh, I wrote a song. I uh, I wrote and, and other people helped me. I wrote uh, "Welcome to Tokyo" for uh, for Phineas. And the idea was they're going to go to Tokyo, and it's going to be like a sort of an anime weird bunch of weird stuff happens. Yeah. And uh, I just latched on to whatever the meme was at the time. I think it was caramel dancing. And yes, I know it's from Sweden. <laughs> It was just weird. It was just supposed to be weird. You know, and so many people have like given me a hard time about that. That's Swedish. That's not anime. And I'm like, eh, it's so funny. That dance kind of went very popular. Like I know that was like when that was a song they play at the Disney parks and they'd like have everybody do that dance. Did they really? <laughs> yeah. That was part of the dance parties they would do. 
Well, so for the dialogue, um, uh, I've never been to Tokyo. So I wrote, what I did was I wrote a little essay about Tokyo. Um, as if I was like in Tokyo. In Tokyo, much like Americans, we enjoy baseball. You know, we spend our summers, you know, at the baseball park watching baseball. And I took this little essay. We're in a subtropical zone and, and uh, here's a lot of things that we like to do. And I took the essay and I put it into a translation program and translated it into Japanese. And then I, and then I took that and translated it back into English. And that was our song. Really? That, that's how you can't? That's, yeah. As for the list of exotic amusements that lie between the summer there is here, we look at baseball like the fact that it does. It's like, what? <laughs> so, and that's, that entire song is exactly what was on that. That was messed up in translation. I tell you, so I lose much. it after Welcome to Tokyo. We're so glad that you are here. And then. <laughs> yeah, being glad that you are here, you came visiting Delightful Us. We're happy that you're here, but it's like you came visiting delightful us. <laughs> it was just supposed to be weird. And then at the end, uh, Dan put in Candace is like, I have no idea what happened. <laughs> that's a very fun sequence. It's very trippy. That's very weird. I think that's that's probably the one sequence where people kind of gave me a hard time about it. Yeah. It's just because of the caramel dancing. And I'm like, OK, whatever. I don't know. I, I was. I mean, it was. It was. I think that was like the only time we see Stacy's extended family in the show. So you took the opportunity yeah. to explore something different with it, at least. That was funny, Thomas. Yeah, uh, speaking Japanese. Stacy no tomodachi desu. Hey everyone, yes and Um Yeah, that was a fun little sequence. Just everybody the, uh, knows Phineas and Ferb. It'd be fun to see them go back to Japan at some point. I feel like that'd be a fun. Well, I'd have to go. I mean, Go I got to do research. research. Yeah. The only, uh, uh, I had been to Paris. That's why the Paris section in that one thing is so long because I had to. Oh, you kind of knew what was happening with the Paris section, like as far as yeah. how it should feel and whatnot. Oh yeah. I, I have a, I love Paris. I think it's, I think it's a, a great place and I don't, uh, I, I think, uh, Parisians probably don't know how much like Americans they really are. <laughs> And I wouldn't, I wouldn't mention it to him. I worked in Paris briefly, and uh, it was great. I had a great time. You work at like Disneyland Paris, or just like at a restaurant, or still an animation? No, I was working for the Berlin Animation Fund. I was a consultant oh. in Berlin, and we had a, a bunch of different shows all over Europe that I was consulting on and trying to basically sweep everything into a pile. To like organize it for the execs, or. Well, organize it so we could show it on American television because there were a lot of stuff that it just didn't make enough sense. Yep, British TV so, going to an American audience can some things can get lost well, sometimes. I didn't really have a problem with the British stuff. Uh, in fact, one of the shows was Swampy was working on it in Manchester, so I went to go visit Swampy in Manchester. Ah, and that show got eventually uh, they reworked it completely, and it ended up being called a thing called Sherm's Germs, which oh. I don't know if it's still out there. Did it, <laughs> what happened to it? Is it on a streaming service? <laughs> uh, you know, we, <laughs> we, just, we just make the bombs, you know, we don't drop them. But uh, uh, yeah, and I worked in, uh, I went down to Paris uh, to work with a, a studio down there and give them notes. And I can't tell you how happy we're, they were to have an American coming from Berlin telling them how to make animation because uh the the french love animation they they have they love like old disney stuff oh. you know, and they like making their own and, and art wise forget about it. some of the best art in the world you know yeah it just all fell apart at direction they're like yeah we're doing an anime look and i'm like okay could you do the anime look in the first act so that we're not surprising them at the end of the thing, and all of a sudden everybody's an anime. But anyway, I'm yeah. sorry. I, no, I digress. It's, it's good. It's good. I love the little tangents. Um, so uh, we talked kind of about what an animation timing director does. Um, so you did that through all of Phineas season one, right? Like, so what was what was what was that like on kind of the first season? Well, we uh, um, Phineas uh, was a premise show. There aren't a lot of premise shows out there. Rocco was a premise show also, and that's that's the reason Phineas was one. And in fact, uh, Disney didn't like the idea. They're like, no, we need to see a script. 
and you guys storyboard to the script. And Dan and I both know that you lose a lot of humor that way. Oh yeah, the artists come up with a lot of crazy crap. Yeah, you know. Um. Um. Well, I could. Uh, okay. Uh, the uh, the storyboard artist came up with um, uh, Vanessa as Doof's daughter. Really? That was a storyboard artist's idea. Yeah, Carl the intern, uh, the farmer's wife, the giant floating baby. Yeah, this, this is all. <laughs> all things. Yeah, Vanessa. Work. Vanessa was just supposed to be Doof and Schmertz's uh, assistant, lab assistant. <laughs> Edgy teenage daughter for that one. Bring your bring your daughter to work day. It wasn't a daughter. <laughs> it oh, it was, was just an assistant. Yeah, her name was her name. We never said it on the air. Her name was Vanessa Rockin' Body. <laughs> <laughs> because the board artist is he, a guy named Mike Dietrich. He worked on uh, the Twisted Tales of Felix the Cat. That's what I worked on him with. And he does his artwork is just wild. It's crazy stuff. So on his boards, he would always come up with really wild things. He came up with the uh, giant floating baby head. Yeah. But in animatic, um, I just said it as a joke. It's just like, what if you know, I'm taking, the line was, I'm taking the last escape pod. And he's like, okay, I'll see what I can do, you know. But I had her say before that, I had her go, by the way, this is the worst bring your daughter to work day ever. And then we laughed at it in the animatic room, Anne and, and uh, Dan and I, and it stayed in. So that's, that's where that came from. And if you watch the episode, we never set it up. It's a total surprise because we never went back and retrofitted that idea that he had a daughter. Wow. That's really unique. It's been so long since I've seen that episode, too, because that's... Uh, that's and that's then his ex-wife, I, it just kind of popped up. I mean, there's a point where she comes over and she's like, I am paying you way too much alimony. <laughs> it's like, so that's where he gets all his money. It's his wife makes the money and pays him alimony so he can... And that, that wasn't something that was decided on in series design. That was just came up with as the first season was going along. That came up in animatic. <laughs> That's, well, uh, Dan and I both worked on Family Guy. We know that Seth uh, liked to punch stuff up in animatic because yeah. he did the voices. He just grabbed the microphone and read something in and we'd draw it out. And, uh, I was in post-production on Family Guy and he would do the same thing in post-production. So, and it's like, you okay? You know? <laughs> Yeah. But when we got to Disney, Disney told us we couldn't do a lot of things. One of them was we're not allowed to punch stuff up. Well, first of all, they wanted it to be a scripted show. No punching. Well, they wanted it to be a scripted show. And we were like, well, we do, we do storyboards and we pitch them. And it's like, well, who does that? You know, and I'm like, well, it's kind of invented by Walt Disney. <laughs> you guys, do you want to step up, you know, and, and Dan... And Swampy both were persistent, and they got their way, you know? Yeah. Uh, our line producer came in and said that we couldn't change anything in animatic. <laughs> and, and Dan and I are like, why not? Well, that's not the way we did it on the replacements. And I'm like, with all due respect, this ain't the replacements. This is a different show, right? It's got a different uh, feel and different, you know, timing and... Well, we run into that a lot. Every new show that you go on to, everybody brings what they did on the other show as, this is the rule. Never look at the camera. And it's like, no, well, it's, the, you know, they can't look at the camera. You got you to work with what's best for the scene within the context of the show's you know, rules. Well, that was, that was always my thing. Is it's about the show. It's about the show. It's not about uh, your ego or your personality or my ego. It's about the show. It's about what's did best for the laugh? show. Yeah. Did it get a laugh? Yeah. It's in. I know, and that was that was the thing with uh I know Dan was talking about like in Candace, apparently there's like this big fourth wall breaking joke that the execs just really, really hated, but it got a laugh in all the test screenings. I bet I know what it is. <laughs> I bet I know what it is. It must have been the time warp thing. Oh but, uh, time warp. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about any of that. It's a it's a little teaser. But yeah, so with well, I didn't work on, uh, I told you earlier, I didn't work on Candace versus the Universe. Right. I went, I went over to uh, another show. Yeah, and I think I was going to talk about this, but like with you and Bob Bowen kind of going back and forth on Milo, um, was was that a decision like when they were doing the movie, like, like we want to give Bob this opportunity, or was that kind of like you just wanted to step down and do something different? Well, I had something else planned. Oh, okay. So you already just and, had something uh, else on the schedule. 
Yeah, it was it was Bob and my spinning chair. So they went with Bob. <laughs> <laughs> did did Bob co-direct with Dan, or is it like his movie? Like, because I know you co-direct with Dan on Second Dimension. Been, well, what happened was when we started Phineas, Dan was directing all the shows, and uh, there's a point in every production when you get first color back, where the person who's doing everything suddenly their workload doubles. Right. And I've seen it. I've seen it on so many shows and that's when they start, that's when they have their nervous breakdown or they get sick or, you know, and Dan was starting to not feel well. And, and uh, so we brought in uh, Zach to help out, Zach Moncrief. That was the show's first director. And then uh, I was the show's second director, technically. Uh, and the oh wow! So it was just it was just Zach and Dan for all of season one, and then when season two started, they brought it you. It was in. Dan for most of season one. Wow, that's yeah. pretty impressive. Well, he's a he's a busy guy. I mean, he's uh, honestly the uh, you, you think about it the uh, summer belongs to you. The uh, final musical number in that. Yeah. He boarded the whole thing. Himself. Really? That was all yeah. him. Wow. I think I think Wendy Jacobs Meyer may have helped out. She was a good she was a great musical storyboard artist. Yeah, it's always interesting to hear those things cuz like for people who kind of come onto the show and just do like a little part of a scene or whatever like they never get credited for it. It's always just whoever did the majority in the uh Oh yeah. in the credits. Yeah. So it's it's always interesting to hear about those little things cuz I know I think Dan didn't he write and board like the last scene of Actor Age with Isabella and Phineas? Was that did he board that? Because I know Danny Danny wrote most of that episode. If I recall, I did the uh, the bit on the steps where he's deciding to go to college. <laughs> it it hurts my heart so much every time when I see that because I just I just intern and lunch like no no but that's that's the point of it that's well, so the, good. The secret to that is uh, Tri State State is Michigan State and Danville U is University of Michigan and uh, <laughs> I went to I went to Michigan State so in my mind it was like. Phineas was deciding between U of M and MSU, and he's like, MSU! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, um, yeah, so what, uh, was, what was the first episode that you directed on Phineas, though? Do you technically? Remember? No. <laughs> it, it's the same thing I did anyway. The only difference was... You I, now had uh, the title? <laughs> well, I got into the room, I got into the room, uh, and I could talk to the storyboard people before they drew. Gotcha. Uh, we're promoting you from unpaid intern to paid intern. There it is. <laughs> just, just, just a title. Yeah. But we, uh, Dan and I would punch stuff up in animatic all the time. And there's a lot of stuff that, that uh, in the title sequence, we uh, <laughs> had Candace go, Mom, Phineas and Ferber are making a title sequence. We laughed. We put it in. The crew watched it and laughed. And we got a note. It's like, you can't put that in there because kids aren't going to know what a title sequence is. <laughs> and I, I quietly go, my kids would, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's such a weird note. <laughs> oh, no, we, you know, they. Uh, That's just everyone doing their job. It's their perception, and yes, everyone should have an opinion. Yeah. But uh, our standards, we really did kind of give and take, and and. Uh, well, I know Dan's philosophy is always, you know, you want to, like, if. If the kids aren't going to get the joke, that's fine as long as there's another one for them within like five seconds. <laughs> they're not going to turn on the t. They're not going to turn off the TV because of this joke. Well, that was it. Yeah, and, and we said, you know, if if the kids don't know what a title sequence is the first time they watch the the credits, they will by the time the second night they watch it, because they'll ask them. They'll ask their dad who's sitting on the couch right next to them. Like, Dad, what's a title sequence? You know. So we layered that show so it was appealing to everybody. We really did just write it for ourselves, but we didn't we didn't disinclude kids. I think it's so interesting how like in the first version of the title sequence it's just the background pictures are just bits from the the pilot or like the pitch packet kind of going by <laughs> in the background cuz there was no finished color. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the original animatic was really the song was infinitely different. It was more like instead of like the rocking version that it is now was, yeah, there that, was, was, was there ever that evolution with the milo theme song or is the milo theme song dan just kind of popped it out and is like yeah oh dan dan yeah he took that one home and did it himself he he had a song that he really liked and he i think it was two songs that he kind of ate together 
like that. Huh. And then Kyle Minky did the whole boarded that whole thing out. Which is crazy. That's that's like such an insane piece of animation. Yeah, <laughs> tracking shots in the past. Um, With three D cell shading too. Well, in the past, we had to kind of break up scenes because if you made a mistake, they had to reshoot the entire scene. Right. So if you did a scene that was, you know, 30 feet long and you made one mistake, you'd have to reshoot that entire 30-foot scene, which is why most old animators are like, no, no, most scenes are, you know, two seconds, one second tops. A lot of scenes are less than that. Yeah. You know, but with tracking shots and stuff with digital screw it you know exactly you, you can do it as many times as you want a bit. exactly and i know Got you guys it. kind of experimented with that on phineas too like a lot of the 3d stuff towards the end like night of living pharmacists and last is summer and well 3d kind of came along when dan and i were on family guy and they started using it as as uh for backgrounds tracking stuff when they're in the car yeah uh, automobiles um stuff like that so we we were kind of pointing that direction on on uh Phineas, um, I think, yeah, in the pilot, you could see some 3D stuff. Yeah, there is. There's like one shot of the roller coaster over the interstate. That... Yeah, but that was that was uh, that was computer plotting. Uh-huh. I don't. Basically, you, you trace off the way it goes onto a cell and then paint it. I think so. the crane was 3D too. Like yeah. when the coaster I jumps, think... bounces on the crane, and spins it around. I think the funny thing is when we when we made that, Dan didn't have the original storyboard. Really? They got he rid of the it? Animatic. So we basically had to do screenshots of the animatic and rebuild the board from screenshots. Oh, no. How did he lose the original boards? It was, I, I don't know how long he was pitching that thing for, you know. There, it was like 13 years. But yeah, it makes sense that, you know, he kind of got his way with the storyboard driven after 13 years. It's like, I'm going to push for it. <laughs> I've waited this yeah. long. I don't know if the whole board was that way. I think chunks, chunks of it were because I remember seeing these photostatic copies of, of the film, which it was old equipment. A different time, <laughs> different time. It was a different time, yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, what was your favorite thing about being on the Phineas crew during season one, kind of as the animation timer? Like, what was the best part of working on that first season? Was it the energy, the crew, or just... Well, it's always the crew. I mean, we, we had a good time, and everybody was really enthusiastic about the show. Um... <laughs> I was also given a tremendous amount of freedom, which, which I just fully exercised. Really like, really like, yes. And we were, uh, uh, you might see a difference in the animate if you really scrutinize it. The animation timing first season was a lot more flowery and a lot more boing boing. Candace running in place, going mom, mom, mom. <laughs> that that kind of disappeared after I wasn't timing supervisor anymore. That that stuff kind of disappeared the fluid but nobody seemed to notice more like I did. looney tune style sort of bits yeah yeah i mean it's animation that's yeah. that's where we're coming from and then uh because on rocco dan and swampy's shows really did have a lot of animation in them. um and uh they also had a lot of music in them so yeah one of the one of the weird things on Phineas is I actually learned how to write a song. Yeah. So you got to write a bunch of different songs with the team. And I think I'd, I would put it to bring this up later, but like what, what were some of the highlights of the songs that you wrote on Phineas? Well, Dan and I wrote ain't got rhythm. Uh, we, the initial session. And then, uh, I think Swampy and Martin came in with it. And who's, the, who's, uh, who's got the uh, Emmy for that? Didn't that one win the Emmy or was that just nominated? I nominated. Nominated. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think yeah another show got the Emmy, so we got to leave it over there. <laughs> um, but I do have burglary tools, so um, the uh, that was a fun one to write. We needed the thing, uh, the drummer. We got to get the drummer back in. And uh, I said it'd be fun if he. And I had just seen this uh, documentary about Arthur Killer Kane. There was a band called the New York Dolls. And Arthur Killer Kane was the bass player. And after the band broke up, drugs, all this crap. Yeah. Uh, part of his rehabilitation was that he worked in a library. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it was at the Mormon, the Mormon Center down in, uh, I think, Venice. And uh, he worked in a library. And I'm like, that's perfect. This, this guy, this, the, the character, I think it was, we called him Swampy. Yeah, it ended up being Swampy. 
everybody named the characters after themselves, you know, Sherm and Swampy. And, but uh, oh, it's so funny. I said I thought it'd be funny if uh, he he's telling him I don't have rhythm, but he the way he's canceling the books <laughs> is, is, in a, is a, yeah. Sorry, boys, fell asleep in a metronome factory. After that, I completely lost my sense of rhythm. I yeah. <laughs> I, I had a different gag for that one, but uh, but uh, I think Dan pretty much boarded that entire thing too. You know, that yeah, was that's, a good. Story. That's that that episode is iconic. I think that's probably the best from season one. Everybody always talks about do well, forget the band back together. The first song I helped out on was the bully song, but uh, he's I, a bully. I didn't, I didn't get credit for that. I didn't get your credit, but everyone was there, and I was like, "Well, we should, we should, we should, we should change this a little bit, do this." Yeah, I have a, on my website. I did a uh, uh, kind of a breakdown of how we did songs. I took two songs, and I kind of wrote. I, as the song plays, I write things in, saying what we were thinking when we did it. Yeah, one of the songs is the uh, the Troy song from. <laughs> A hottie named Helen who launched a thousand ships with her face. <laughs> and uh, the other one is a, uh, called The Sad French Song. When uh, Which Candace one? goes to visit Jeremy in, in uh, Paris and she can't talk to him. Uh, there was supposed yeah. to be just some sad music playing behind that. So I went, oh, let me write a, a sad French song. <laughs> so um, I, I just took a bunch of phrases French phrases, in, you know, and, and put them in there. Uh, could you tell me uh, where's the Office of Tourism? <laughs> um, uh, and I think the last line is, uh, the last line in the song is, uh, oh, too bad, my head is under the table. <laughs> but in French, it sounds, anyway, uh, those are on my website if you want to see that. But <laughs> the reason I brought that up is originally when we wrote the songs, we would sit in there and Martin Olson, uh, I don't think he gets enough credit. Martin Olson, well, Dan, both uh, Dan Swampy and myself, we were all in bands, you know, yeah. like, like you do. And Martin, you know, Martin's been excellent pianist. He used to be the, the piano guy at the improv in Boston. Like he, he'd play for the acts. Really? And stuff. Yeah, which meant you got to stay up all night with comedians, and that's just a ticket for <laughs> semester. Those guys, that's like probably anyway. Spit, spitballing jokes just tw for twenty. But we we knew, but none of us read music, and uh, Martin reads music. Oh, so he's so, kind of like the interpreter for everybody else's ideas for the song. Well, yeah, what I what I learned was he's like, well, that's a measure, and I'm like, it is. Wow, <laughs> you know, that's yeah. a. The, this is the bridge. And I'm like, is that what that's called? You know? And, uh, we would, we just knock out songs and then, uh, like we'd stay after work. We didn't get paid to write those things, but you did it. Cause it was fun. Yeah. we that, did. It that was part of being on the show and a part of the crew. And well, honestly, if they were paying for songs, they never would have used us. That's true. They would have hired, they would have gotten, they would have gotten you know, some hot shot of the day and, overpaid for something that was you know, <laughs> second secondary on his list of things to do. But um, so we'd, we'd knock out the song and uh, Swampy would always write it on a legal pad in red pen. <laughs> and we'd, we'd work it out and we'd do the bridge and then put it up and we'd all sing it, you know. And it's like, okay, okay. And then we go to Danny Jacobs and, and call Danny Jacobs was our composer. And uh, Dan would like, Okay, Danny, we're going to send you a song, so don't answer the phone. Let it go to the answering machine. <laughs> and then uh, he'd call back, and it's like, all right, this is Danny Jacob. And we're like, one, two, three, four. Da, 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 da. You know, we'd sing the song, and then we would uh, um, email him the lyrics, and then we'd all go home. And, and then uh, sometimes Monday it was morning. Friday night. So it was Thursday night. Monday morning, the song would come back, and he would have composed it and sang it and everything. We're all like, wow, we are great. But, you know, Danny. He worked a lot of magic. He did a great job. But And later on, we discovered garage bands. So we could actually... Test stuff uh, yourself. and. Well, it, it worked better because the uh, it had a digital signature. Oh, digital right. Thing. So you can so, keep it in tempo. 
yeah, we could use the rough in the animatic and it would it would be the same frame. Right. It would actually move forward without the final song because Danny Jacob would use the exact same meter. That's interesting because so, like, yeah, speeding up or slowing down a song can be like a good or bad thing too. Like you can kind of play with it. But that's that's really interesting. Yeah, from well, this is a timer talking, so that's yeah. That is always my concern is how many frames. Like um, uh, most characters walk on twelves. Yeah, every frame is its own separate project you got to work on. I mean, Nobody knows about that anymore. No, nobody cares anymore. On uh, Storyboard Pro, they they mark the frames, but they also mark one second, twelve frames, which which throws a lot of old animators off. But uh, yeah, yeah, nobody nobody really cares anymore anyway. Yeah. So yeah. in so in season two, um, you kind of talked about how the position kind of camp and you're doing the same thing. Was there a, a big challenge at all switching to directing for season two? Anything that you just had to overcome, or just same thing? Because you'd already done it on. No, you know what? By then, by then, I was familiar with everybody on the crew, and, and... it just was a kind of a team conversation. Yeah, we were all we were all working on the same show. You yeah. Know? And if, if a gag was funny, it was in. And my my philosophy of directing is I don't want to do anything. I want, I want you to hand me a perfect show that I'll put my name on, you know? Yeah. And, and a lot of times, you know, you get the fish on the line and I'll help you get it in the boat, you know? Yeah. So, uh, good, good philosophy. Well, yeah. And, and, uh, I mean, I mean that's kind of the job as the director too. You're bringing all the different parts together into the boat, so to speak. Yeah, I, I haven't run into a lot of directors who do it that way, you know. It's like you really do get the best out of people by being nice. Yeah. Let not them by, express themselves and bring what they have to the table. Yeah, not by working them to death and then firing them on a Friday, you know. <laughs> it's like we uh, – that's another thing. I would always uh, – it's not working out. Well, let's put them – Put this person somewhere where it would work out you know yeah. maybe maybe they shouldn't be a, a board artist maybe they should do revisions for a little while until they they come up to speed um, play to their strengths yeah maybe maybe you should go to props you know do props can they use you in paint can they can they can they yeah you know we'll find another place for you don't worry yeah. but uh, on the other end of that i didn't know what everybody's was capable of Unless you kind of give them an opportunity to show their stuff. Some people were better writers than artists. Some people were better artists than writers. Some people were dead on. Uh, the, a guy named Ed Rivera, I used to use him for the close-up stuff because he was such an excellent clean line and everything. Oh, I yeah, there's so many different styles of boarding. Like Some boards like very rough, very pose-driven. Others are like, it looks like it's just on model, and then they just have to color it in afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, well, we were an animated show, and it was more important to give the drawing life than to be on model. Yeah. And uh, because deep down, nothing that we drew ended up on television. Right. It's all... What, what you're looking at is what the way it was translated in China or in Korea or in, you know, the Philippines or Canada or wherever you, your production is done. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, with uh, as far as... Um... Oh, I, I wanted to tell you when uh, when I started, uh, I called myself an animation director, and they didn't Disney didn't have that title. Yeah. So they, uh, and every job has a number for accounting, and I didn't know this. And my job didn't have a number, but yeah, it worked out, whatever. And uh, we went to an event, and they're and uh, I'm like uh, Robert Hughes, animation director, and they're like, "You're not on the list." And they go to the la end of the list, and it's like, "Oh." You're the uh, uh, the head of catering. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Yeah, job number eight seven six five three nine three eight four. And I'm like, so what they did was they found another job that paid the same, and, and just used that as, as your payroll. <laughs> so technically, I was head of catering. <laughs> oh man! So when I became a director, that was easier. That was job number one. You know? The industry is a crazy place, man. <laughs> well, Disney Disney had a lot of rules. And uh, we did kind of shake them up. We we made them 
do things differently. Yeah, and I think you can definitely feel that impact throughout how Disney Channel has done with animation. Oh yeah, going and, forward, uh, we we really did kind of bulldoze it for for uh, the shows that followed us, fish hooks, um, you know. Yeah, now now you see shows like Gravity Falls that are like a Keystone show, where like people who worked on that are coming and having their own shows at Disney and. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's really really exciting stuff to see. I like Star. I thought that was fun. Yeah, Star was a fun show. That was a fun blend of slice of life, but also, you know, had its story beats. And then for seasons three and four, it basically became an anime. It was just it was just an anime. <laughs> yeah. Well. I I, uh, I thought it was hilarious that his mother always took him to karate lessons, and then one day he actually used it. He's like, I know karate. Like, <laughs> I thought that was really funny. That was a nice little, uh, nice little tweak. Yeah. Sorry, I, I went off on another tangent. No, you're good. So one of the things I wanted to ask about Phineas is, as the show progressed, I think it did get more on model, and the lines definitely got cleaner season to season. Was that something that you know about, like why the art style progression kind of occurred on the show, like? We just use different people. People get used to drawing it. Yeah. Um, we had, Dan would have drawing classes, and Dan created a uh, a dance Bible. Oh. This is where Phineas and Ferb differed very much. Uh, what uh, Dan learned on Family Guy was you have to kind of fool the animation studio into doing what you want. Um, we had charts. Uh, you slow into a move or you slow out of a move. Right. And Dan figured out that if you just hold on that one, that kind of counts as a slow in in television. And, and you get a little more punch to your drawing. A um, lot of little things. Um, I know, yeah, with a lot of animation, like, in, like that's kind of in the style of Phineas and Ferb with camera moves, there's not a whole lot of easy ease. It's just very kind of, you know, moving the frame. Is that a stylistic choice or is that? No, that was digital. That, that was, was digital. That's bumping all over us, yeah. Digital limitation. Yeah, but uh, one of the other thing that uh, Dan introduced a whole lot of people to was to focus on the upbeat of a song. The downbeat, everybody knows, da, 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 you know, yeah. but nobody thinks about the upbeat. If you see other shows, you have somebody dancing and they're like, yeah, like this, and then they just take the pose and flop it. So they're going like this, <laughs> you know, dancing. Yeah. But what Dan did was put Dancing. in the upbeat, the, the middle pose where they go, nah, nah. And now so you have something that looks more realistic. Yeah, the background characters who are at the concert really are, you know, they're playing the upbeat. And, and it's the simplest thing in the world, and it made it so much brighter and more appealing, you know. Yeah. So we did the dance Bible. And the other thing was the strum on the guitar. Whenever you strum a guitar, the neck comes up. Ah, I I do think about that. Yeah, especially like in the opening titles and do we get in the band? Yeah, I'm giving you some great animation advice here, and it, it is the silhouette. The silhouette's very important. Yeah, having a strong silhouette. And props props to the guy who always gets mentioned about Disney handed him the branding package for Phineas and Ferb to put together, and he came up with, "Hey, their head shapes are the letters of the of the." That's uh, Lance Lance Lacombe. Um, <laughs> I think it was Lance. It's like, that's brilliant. And it's like, you just come back one day and it's like, oh, oh, wow. Didn't even think I of that. I had a friend who was an editor and he was responsible for creating the fonts on a bunch of shows because nobody else wanted to do it. Like he... Oh, see, that's, that's, that's like the type of stuff that I love, like the visual design of the whole show, like how it, how it looks and feels. The fonts are a part of that, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, even as a prop, it's like... Um, they look at the note. It says, "You know, your mother is in a cage. You, you got to use a font." Yeah. And, and uh, before you could actually just type it in, you know, Caslon, whatever. Laura uh, Ipsum. You had to literally write it. So a lot of times, um, the fonts didn't arrive. Like uh, they're reading a letter, and they never got the writing on the letter. So. You, you see it in the cartoon, and it's like, <laughs> it's just like chicken scratch. It just scribbles, yeah. It's just embarrassing, you know. And it's just, it's just one of those production things that's tough. Yeah, it's just a little thing that slips through the cracks, and then every time I see it, I go, ah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, my daughters can't watch cartoons with me because I'll like, no, ah, they blew it. Yeah. 
Okay, so they set that in the wrong order. Kind of moving on to like season two and three of Phineas. So you got to be co-director on Across the Second Dimension. And I know Dan has talked about how like when they did the movie the first time, they gave it to board pairs, and it just became these eleven-minute tangent segments <laughs> of the movie. And so he and Kyle and like you had to work to go back in and fix the whole thing. So what was it like to be a director on the movie like that? But then also. Um, but what was your favorite of those 11 minute tangent segments that we'll never get to see? Uh, the initial time we did that was summer belongs to you because Dan, Dan and Swampy wanted that to be, I think they wanted that to be the first Phineas and Ferb movie. Oh, that was supposed to be a 90 minute movie that they wanted to show in theaters. Oh, yeah. So, uh, the final song number, that's why he boarded the final song number because he was using it as a promotional tool. I assume so um hey and to be fair that's a very impactful song that, <laughs> and the, it's four minutes oh it's great it's a great yeah I have, love, that's my favorite episode by the way the, really the yeah. to, you, yeah. to have four minutes of screen time for a song in animation that was just like unprecedented yeah. <laughs> like so it's it's crazy that it made it well um we uh that was the show where it's like yeah everybody got everybody got a chunk and then we literally put it up in the bullpen and look at it and go, oh my God, how are we going to make this into one big thing? So we really did duke it out and uh, yell at each other. I stormed out at one point. Oh no. Um, what was it over? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, Buford making the bet. Oh, did, was it because that, was, that felt out of character? Well, no, I was making Buford too big of an asshole. Ah. Uh. And, uh, somebody was defending that it wasn't and he got really mad at me and i'm like dude it's it's a show it's not personal <laughs> yeah it's like uh you know what irony is yeah <laughs> you ever heard of i will irony? say like as far as like where that takes place in the series like i feel like buford it's like almost a little bit of a regression from where he's grown to at that point but like for the for the story like it makes sense that you know it's yeah. there. but oh another another thing they didn't want us to do i I had a thing for standards. Uh, if I had a gag that I really liked, I would put like a really horrible mean thing or something outrageous around it so that the executives would, you know, focus on that. And then when my good gag came through, they'd still be writing. So I would, I would do, I, I would throw them a red herring. <laughs> and I had this gag where uh, Phineas said, uh, oh, is, uh, Candace said, oh, it was weird seeing Jeremy and he's like weird like uh seeing your teacher at the grocery store weird or somebody you've known for a long time starts wearing a cowboy hat weird <laughs> and I wanted that gag in there because to me it, that was totally Phineas he was always planning something he's yeah he's, in, he's trying to connect he's, totally he's like I think I'll get a cowboy hat and start wearing it yeah you know, and that's that's based on an experience that I had where I was like I remember uh I'm going to be in junior high. I could just show up with a cowboy hat and everybody would think, Hey, he always wears that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the thing that I put in before that to keep, so I could keep that joke because it was weird. It was a weird joke. Um, I did a bit where literally Isabella's head explodes. That, and that made it in too. <laughs> <laughs> left it in. But when we got to, uh, when I got to that part of the pitch, we had to stop the pitch. The cowboy hat thing just almost killed one of the executives. He was laughing so hard. We had to stop. And I'm like, yay! <laughs> so that was, that's probably why it's my favorite show. Oh, man. I, I got to... Uh, you got to keep I, both. Uh, yeah. Man, that's but, uh, Did you direct like half of that? Were you working with another director on that one? Or... I, think I did the whole thing. Really? Wow. It was only an hour. But it was... Uh, <laughs> oh, only an hour. <laughs> A lot of times, see, we all know this. It's like uh, a lot of times people, um, they just go with the segments that they have. We're used to producing 11-minute episodes. Right. And uh, basically the hour is for 11-minute episodes because it's only 88. Um, but you have to, and we had to, we had to kind of talk to the line producer about that. It's like this first segment we're almost done in animatic. Well, you're, you're way behind schedule. It's like, I'm not locking this until I lock four. Yeah. You know, because if I come up with something here that I have to go back, then we have to crack that back open. So you're just going to have to be patient. 
you know. Right. You want well, you want to make sure if you come up with a new joke, you have a setup for it earlier and rule of threes and all that a, fun comedy stuff. It's a full story, and to me, a story is uh, it's the same as a song. Uh, Eric Clapton said it was the same as a guitar solo. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's a little bridge, and then there's the the end. Exactly, and that's like why the three act structure works is because every song has the same structure, but every song is unique and good, and that's why you can have the same thing for film and TV. Well, yeah, that's, it, it, it is a human rhythm. That yeah. is just rhythm of storytelling. Shakespeare, you know, Greek yeah. tragedies, Greek comedies. It it is just the way things flow. So we we knew from Summer Belongs to You that. Um, you can't just do 11 minute acts. So yeah, when the other one came up, yeah, we did have to coordinate a little more, but it's not that hard because we're all working on the same show and everybody likes to see what everyone else is doing. Was it tough and to do the movie like mid production of Phineas, like without really a stopping point or did they give you a stopping point for it? it was... Ah, we were workhorses, man. <laughs> we, you know, you work, you work as late as you have to kind of thing. Just push forward. Yeah. Just, just move forward because you know, Worst day in animation is better than the best day doing anything else. Exactly. Yeah, I'm still that Sal painter going. I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> yeah, you get you get to do the color and everything. Yeah, look at me, seven fifty an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the movie. Um, yes, yeah, just stories from the movie and the production of that. Just feel free to take take it away. Well, this was. Uh, um, I'm trying to find it on the list. I had a bunch of. Uh, stuff all written down the uh oh did i freeze no you're good okay as far as i, I can I, tell I oh wait I wait well, before you go into candace against the universe somebody said will we see cabin puss in candace against the universe <laughs> <laughs> cabin puss was like the i don't know who came up with cabin puss like, nobody's able to answer i've asked everybody who comes on it's like nobody can pin a name to cabin puss i think it, it had to be Scott Peterson. I'll bet you a nickel because he was always kind of ribbon swampy anyway. You know? So I know they were trying to solve the Cavendish Farms issue with that one where Josh was really attached to the Cavendish Farms pitch um, and Dan Swampy kept saying, no, we got to find a way to get to this part of the story without Cavendish Farms because it's not in character for Dakota to have a farm of Cavendishes. And then... Uh, they had to, there was, a, Josh was saying, like, they pitched, like, Phineas and Ferb returning from Milo in space to help him build the ship, or fix the yeah. spaceship to get back in space, and apparently there was just a lot of, getting to Sphere and Loathing was a, a challenge <laughs> <laughs> on Milo. Well, the, uh, because uh, Milo was scripted, uh, everybody spent a lot more time in the writer's room. Yeah. <laughs> and... I would kind of check in when they did things, when they had like major milestones and stuff, I would check in. But the rest of the time I was on the floor, you know. Managing and, storyboards and. Yeah. You know. There was a question, you asked a question somewhere where how many shows did you work on at one time? And on Milo, it could be up to 12 shows in various stages at the same time. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I had a file folder for each and I kind of knew where everything was. And, you know, because you break down the script with your storyboard person, you don't have to talk to them for two weeks. Exactly, and then you see what they come up with, and then you work from there. While they work on it. But what I do, what I would do, not now, obviously, but uh, I would just go visit everybody on the crew at least once a day. Just kind of wander over to their cubicle, and it's like, you know, well, that's a good-looking sandwich, you know, or, or uh, how's your dog? Did he die or what? Yeah, you know? keep friendly relations, good conversation going, make you, so it's not like, I fear the director. <laughs> Wait, yeah, but it's easier, you know, when you're drawing, it's like, shit, I should ask about that, and then you'll forget about it, and like, I come by, and it's like, oh, 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 I have a question, wait, 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 look, 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 you know, and exactly. they have the board. Right and you there. solve, you solve problems like that, yeah. Yeah. Somebody yeah. said, nobody came up with Cavin Puss, he just appeared. <laughs> <laughs> He's a being. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought he was horrible. <laughs> yeah, he really cool. is. I remember Dan teasing him on Twitter for the first time. The fans, we freaked out, man. It was, <laughs> it was, it was wild. I'll bet you it was Scott. I should ask him. Yeah. All right. So yeah, kind of back to. We'll get to Milo a little bit more later. But yeah, back to Candace oh, yeah. or not Candace. Uh, across the second dimension. Across the second dimension. Yeah, I have to remember what that one's about. 
The second dimension. Yeah, that was a good one. We I that was, that was the movie. Yeah. We totally scooped the Avengers, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, with the, the ending scene being with having to take out the beam to the sky. Yeah, the, the robots coming out of the tallest building in Danville. Yeah. But I can't be too sure that there wasn't a comic book person on on the crew who had <laughs> read the comic, if that was actually in a comic. I never read comic books, so I was like when we did um when we did the Marvel thing, I was like uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know anything because the movies weren't out yet, you know. Yeah, so you're just kind of going in blind. Did Did you direct the Marvel one or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, I don't know if this. I I think Sue might have done part of that. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> we had enough people on the crew who were fans of the Marvel thing. I got a couple of good stories on that one. If you don't mind. Oh yeah, go go into it, please. Yeah, if you don't have anything second no, mention, Marvel never saw the movie, and we had the characters. Um, our we had Spider Man. We included Spider Man with the Avengers. Iron Man never got out of his suit. Uh, none of them did, actually. Yeah. But uh, their powers got switched with this beam, so they each had each other's powers. And in the pitch, um, during the fight scene. Iron Man grabs Thor's hammer and whoa, you know, the lightning. And then the we had the Marvel guys in the meeting with us. And I I dealt with Marvel before. I worked on a show called Superhero Squad and and in working on Marvel stuff, those are like the notes that you cannot bend. Yeah. Because the universe is their un I'm sorry, that is the way it is. And Even I, within I, like T V. Well yeah, and I came to respect that. I'm just like, all right, mitts off, mitts off. So the Marvel guy says, no, he can't pick up the hammer. And Dan starts arguing with him. <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> it's just like, and uh, as they're arguing, I'm like, oh, this is, this is gold. So I'm writing down bits of the conversation. And Dan's starting to get kind of mad about it. It's like, it's not about worthiness. And it's like, well, this is, then how does he fly? He can't fly without the hammer, you know? And I'm like, oh, this is good, this is good. And uh, Dan was so mad at the end of the animatic, I'm like, I got an idea. So we just had them have the same exchange that Dan had with Iron Man and Thor had the same exchange that Dan had with the Marvel guys. So that's how we got around that one. It's like whenever we had something that wasn't working or something that was really stupid, we shined a light on it. But yeah, like what, what is not working about this? And how, <laughs> how, light on how can we make it stupider? Make it the stupidest thing ever. It's just like... Mjolnir like, gets the the... The wheel brace. <laughs> Bunnies are falling out of the sky, and it's just like you just cut to somebody who's like, "You, you created a bunny farm. You didn't buy any bunnies. Did you think they were just gonna fall out of the sky?" <laughs> There's a really fun gag in Mission Marvel with the doof. He's like looking for an extension cord. He like oh, yeah. he like goes down. He's like, "This one's too long. Too long." Like, like, what? How are the cords too long? <laughs> What's happening? That was Kyle. Uh, this one's too long. <laughs> Like, this is too, too short, way too short. Why do I even have this? Yeah, that was Kyle. The other one was, uh, uh, I had Spider-Man, you know, yeah, we can do that this summer or something like that. And Phineas is like, well, there are only 104 days in summer vacation. And I had Spider-Man go, 104 days? Where the heck do you go to school? Yeah. <laughs> they cut it. Ah, uh, for time. Got, uh, Mar well, the Mar <laughs> The Marvel special is so funny because the first time that aired, they forgot to, they somehow exported a version where like three or four of the songs didn't have the lyrics. So the whole <laughs> Surfing Asteroids musical number that the special opens with was just instrumental the first really? time it aired. Yes. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> and I was talking to Aaron about it and he was like, that was my song. It was this huge promoted special that <laughs> Disney put this huge campaign into and I was opening it with singing. And <laughs> I don't know. Did he sing... Oh, shoot. Epic Monster Battle. He didn't sing that one, did he? And the other guy gets up again. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. That's a real Kyle Minky scene. The clouds are he, parting. Our hero is risen. Oh, wait, no, he's up again. He's up again. That but is he did it with such Axel a fun Rose. song. Oh, yeah. We, I tell you, my no, sister I, and I crack up every time. It's like, thou hast mail. That was uh, a guy named Joe Arancia. Joe Arancia is 
one of those guys that knows everything. Yeah. It's like the reason, you know why they say the wise man is at the top of the mountains. It's like, oh, God, here we go, Joe. And it's like he'll tell you the whole story about how, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire when the Catholic Church took over and <laughs> they had to take all the documents and hide them somewhere. So they put them at the top of, you know, and that's where you go to search for wisdom. And, and everybody's uh, just sitting there like, what but are it's you true. From this? <laughs> it's true. So when we did... Um, when we did our medieval episode, uh, I'm like, ooh, stick close to Joe. And it's like, Canavir, haul the water. Canavir, go accuse the neighbors of witchcraft. <laughs> because because that really happened. They would send the girl out to accuse the neighbor of witch. You know, and I'm like, all right, cool. Ah, done speaking like this. Mom. Thou hast mail. <laughs> The yeah, we biggest had a good raspberry I'd ever seen. <laughs> that goes down the spiral staircase as he's narrating the story. <laughs> is what I said because I had my hand over my mouth. <laughs> oh, man. That is a really great episode. Yeah, that was. I forgot about that one. We had a good time doing that one. I like uh, Baljeet trying to explain logic to Buford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it anything like hysterical uh, hearsay? Yes, in that it is the opposite of that. <laughs> oh, and you brought back uh, oh, Poof and Plots as the troll for the bridge. Oh, yeah. It's like the character. Yeah. She's just, there's she, just... <laughs> her voice was so... Uh... Yeah, and then she's like, three! And then Baljeet's like, you know, the water's not that deep. We can just go around. <laughs> the answer to your riddle is an egg. The answer to you your know what that is? It's a haiku. It's a... Uh... Yeah, he said it as a haiku. Yeah. That's a, uh, I think it's a, uh, I think it was a Lord of the Rings thing. I actually, I have not seen Lord of the Rings. I'm so ashamed. I have not seen it. I need to. Well, it's read it. On my, really? That was, no, no, it might have been, it might have been The Hobbit, the, the riddle battle that uh, Frodo had with uh, Bilbo, or with the. Uh, oh, okay. I have, I do know that scene. Bilbo I've, I've read, had with Gollum. I read The Hobbit and I've seen The Hobbit. I don't know. Well, there was a lot of that too. They were in the Inn of the Prancing Platypus. And they had taco salads. <laughs> He's a By spy. By the way, uh, the uh, shepherd spy joke was totally stolen. <laughs> I, I stole it from uh, an old radio show called The Goon Show. Spike Milligan. <laughs> and uh, I was kind of on a goon show kick. They did another one where the uh, they were starting up an airplane and the prop just flew off. Yeah. So I thought it'd be funny when Ferb holds out his sword. He's like, ha-ha, ting-tong. All right, fine. <laughs> Plan B. <laughs> yeah, that Malef Schmerz Evil Incorporated, but not really a corporation because corporations hadn't been invented yet, so it's more like a guild or a tradesman association. <laughs> that was Joe. You know, the uh, the funny thing about uh, Duke's song is we, I did that in animatic just as a joke. Oh, the, the jingle? Yeah, the first the first show. I forget what it was. It his, was well, the, his, his building hadn't been decided on yet. And early on in production, because like for the first couple episodes, he switches back and forth between this really generic building, and then yeah. the iconic one that we all know and love. It was uh, Flop Stars, I think. Yeah, Flop Stars had the generic building. So the first one we sang, the, I just sang a jingle, and they thought it was funny. So Dan got up and he like sang it into the into the uh, animatic, and then we, like the second time we establish on the building, it's like Doofus Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> We're still using the record scratch, even though nobody. You know, that's not a thing anymore. I still love the record scratch. That's such a fun yeah. animation thing. Just it's it's well, that's, that's just the thing. We have to like update things. I remember one of the board guys going, Well he should oh no no, this is funny. He should get up to turn the channel on the television and when he does the and we're all like, What? Who gets up to turn the channel <laughs> on the television, old man? You got yeah, yeah, and you gotta think through stuff like that about how oh, everybody gave him such a hard time this program. <laughs> Oh man, that's fantastic. So yeah, I think uh, did you did you work on? Okay, there's one I did want to talk about. Um, Where's Perry? Nobody ever talks about the Where's Perry special, which oh. I love. I love the ultimate oh. the ultimate irony of that is that nobody says Where's Perry in the entire special, and no <laughs> nobody points you that noticed, out. Did you? Yeah. Is that I, the one with the rooftop song? The the uh, they go up on the roof and they sing a song and he comes back. Or am I thinking of? No, that's Come Home, Perry. That's a thing. That's, a different that's the one with the regurgitator. The regurgitator. Uh, I haven't seen him since, you know. <laughs> since I haven't seen him. No, where's time. Perry's the one where they go to Africa? Oh, and living yeah. with monkeys. 
Well, we did the uh, the Savannah song. I wrote that one. Oh, that's that was, such a good song. I love that I one. I love that song. That's a really good one. Yeah. It came out really well, too. That whole episode, the first part of it has, like, so many songs. It's, like, it's basically a full-on musical. Second part, I think, just has, like, one. But, like, as a whole, the special still. Well, we tried to do one per 11 minute, you know? Yeah. So we still treated it like that. But, uh... Um, Summer Belongs to You, uh, Rubber Bands, Rubber Balls. Yeah, but like Evil evil for Extra Credit with Carl and him becoming evil and... His little dance. Yeah. Uh, cool. There's there's another bit from that that like I always come back to. It's like, he's like, uh, have you tried the smoothie machine? It's like, Madagas and Deuce like, mm, Madagascar chocolate. It's like, and Carl's like, you can really taste the Madagascar, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like the one where, uh, um... Where they were in prison. Yeah. Five hundred yards. That's the length of five football fields. Like, oh, that's oh, that's that's field is... that's the mind swap one. That's uh... mind swap. Mind share. Mm, we're love... coming to Earth. We're going to I love that whole Shawshank Redemption thing. <laughs> we're that gonna was, raid uh... lots more. <laughs> that was Mike Dietrich and uh, Mike Singleton boarded that one. And Dietrich's just like. Anytime we needed aliens or anything, Morg and his buddies, that those are his designs. He's a storyboard guy. But he's good at draw them designs. so clean. All we had to do was clean them up when we had the design. That's so cool. Yeah, I could, yeah it was like a he was like a double threat. But um, I just love the there's gotta be a guy like me in every prison in the galaxy. I'm the but, guy who knows how to get things. <laughs> at, at the end when they're crawling back in, he just keeps saying, That's the length of uh you know, a large medium drawer file cabinet, a Nimitz class submarine. Uh, I actually did the math <laughs> on that. It's like, how long is a battleship? How big is a file cabinet? And they do add up. And, oh, I'm, like, and I'm like, what am I? What am I doing? <laughs> it's worth it for the joke. Nobody cares. But, no, the, but a lot good. of a lot of that stuff, if you go into, if you go into it, you'll find that it really does make sense. Yeah, that dude um, plot was he was he was going on an online date <laughs> and he lied about square dancing. <laughs> Perry's his wingman. <laughs> so he's like, her name is her name is Rosie. She's from Hazel Park <laughs> near the racetrack in Detroit. Hazel Park is is where uh, when I was growing up, that's where all the hillbillies lived, <laughs> <laughs> and that was near the it was near the uh, racetrack, Hazel Park racetrack in Detroit. That's so funny. See, like you'd never know that unless. <laughs> No, that's that's a that's a joke for my uh, Detroit friends. Yeah, I, I doubt anyone noticed that one. <laughs> my parents like Perry's friend. Perry's trying to motion what Deuce should be saying, and he's yeah. like, "Well, we should we should point at our mouths and rub our stomachs." <laughs> rub our stomachs. <laughs> now we put our head in our hands and shake our hair. <laughs> oh man, that was a good one. That's a good joke. That was a fun bit. And then I think that's tied to Not My Problem, which is another one of my favorites. Um, it's where they build the Gordian Knot. I'm oh, yeah. Jeez. On that one. Jeez. That's, uh, it's funny. Uh, the premise, we would get the premises, and they would work out the premises with the Disney executives. And then we would break it down for the board team. So the director and the, and the board team, we just sit in the room and look at it and go, how what huh? and then we'd have to get the writer back in and go what is this it's like well we wanted it to be this but then we had to change it to this now it's this and it's like so if we put it back to the way it was would you be they're like yeah yeah, yeah. so it's like Arr. i know dan always talks about like how they solve the stories usually with figuring out how the two plots are going to intersect first and then they kind of work backwards from there work backward yeah well yeah yeah that was handy that one's that one's they made the it's funny because they don't address. They made the knot out of licorice, and Doof has the all you can eat inator because he's trying to open up his his <laughs> Drusel Stinium buffet. Didn't see that one coming. In the end, it, it, it hits Candace, and she just eats the whole knot. That was really weird too. Fur yeah, pulls I... out the umbrella, <laughs> <laughs> and then Buford gets his line. I'm so in love with her right now. This <laughs> is a fun <laughs> callback to Second Dimension. That was uh, you know, the uh, the crush between the. Uh... Uh, Herb and, and uh, Vanessa. Yeah, that was, was that a board artist idea? That was Antoine Guilbeau. He Inventor he, of the 30-second crepe Guilbeau. He just whipped that out in a pitch. 
and nobody saw it coming. We all just shit ourselves laughing. It so, funny. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, Ferb. And then, and then in the uh, the act your age, he like pulls up. He pulls up in this hot sports car, and, and Vanessa's in the car with him. It's like, dude. And she's like, Ferb's taking me to get Ukrainian food. <laughs> I think that was a Bernie Peterson joke. It was either Bernie or Joe. Like, how cool is Fur, man? He yeah. Gets and that's what they bring his name up is actually Ferbs. That's what it was short for the whole time. Was it? Well, it's actually short for Fred. Um, oh, really? A friend of ours, she she uh, she just called her husband Fred. She just always called him Ferb. So, and, and so it was they're a friend short of Fred. Yeah. Interesting. It was always firm. It just didn't. Because like in, I... that was that was a joke. It was like in I think an early season two episode where Ferb was like, actually, it's short for, and then he never gets to finish what his name is short for. Yeah, I pulled that one. Um, Belgique was uh, actually named after a guy that both Swampy and I had worked for, or worked with in London. Um, but I think we gave him. And yeah, we changed his last name or something like that. Yeah. I was always I was always a little hinky about, you know, picking on Belgique. So that's why um you know, they got to be buddies after a while. Even an act your age, they're just they're still hanging out together. Yeah. You know. Cause we're yeah. frenemies, we like disliking <laughs> one another. Yeah, that was it. But Did they you write had, that uh, one or No, I didn't work on Frenemies. That was uh I think that was Jay Lender, I think. Was that the makes sense. And I remember him working on the song for that. Jay and I worked on uh, the Wizard of Oz episode. He was starting and I was leaving. I left the show for uh, a little while to go work on my own stuff. So there's about 20 shows in there between the Wizard of Oz and uh, uh, Summer Se- Belongs to You. Season three, that yeah. I, <clears throat> that I, I know nothing about. Huh. About, about 20 shows. Have you ever gone back through and binged the series or just... Nah. You know, I got my favorites. I yeah. watch them. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, my daughters were watching it, and I'm just like, oh, and I'll come by, and then I'll just start telling stories, and they're like, shut up and let us watch it. <laughs> we just want to enjoy the show. It's like, but this I is used to use them for uh, standards notes. I used to run the standards notes past them, like when my daughter was seven. Um, oh, and see fin- if they picked up on... Yeah, Phineas is like, we're going to need a stage, and Isabella says, I'm on it. And we got a note. It's like, kids aren't going to know what she means by that because it sounds dirty you know what? and uh so i showed i showed the girls uh my daughters the animatic and i said and i paused it at that point i'm like so where do you think she's going and she's like she's going to get the stuff to build the stage she's on it and i'm like seven year old knows so you know we dug in our heels and said yeah they'll know yeah it's okay it's okay <laughs> so somebody's bringing up the disembodied reggae space voice um <laughs> uh, yeah, arguing with the soundtrack <laughs> i love that song ice cream in space i did a um that was one of the songs that we did on garage band and they've so, got dan's deep sync voice it's like yours then we got a situation well it was it was nice because i got to do uh i would just lay in the parts i do the bass do 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 do, 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 do. And then on the piano, it's just like blank, 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 you know. And and that was like the whole song. So I did a uh, after we did the demo that we sent to Danny Jacob. Uh, I re-edited it into a like a reggae dub, and it's like one of the weirdest things. It's like I, I love that song. It's so much fun. And then in the what I like about that too is in the end credits. Like they they do it again and Balji's like we've already been over this and he's like it's the lyrics <laughs> disembodied reggae space boy. I thought that was funny. Buford's actually heavier on the mode because <laughs> he he gives him the he gives Balji the flying elbow. Yeah. But if anyone said why is he so why is he so mean to Balji? It's like he's it's he's just an older brother. That's all. Yeah. That's not, it's not violent. It's it's not hatred. It's just, he's just being an older brother. They, they do this stuff. Exactly, know? yeah. yeah. The, the sibling relationship. I, I, know, I don't know what the running the underpants up the flagpole always was about, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where that came from. Grab your swimsuit 
and your peanut butter and meet me at the flagpole in 20 minutes. <laughs> that was that was a fun episode where the Candace gets split into the two Candaces, romantic yeah. Candace and and busting Candace. <laughs> and then like the, the, the opening gag for that episode is that like Baljeet has gotten Buford's chocolate in his jar of peanut butter. And he's just so upset about that old commercial <laughs> about the chocolate being in the peanut butter. I remember we had uh, we had one bit that a board artist had put in, and she put in an internet meme. The gag was um, Candace, you know, mom's leaving. Am I in charge? Uh, no, your father's in charge. Where is he? They're watching a TV show, and they're watching something on television <laughs> that's so stupid that the mom goes, "Okay, you're in charge." But the board. They literally put in this internet meme, and it's like we could get it, we could get it, and I'm, I'm like, yeah, but in the nine months it takes us to turn this into a cartoon, that'll be long gone. So we just got to come up with something stupid, something stupid. So I just grabbed my guitar, and uh, I just sang "Horse in a Bookcase" into the animatic thing. Oh, that's that was you. You came up with the legendary horse. I actually, in the I actually sang that. <clears throat> I'm a told, horse in a bookcase. I told Ed Rivera, and I'm like, draw a picture of a horse in a bookcase. Because I couldn't even visualize it. <laughs> and he came up with this drawing where he's literally in a bookcase. And I'm like, that's brilliant. I love it. And uh, Ed and I were talking about it like the other day. And uh, I, I looked it up on the web. And somebody has taken that song and looped it for an entire hour. <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with you people? But what, what, what I love about that gag is that like the song itself is funny enough, but then, and, like at the end, it's just like here's a horse in a book, and then just like the horse neighs. <laughs> it's just like such a you're fun in, punch to the joke. You're in charge. Just a little button on something stupid. But... Well, and, and then that that came back in like the Marvel special, like relevant news update: horse in a bookcase is canceled after <laughs> 19 season. Yeah, I put that in. I was always referring back to my own stuff. See, but that's what's so fun about Phineas is that the, if you pay attention to the jokes and stuff, everything just comes back and pays off. Well, there's there's a lot of stuff where you can I could like be really selfish about stuff and nobody would even know. <laughs> like uh, um, the Halloween thing when when Ferb is mixed master with the the big head thing. Um, vampire queens dig pimpernels, but we had a. I, I said we should just get a DJ and give him like a bunch of songs and he can mix them together. It'd be kind of cool, you know. Yeah. So all the songs that I picked were songs that I wrote. So I <laughs> <laughs> and then when I've heard the final mix, it's like, ah, see, uh, they put in other songs. Like, I think Dan caught me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun episode, though. That's That was, I think, the first time... That was big for the fans, because that was the first time a, a continuity point was really referenced with uh, Stacy and knowing Perry's identity. And oh, yeah. They they bring that back with her recognizing monogram as the water and power guy, which was like yeah. that was water. that was like wait did Phineas just do something with continuity what <laughs> what is this and Vanessa knew who Perry was that's true yeah but I mean she like knew. it was like following up on a on a plot point like they they had character growth and progression obviously oh yeah and they were watching the uh, the ring movie <laughs> <laughs> the grievance grievance yeah. Ah. The Grievance 4? I'm not even sure if that one's canon. And she, yeah, she gets her hair all wet. And it's just like she comes crawling out. Disney really hyped that episode up. Isabel, happy birthday, Isabella. Oh. Cause I, had a, I had another song written for that. and uh, That's uh, an underrated song right there. Today is my oh, birthday and there's just one thing oh, I'm wishing. Dan and I wrote a song for it. Oh. And, I came back with mine. He's like, well, I already wrote one. I'm like, but, but. <laughs> you should release song. the demo of that if you have it. That'd be interesting to hear. I still do, yeah. Yeah, put that up on your YouTube. Let's share that it was, uh, yeah, was it a birthday song. Yeah, she want, She just wanted time alone with Phineas. That's what she wanted for her birthday. Uh, yeah, and that's yeah. that's what she ended up getting. And that was fun because they never show. That was one where the board artists just never show what the big reveal is they had for Isabella's birthday. They just, they just kept that out of the... Yeah. The well, it was fun. I mean, like I said, we were all... Everybody was working. Everybody was trying to crack each other up, and that's what kept us motivated and, and coming up with weird stuff. Yeah. 
But I mean, it was it was one of those sort of like, they you know, they never did anything with Stacy knowing Perry's identity. We're like, maybe there's something will come of that in the movie. Please let Stacy know that Perry's an agent in the movie. We also withheld information just to bug people. Oh well, like there's there's dumb oh things that people complain about, like oh who is Phineas's dad? It's like no, we don't need to know that. That's not not important. Well, that that was one of the main things about Phineas is that, uh, and Swampy brought this up. It's like, you know, not every family has a mom and a dad. Exactly. And the only time you hear about families like that is if something bad happens. It's like there is normal. You know, yeah. there's a lot of broken, uh, you know, parents are divorced and everyone's doing fine. Yeah. Which was, which was where we came from. The idea of uh, uh, Doof going on a date with, with uh, Phineas's mom. I don't know where the hell that came from. <laughs> but you know, it's funny, John Barry and I both were in a constant, constantly trying to make Jeremy more interesting. Because he wasn't even supposed to be a character. He was supposed to be a running gag that he never appeared. <laughs> I know, but he was just, he was so nice. We were both like, ah, give him a personality. And he's the guy who came up with the, hey, Momo, Jake, how's it going? You know, he, sassy Miss K. <laughs> and then he doesn't give Candace a nickname. <laughs> Which was kind of funny. Couldn't come up with a nickname for Candace. He has, but, uh, he has, he has personality in Milo Murphy's Law. <laughs> His cameo gets upset at Cavendish and Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> You came to yeah, our drive-thru, just... ordered every one of our burgers, and drove away. We were just so milk toast. We were just like, oh, God. <laughs> what does Candace like about him? You know? I think it might be just me, the, me more the idea of Jeremy rather than, than Jeremy himself. But... Well, you know, it's hard. We, uh, we had uh, um, Candace was tough for a lot of people. To write or to draw? Yeah, because you don't want to make her just an insane girl. It's like, that's just not fair, you know? Right. And, and a lot of the board teams uh, would divide up. Um, Kim and Kaz, Kim uh, Roberson and Kaz, no last name given. Uh, anytime they did a show, Kaz would do, always do the Doof and Perry and Kim would do the Candace stuff because she was really good at it. She, she introduced stuff that I, I, would, I never would have thought of because I'm a dude, you know? Yeah. And, and she introduced stuff that was just hilarious. But every now and then I'd say, no, Kaz, you do, you do the Candace stuff and Kim, you do the Perry stuff because just to kind of, you know, mess them up every now and Put then. Put outside and of the comfort go, zone. Yeah, they go, okay, okay. And the second I left the room, they'd switch back. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Aliki had a lot of, a lot of good stuff too. Oh yeah. She was really prolific on, I know, especially Night of the Living Pharmacist. She had the whole scene that got cut with. I want to say Phineas and Isabella actually kissed in that episode, and then it got cut t- towards the end of <laughs> Pharmacists. No, there was a... Where did she kiss him? It was a, it was the Second Dimension one, right? Yeah, she right. actually kissed him in Second Dimension before their minds got erased. But yeah, that was a leaky scene. It's like... So yeah, Carl... No, really? and Phineas is like, no, no, wait, wait, wait! <laughs> like he wanted to remember. Yeah. Oh, man, the movie was so good. It was adorable. <laughs> I, I, I watched the deleted scene too there was a cut gag where they're all just standing there and Perry's still there in his hat and he's just like oh Perry you should, you should go stand over there and I was like I can see why you cut that because I just totally ruined the emotional hit of that scene oh. <laughs> you know I, I also got a real kick out of the Star Wars episode oh yeah Star Wars that was Star big Wars. Star Wars is one of those things I actually saw Star Wars at the theater and I took a date that's how old I am wow yeah, and, and we drank slow gin in the parking lot. That's how old I am. <laughs> Illegally. But uh, don't drink slow gin in the parking lot, kids. Um, Go with driving theaters coming back. This is relevant advice. <laughs> yeah, well. But uh, the, the thing I liked about Star Wars, we had, well, Kyle was a huge Star Wars fan. But uh, there was a guy on, on uh, John Mathot actually had a, uh, like a Star Wars blog. He knew everything about Star Wars. And it's just like, uh, the hardest song we ever wrote was the Tatooine song. That is such a good song, though, man. Well, usually we could knock the song out in one session. We had to revisit the Tatooine song. We had to do it again the next night because we couldn't come up with enough cool things about Tatooine. (laughs) You know, because the gist of the song is, look at all this great stuff. We love, you know. Everything. 
womp rats and you know and to make it all rhyme (laughs) yeah anchor walk towers and and you know and and, uh math thought uh kind of guided us through that he was pulling stuff from the video games and like because he knows all these other references about you know so uh, in the end we did come up with enough stuff to uh <laughs> stuff to come up and i finally got to tell these star wars jokes that i thought of for so long like the can, fact can that, we blame this on representative binks <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> he's been dead for, for years well my my joke was the uh, i was always thrilled that the uh, stormtroopers couldn't hit shit <laughs> they're just like pew, 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 pew. and i'm like yeah. this is the future maybe some sort of sight on this gun would help yeah uh, and the fact that they're wearing plastic armor. It's yeah. Just like, it's like, why are we wearing belts. plastic? Like, it still hurts. Ow! It's like, ow! But you're wearing armor, but it's plastic. <laughs> and then uh, Dietrich came up with this great thing where he's like looking at his timeshare in Alderaan. <laughs> and then just in the background. <laughs> and I'm going to make a mint on this. And it, what? What happened? Zero. The entire planet blows up behind him. And people were like, oh, Sue, uh, oh, I, I put that line in uh, one of the songs. You'll be blown away, just like Alderaan. Ah, oh, that's, it's a sith It's a really yeah. cool machine. And the other director, Sue, is like, ooh, oh. And I'm like, too soon? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not a real planet, right? <laughs> and it's 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 Darth and Schmert singing it. Yeah, <laughs> the sith thanator Man, that's, that's, I think... Well, that's a lot of people's favorite special. It's just so well done. The music is amazing. The animation's great. They didn't put a time limit on it like a lot of other specials, so they just let it go as long as it needed to be. Well, that's what's kind of neat about uh, Netflix is they don't care how long anything is. Yeah, you can play it as, you know... Keep well, it's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, a lot of people need to wrap it up. Well, the, it, 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 like, it allows creativity versus like broadcast kind of forces creativity to get the story told in 11 minutes yeah i i didn't work on uh, i haven't worked on a directly on a netflix thing yet so i have no real experience with that. yeah but uh it all comes down to money <clears throat> so if you've commissioned an animation studio to do this much work and you send them this much <laughs> it ain't gonna work yeah so it's in everybody's best interesting uh best it, brevity is the soul of wit so one of the, one of those things that I noticed like in TV animation is like shading is kind of used like sparsely like you know like light light shading and other stuff like that is that something that you have to like mark on the boards and that costs extra to do because like not well, one, one of the thing about like Night of the Living Pharmacist is like so much of that looks like more three dimensional than the regular show because everything is like shaded because of the setting of sunset and nighttime. We had to do dark, yeah. Is that well, uh, is that something that costs director, more? Or that's just a stylistic choice. Just a stylistic stylistic choice. The art directors uh, are the ones who call all the colors. This is this is like the most underappreciated uh, person on the show. Oh yeah. You need a rainy day. the The ground's got to be shiny. Yeah. You know, you have to see. You're not going to see shadows. You're going to see reflections of the bottom of the character in the water which is going to be a whole nother thing you got to deal with character a character goes into the water and they just disappear at the water line no you're going to see a shadow down there and it's going to have to move you, yeah there's so many things that that everybody just kind of takes for granted and in the case of uh the uh the zombie episode that was a mood choice yeah so that, that was its own art direction and yes it was a lot of extra work for the art director and the painters and everybody everybody on, on that crew but uh, and that's my thing I know a lot about animation but I don't I don't know nothing about color I <laughs> I don't care you know I'm a shape guy color color is tough because with how we all consume content on so many different screens and with so many different brightness levels and settings yeah. it's like how do you make something that's gonna come across all those things? if you want if you want the hard sell I mean colors Color, you can't have a war without colors. Yeah. Does, did did know, Phineas who, ever, did the show ever change from like where you have the action guidelines to being 4 3 so that, because like everything was like 4 3 up until HD kind of became standard? Did they ever change the action? 4 3? Like uh, aspect ratio of square versus oh, rectangle. Because yeah. <laughs> like, I know back in the early 2000s, it was like everything had to fit in that square for 
regular TVs that weren't, you know, widescreen. Yeah. Um, but as HDs become more standard, do they like with Milo? Do they like just say use the full screen? You don't really have action safe guidelines or? Well, the nice thing is that all came along uh, as we were getting into digital storyboarding, so changing that was pretty easy. You could just you yeah, could just change the field. The uh, um, the show was pretty straightforward. We weren't doing you know. It wasn't um, like Avatar: The Last Airbender or anything. Water <laughs> shots or yeah. <laughs> We weren't we weren't really pushing it that far, you know. Because, Animation wasn't the selling point of Phineas and Ferb; it was the tool to deliver the comedy. Yeah, but but we had it in our at our disposal. Yeah, you know, we needed it. We 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 kind of took a stab at anime. It kind of worked. Yeah. <laughs> we do an animation episode. I forgot about that one. Yeah, where they become tunes. Oh, did, did you work on Ferb TV? Did you direct Ferb TV? Yeah, that was me. That, oh my gosh, that's one of my favorite episodes, just because the amount of insanity that gets put into that. It's like, <laughs> that's, I think that's the norm, is like my favorite of those little pitches. Like, he's a robot from space, she's a little girl, they come from totally different worlds. <laughs> I forgot about that. That's oh. the norm, that's me. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> it's like Susie's that's coming in. She's like trying to hide, hide Norm from Jeremy. Uh, and they had their own sitcom. Ugh. We did uh, the other one I like is the uh, Tri-State Trilogy of Terror. Yeah, <laughs> three seven-minute episodes. But I think I think the initial concept of that is somebody was just ripping off the Simpsons Halloween special. And <laughs> Treehouse of Terror. It, it didn't even occur to me. I, I just like, <laughs> all right, yeah, because we used to do seven minute before Nickelodeon episodes were seven minutes long because that's how big a reel is. That's how long Bugs Bunny was. Yeah. yeah. That's and, your time to tell just, your story. We started making them for television. We made Ninja Turtle, three seven-minute acts. You know? And that was but, how uh, they split up the, the commercials, too. Yeah. And it was Nickelodeon's great idea to do two 11s. Yeah. Nickelodeon wanted to be the Sunday morning cartoon choice because kids used to watch cartoons on Saturday morning. And that was all sewed up by the network and Filmation and, you know, Hanna-Barbera and yeah, yeah, the early early rise of television animation on a budget, and yeah, it's crazy to see how far it's come. You like look at the old Hanna Barbera, like you watch an episode of The Flintstones, and the amount of animation shortcuts they have to use to get that. Get well, I, that. I brought a lot of that to uh, to uh, Nickelodeon, where I'm like, you guys, if we just reuse this shot, you know, you won't have to draw it again. They're like, no, no, we'll just draw it again. Oh, speaking <laughs> speaking of that, on uh, Milo. I know I've pointed out like there's a lot of backgrounds that you took from Phineas and Ferb and just redrew them in the Milo style. Was that all like? Did you have to like tell the story? Hey, I think we have this somewhere else, right? We can we can re just redraw it. Or... Well, that was one of the advantages I had over Bob because I had worked on Phineas, so I knew all the Phineas backgrounds. Right. You know, so if I needed a background, it's just like, yeah, that was just a we were just being cheap. Yeah. <laughs> like, you need a stadium? Yeah, we did a stadium in this show, that show, this show. You know, there's like I one, mean, like, I think in like the What a Croc episode, the one we were talking about with Horse in a Bookcase, like, it goes through a museum at one point, and then in Milo, they take that one still of the museum for that chase scene and turn it into a whole location where Doof <laughs> <laughs> lets the toilet pony head run wild. And... Well, that's the one that I liked was uh, when Doof first gets his nemesis on Milo, I did the other side of it. From Perry's point of view, where he's coming out of Schnell photo. Oh yeah, that was that was. I know Ashton. That wasn't in her boards. That was something you guys added afterwards. Um, yeah, I don't even remember what episode that was. That was first that was impressions. Probably. That was the kid, kid Milo, kid Melissa, kid Bradley. Oh, yeah, it was a really <laughs> sweet episode. And young young Cavendish, young Cavendish's design just makes me smile every time I see it. It's it's so brilliantly Cavendish. Like we did this thing where uh, uh, always just to rib Swampy. Like when when Monogram got his mustache torn off, I gave him <laughs> massive buck teeth. <laughs> and Swampy's like, no, 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 no. Have you seen the frame of Monogram? That's the uh, it's an in between where his face is full front and his nose is like the size of his face. Oh, it might have been an in-between. Yeah, it, it was an in-between, but it's so funny because like you know, the joke is like, you know, he's on, his face is always on one side. And so it's just like, it's, it's one of those in-betweens. It's just like, even like weird timers, I'm, I'm like, nobody wants to see Phineas from the front. Anytime he turns his head, he puts his nose down. 
Just <laughs> nose down. Do not do a straight across. Go under. Go under. <laughs> sure enough, they're like, Dup! and then somebody will. Now he can freeze frame on him, looking like a, like a like a fish. Oh, those yeah. become memes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> But I mean, you know, that's that's one of the part of the charm of the show is the character designs and how how unique they are. So after uh, after uh, Phineas, I, I was on post for Phineas. Um, I went over to uh, Warner Brothers to go work on Benicula. Oh yeah, it I read was, those books as a kid, which that's like that's oh, crazy we, for me. We changed it all around. I, we made uh, the dog and the cat. I love those characters. The uh, the two people that were uh, show running that one, Jessica Barutsky, uh, really excellent artist. I think she's on Casa Grande now for Nickelodeon. Yeah. Or something, or a pilot or something like that. But she's such a great artist. She redid the Warner Brothers characters and kept their animatability, uh-huh. which I, I said, oh, I got to work on that. And I go over there, and uh, Adam Burton was the other one. Adam Burton, Maxwell Adams. Uh, I had worked on Billy and Mandy, you know, so he, he knew the ups and downs of it. And the first show I got, I like, okay, here's the outline. All right, let's, all right, let's have a look at this outline, you know, because this is the way we always treated them on Phineas. Yeah. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Oh, I'm like, it's perfect. (laughs) It can be done. done. I didn't have any notes or anything. I'm just like, I really you enjoyed that? that. Yeah. It was the first time I'd ever seen that. In and that's when you Rocco, knew it was the show you wanted to work on. Rocco, Beavers, you know, every show that I've ever worked on, the outlines were always like, ugh. <laughs> and now we yeah. got to turn this into something. And then, and then uh, on Benicula, it was just loads of fun. Yeah, so I think uh, back back to, like, the end of Phineas and Ferb, there are episodes like Return to the Second Dimension or Doof 101 or <laughs> Alka Files that, like, seem that they can become, like, their own miniseries, so... Uh, what was what was kind of the idea with those, like the bringing the bugs, and like which of those got closest to actually getting picked up as a spinoff, if any? The bugs, the bugs were part of the original Phineas and Ferb pitch. Yeah, they're on the pitch packet, and they finally that got was, to use them in Doof One Hundred and One. Yeah, that was that was story four, and uh, bugs are just when you're pitching a show, bugs are instant death. <laughs> Nobody wants to see a show about bugs, and I don't know why. I mean. Even when you get J.K. Simmons and Josh Gad and Stephen Root to to do the voices, like that was that was uh, such a power trio for like like yeah, that was great as Forgot far as about. casting. Like, hey, like yeah, I think you but guys that, got Josh Gad like right after. Well, you probably got him before Frozen because like that episode was probably done before Frozen came out, but it came out after like a year after Frozen, but. I forgot about that. Yeah, he's on the Central Park now, right? Yeah, he's doing Central Park. The busker. He's the busker. Um, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know what happened. I think. I think uh, they were kind of half-heartedly pitching these ideas. And they weren't Disney. really confident in the bugs. Well, I mean, they made it to color. <laughs> we did. Twice. We did the best. We did the best we could, and, and uh, those shows, I don't remember them being bad. Yeah. But any one of them would have made a great um, a great series to move forward with. But I don't know who makes the decisions. I don't make those decisions. Like I said, I just I just build the bombs. Did they call uh, you back for Alka Files to direct? Was that like after Phineas, or was that tied to the fourth season? No, that was still in Phineas. Oh, okay. Uh, we did... Uh, uh, I think it was third season. They gave us a bunch of one hours at the end of third season or fourth season. Yeah, it was fourth. So technically we were out of, we were done with the show, but we were going to do these four specials. And it's like, yeah, okay. You it's really, put, it's really put, weird put, watching in like production order now. Cause they fixed on Disney plus to be production order. But what happens is like act your age is now halfway through season four. And then the four hour long specials. And yeah. before it was always like act your age was like, that was the, the prelude to last day of summer, which I thought was like, that was the way it was supposed to air. But like now actor ages is halfway through season four. And it's just like, ah, what? <laughs> the people who are going to watch it like this. And it's like, Ugh, no. you know, one of the nice things uh, that somebody was doing early on was they were taking the shows and putting them on YouTube <laughs> and, and Disney would get wind of it and take them down like, you know, a week later. <laughs> but what was nice about that is I could, I could read all the comments 
and go, oh, it, I got it. They got it. They, they yeah. saw it. So they got it. You know, or uh, we implied that. And it's like, ooh. <laughs> so yeah. we, we really were watching what people were saying. And, and a lot of it was for the fans. Did you guys you know? kind of monitor the same thing with Milo to see what the fans were saying? Or was that less so? Because... Stuff had kind of. Milo was a different beast because it was a scripted show, so all the decisions were made before it got to. Yeah, me. so so like, okay, so we're kind of closing up, Phineas. Let's kind of go back to you were talking about your time before you came back for Milo. So kind of finish up your time with Warner Brothers and Benicula, and then. Oh yeah, Benicula. Well, I left Benicula to come back for Milo. So was that yeah. was that another Dan and Swampy sat you down for lunch and they're like, so do you want the job? I was like, wait, a job? What? <laughs> No, I didn't wait to be asked. I just kind of showed up. It's like this, they forget to ask. You just show up on day one. Day one and I just show up and I'm like, where do I sit? Oh, shit. You're here. <laughs> I, you know. Man, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, season... So, yeah, uh, Milo, they, they kind of brought, like, it was, you said it was script driven. So, yeah, kind of go into that and how that was a different experience. Well... Uh, we had we had some uh, some people from uh, um, primetime television. Yeah. In primetime, you don't mess with the script. You do exactly what the script says. And uh, I I don't like working in primetime. Is Milo Cause... considered primetime or no? That's cable, right? No. Yeah, Milo's on. No, but well, we had some people from primetime come over and and uh, try to run it like a primetime show, and I'm like, that's. <laughs> You, you can't do that because I've I've worked with these guys before. And, you guys, and, you guys got a new line producer, Brandy, right? I think she came on for. Oh well, yeah, Brandy came on. Yeah, I like Brandy. She's a good kid. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was just a different animal. That's all. And uh, in my mind, Murphy's Law is a series of little annoying, ridiculous accidents. Yeah. Not completely earth shattering or if you're going to do that save that for the end of the episode but we had a lot of good ones i liked lard land i thought that was fun <laughs> welcome everyone to lard world lard is slippery greasy fun yeah i still call it land <laughs> <laughs> lard world they made us change it to lard world from lard land i want to say there was one other thing they had to change for lard world too but i can't remember what it was somebody mentioned it that was well, because Lard, Lard World is just so key to the story as a whole. I mean, when you come down to the last, like the Phineas and Ferb effect, that's like the final battle scene. Um, so, you know, it's a very important location. You want to make sure it's fleshed out and designed and established. Yeah. Well. yeah we went back to Lard Land. Um, one of the interesting things about the Milo pilot was my daughter did the voice of Melissa. Really? Yeah. Dan, oh. Dan was like, I need, I need someone just to read these lines for the pilot. And TV came in and, and they paid her. And uh, it was really cute. It was really good. And, so do uh, you have the version of the Milo pilot with your daughter's voice? Yeah, hidden away somewhere. Oh. Um, see, man, see these, these are the things we love to see. Like anything and everything from production is, if you can't Dan, release it, that would be. Dan's daughter said she loved Phoebe's voice. You know, so Dan went to bat for Phoebe. It's like, I want her to be it, but uh you know so the 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 kids liked it uh it tested well uh dan was vouching for it but disney said no we have a stable of stars that we want to put in so yeah and and uh my daughter isn't she doesn't want to go into acting it's like well, i mean Swamp, swampy son he's he, i think he he does uh chad on the show Django, yeah. Yeah. We were always giving Chad a hard time. Like Swampy, we were always doing stuff to Chad. <laughs> just to bug Swampy. <laughs> Chad Chad is just a fun character though. Like like Chad and Mort, I think in season two you bring a joke, it's like, wait, which one is which again? <laughs> it's like the first time I watched it, I didn't know. I couldn't You don't even know. Yeah, they're, was that in the uh... Well their designs are just so similar. Like they even both have blue shirts. It's like I don't yeah. know if that was intentional, but like <laughs> if that was a character well, design choice like say that like in mid afternoon snack club. The, yeah, uh, mid afternoon snack club. That's a fun one. <clears throat> that was a fun one. That uh, <laughs> with the substitute team. Uh, yeah, but uh it was a parody, you know? Yeah. Parodies are easy. Parodies are just too easy. Yeah. And uh um I like them. They're a nice little break because they're so easy. Yeah, and you don't have to well a mid afternoon snack club, like 
I guess we're getting ahead, but like that one's so fun because that episode it has two songs, which was something that got to happen a lot in Milo. Like you'd have episodes without songs, but then you have some episodes that had like two songs, and that one had the Cyborg Bear song. Where he's like, looking high and low for Milo. And, I f <laughs> and if you find him, there's gonna be blood. <laughs> it's just like, that made it to the final cut. And <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, a, a lot of the songs on Milo, uh, Dan, uh, Dan wrote like almost all the songs on Milo. Really? He just kind of wrote yeah. them all himself? I don't think I did any on Milo. Really? <clears throat> I know Martin worked on two because I found the demos for them. He did No Day Like a Snow Day and... Uh, oh, Sphere and Loathing that. in Outer Space. Yeah, I did that one too. I oh, forgot yeah. about it. <laughs> no, all the songs are coming that. back. It's like I did. Did you work on I'm Taking a Stroll? I'm taking a stroll. In the moonlight, take, take, taking a stroll. Just taking a stroll. I'm trying to remember what the one was. Uh... I'm feeling just all right when I'm in the moonlight, taking a stroll. Oh, Substitute Science Teacher in Space. That was mine. Yeah. I forgot about that Substitute one. Science Teacher in Space. Yeah, that was really good. The uh, Danny Jacobs mix on it. He knew we were like ripping off Bowie on it. So he put in the best bubble episode <laughs> ever. Gotta say that <laughs> or bottle episode. That's what it's called. Yeah, I just like the idea that this uh, teacher was just had had enough. <laughs> Nothing I do. And for a brief moment, she gets a glimpse at the entire universe. <laughs> and it and in coming back, she goes into shock, but then it all makes sense after and, that. And, and Klimpaloons like... dancing around her head. <laughs> <laughs> no, the monkeys. Yeah, were they Klimpaloons or monkeys? They both. It was monkeys and Klimpaloons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the, the uh, zoetrope. Because yeah. It was in the... <laughs> well, then they, they brought it back for the, the outer space number. I can't tell you how weird that was, simulating a zoetrope on a computer. Really? Yeah, it was like... It was like the complete opposite. I think we first did it on uh, Storyboard Pro, Two Move, Phineas. Oh, Phineas, <laughs> yeah. In Phineas, when we did the steampunk episode. Oh, and with... Perry's got the watch, and it's the. It's like, why is your zoetrope so much better than mine? Yeah, his mouth is just moving up and down. <laughs> 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 that was a good song too. I like that one. The, uh, the one that we wrote with uh, Professor Elemental. Yeah. That was the uh, Welcome to the Future song. But, um, yeah, on, on Milo, uh, I think my favorite musical number on that was the uh, football, Rooting for the Enemy. I got a big foam finger. Yeah. And so what was interesting is I was talking to Chris. That was his first episode that he boarded. Um, but he said they gave the musical scene to uh, Joseph Scott who did, I think, a lot of the early musical numbers on Milo. It's like, it was, as, uh, as, as a no, director, no. like, as a director, like, how do you decide, all right, we're giving this storyboard artist the musical number for the scene to make sure that gets done well, versus we, uh, giving we it did, to the uh, We yeah. split that between Joe and uh, Dave Kupchak. Dave Kupchak was a uh, former Bluth animator. To, uh, uh, he worked on some Bluth films. <laughs> Yeah, he's the guy that did the uh, caricature of me that that I uh, just put up on. Twitter. Oh yeah, 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 I saw that. That was good. Oh yeah. Hey. Anyway, uh, he was an animator, so uh, he we we kind of put it together, and I was actually having him just animate the the shots in between the walking, the the uh, overlapping action on the hat. Oh you know, yeah. The, uh, the finger. I was like, he was really good at that. I have a book. Let's see if you can see this. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, you're going to do this. Yeah. This is the book that I have uh, everybody autograph. Everybody that I work with, like, writes things in it That's for me. That's so cool. It's like a yearbook for your show. Yeah, this is, uh, there's some uh, panels from Angry Weavers. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, but I'm always, uh, always collecting stuff from Oh, the decom. Look at this. These are my notes for the decom. Oh, for uh, across the second dimension. Look at so that. Always, uh, uh, because it was scripted, I'd always do the script smaller so that I could add notes to it. Man. And you can see it's just a bunch of stupid doodles. Doodles. <laughs> you got your name there. 
That was my that was my okay stamp. There's like a little thing that says mature song, kids song. <laughs> Gotta find the balance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then we come up with stuff like Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. That's so cool. That looks like the joke from Fungus Among Us where Dakota's like, Yeah, we're going back to the sixties. <laughs> and then, do you know what show I was parodying on that one? No, I do not. Well, it was a show called Laughing. <laughs> they they used to do that a lot. Oh, these are great. What about Kaz? And... Here's Bernie. Bernie did this for me. <laughs> There's a. Uh, that's some of uh, Bernie's notes there. I got to show you this one Dan one though. I had a, uh, on the back of my door, I would put the post-its that were not suitable for public consumption <laughs> because people just draw shit, you know? Yeah. And, and you need to, you need to, you know, you need to go beyond the limits sometimes. So I put them on, oh, here's a whole, whole bunch of Kaz stuff. Hey, got and some of the bugs. Creep rat. Yeah. Oh, it's like a, a scrapbook. Oh darn it. It froze for a sec. Yeah, I hit the I hit the space bar. I, <laughs> I was gonna show you the coop chat one. Where'd it go? Oh here's a, a Yabara. Am I still frozen? No, you're good. Yeah, Chris did that one for ah. me. Ah. Yeah, he had a sort of an anime style that I really appreciated. His uh Oh, here's the coop check one. Yeah, it makes sense he went to work on Mau Mau. <laughs> because I always called him Poop Deck, and he's like, uh -huh. so he drew a scathing picture of me. Yeah, that was that was uh, his uh, passion. Yeah. He's a real anime guy. And he did a lot of effects that I'm like, ooh, let's leave that like in. Like little yeah. effects animation touches. And it, wasn't, it wasn't in keeping with our style guide, but... Uh, it was like a little breath of fresh air. So. Okay, so this this is a question I've asked, but I, I don't think anybody's really been able to answer. Why doesn't Milo have his backpack in Rooting for the Enemy? It's the only episode where he does not have his backpack, and it's just not explained. The entire football game does not have the backpack. I, I forgot. You forgot? <laughs> no! This is the first time hearing of it. Really? <laughs> he didn't put his backpack on. I'll be damned. Yeah, the, the entire football game, it just... No backpack. But you know, I this is this is one of those things that always comes up on the web. When they did this, they meant that. It's like, no, we didn't. We just, <laughs> it was uh, really just an accident. Or... The answer is just, I didn't know he didn't have his back. Don't tell Dan. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I guess he doesn't. Yeah, I'll have to, uh, yeah, if you look back at the whole musical number, Rooting for the Enemy, no backpack, the entire time he's at the game. Just Yeah, I think I was focusing on the animation a little more than... Well, yeah, because that's that's that was like the thesis episode for the show. I mean, the pilot's the pilot, but like that was the episode that said we got Weird Al and he's gonna sing, and this is what the show is. I feel like, at least when I yeah. was watching it, that's kind of what it felt like. But yeah, but I knew what my board people would could do, and I knew what they liked to do. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, Ed Rivera uh, was good with close up acting. I said that before. Um, like he was, he was trying to work up this Cavendish. Mm, when you get frustrated, he like his <laughs> he has mustache twitches. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, like uh, Calvin Suggs uh, worked on, I think he was on Milo briefly, but he's the guy who boarded Foam Town when going down broke. to Foam Town. Yeah, when they were in the big foam thing, he's the guy who boarded that sequence. That's a complex sequence right there. Yeah, he's a he's a great board artist. I think he's at DreamWorks now. I think he moved over there. We got we got somebody asking. So was Milo Amanda always supposed to be Endgame with Milo? Was that always the was that the plan? Milo and Amanda. Yeah. Eh, I don't know what the story was with that. I know <laughs> that uh, I think the first time that he showed any interest in her was the opera episode, right? Yeah. Um. That was a fun episode to make too. That's a really complex one too. Lots of crowd shots, lots of music coordination. Because that that you had to write that whole fake musical for 
Canon Opera. Oh, can can Canada you was... please please if you have it like release the the full version of all those songs because we missed so much of it just in the final of the of the opera like the lyrics and. Well, you know, I got I I have all the demos, and if you heard them, you would just go, oh, because <laughs> <laughs> it's me singing, you know, or it's or it's Dan singing, or or, you know. Nah, but it's not about that. It's about the lyrics, man. It's just having the the full context of the stuff that gets covered up by dialogue. You know what's funny is uh, the Mexican Jewish Cultural Festival was a full song, and Disney wouldn't let us do any of it. What? Well... No, wait, wait, well, that made it into the episode, though. It did, but I wrote the song, but I am I am neither uh, uh, Mexican nor Jewish. So it's not... It, it's could be considered culturally insensitive. So I just kept it food based. Yeah. You know, there's there's Kreplex on uh how's it go? We make our tacos out of matzo. We smash the glass with our zapatos. We've got <laughs> so cremas on corbases and <laughs> Yeah there's a pick on our pinata. How are things in Ensenada? <laughs> It's the Mexican Jewish culture. I wrote that. I wrote that with John Barry, um, and I, I brought him in. I'm like, well, at least we got the Jewish part covered. I mean, <laughs> if we had a Mexican guy here; he could join in. And... Do you ever feel like Phineas lost anything when he left, since he was like such a prolific writer for the show? John Barry, yeah, he brought a lot to the show. I mean, he he created Klimpaloon. Yeah, the legendary old timey bathing suit. We're flashing back to fashion forward. Yes, the old is the new, new. Yeah, he was uh, he was full of great ideas. And uh, when Milo started, actually, um, when they were laying that show out, he popped in for a quick session to go over the show with Dan and Swampy. Oh, that's nice. Which I thought was which I thought was nice because I thought, uh, you know, just to kind of inspire them because yeah. they've been looking at it for so long and and, and you get a fresh a fresh perspective too somebody who comes in and hasn't really seen anything can kind of tell you this yeah, is... and john always always brings a lot of energy to the room yeah and he, and he went that, on to do be cool scooby-doo and now he's on lego city adventures and both of those are really funny scooby-doo so. with um with uh zach zach moncrief was uh, really? the first director on phineas yeah he worked on that one too and uh and then he was working with uh, a guy I worked with on uh, um, another Warner Brothers project, Wabbit. Somebody says in the comments, as a Jew, I love that song. So it sounds like you did good. Well, they, they cut out the verse. There was a whole thing about building pyramids that seemed insensitive. So oh, no. <laughs> Because there are pyramids in Mexico and, and uh, you know, pyramids in Egypt. But um, Whoa, that's a fun connection. So I didn't. That wasn't my line, but I think that's what Disney hung up on, and I can't argue it. I couldn't argue it. I yeah, because I mean, you you can see their point out out yeah. and clear. Like with the sad French song, my translation. I'm not. I can't speak French, so my translation really is. And uh, my my wife actually sang that song, the sad French song, and she took French classes when she was at Disney because they were dealing with France on uh, the Hunchback movie. Um. So that's like one of my favorite songs. So on my website, you can go see how that's, those songs are made. Very cool. It, so do, you, do you have like all the demos on your website or? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I, I have, um, actually, yeah, I have the Troy, uh, the Troy song demo and uh, what I sent to Danny Jacob, not the finished thing. Yeah. And the uh, sad French song is what uh, Danny Jacob came up with on the other end Very freaking cool. genius that guy man dan jacob i want to have him on the show at some point too i want to talk to him about writing the cavendish and dakota theme because the way he arranges that theme in a gajillion different ways for the different episodes just makes me smile so much there's like there's the episode where they're on the farm and the cavendish and dakota themes played on a banjo it's like bum 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 <laughs> it's just it was a crack up the uh, the reason I keep bringing up uh, Summer Belongs to You is we watched it last night. Ah. And there was a thing where they had the giant map, and it's like, Candace, look at the map. And she looks at Paris, and it's Candace's theme, which is... Yeah. But it's in 
Ring it's around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, it's ashes. The witch in, in uh, Wizard of Oz, I think. But uh, it's it's an accordion, like French style. <laughs> no musical cueing, but we all cracked up at that. It's like there's so many little hidden things. Cavendish Nakoda's theme is just one of my favorites, though. That just yeah. it's iconic. Then when it's playing on like a muted trumpet, like bam, 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 it's just so good. Are you playing? I don't bring my hand. Well, oh, that's a car. I live by a street. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like it to me. <laughs> one of my favorite pieces that Danny Jacob did for Milo, though, is at the end of the Phineas and Ferb effect, as the big battle is happening, he wrote this like completely original piece of music for the scene leading up to Professor Time coming back. Um, oh, yeah. And it's just like one of the wildest pieces of music in all of Milo. It's got like such a fantastic build, and it's like I haven't seen that episode since we made it, and it was, you know, a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, Phineas, Phineas and Ferb effect. That was a, uh, that was that was one where you can tell that went through a lot of, the cutting process. I feel like, during, like trimming trimming it down. Yeah. Well. Like like it, it showed more in that than I think like fungus among us or missing Milo. Those like felt like. <laughs> this, this is just like kind of watching it as a fan but it was still a good episode don't get me wrong yeah and that's the thing i'm like well what about third season milo no only two and i'm like well why yeah exactly and they never canceled it so it's like <laughs> there's certain things that like you can't share because they haven't officially canceled it like well it used to be that you needed a certain amount of episodes to go into syndication and in order to do that you did four seasons once it went into syndication, uh, everybody gets paid again. Right. So, ooh, syndication. But if you own the network, you can just show them anytime you want. That's what cable television did. So we were still kind of going through the motions of going four seasons on everything. Right, so you uh, thought, you just kind of assumed seasons. Milo was going to keep going. Yeah, but then it was like, Gravity Falls only got two seasons. Ooh. But that was, and, that was uh, Hirsch's vision, though. Like, that was, as he said... He was the one who cut that off at two seasons because he was done with his story. Whereas like shows like Wander, where Craig had like a whole story planned for season three, and Disney was just like, nah. Yeah, it sucks. It's like, and and uh, they don't know that. Honestly, if you just let people go, they can come up with a show. Yeah. It's like the. It's it's really not that hard. Yeah. The hard part is uh, the politics that are involved. You know. And the balance between executives and creative vision. Yeah. Do you think there was a reason started, that Milo didn't I, get? Do you think there was a reason they passed on Milo, or is that kind of out of your scope of? It's above my pay grade. Because Dan's Dan's working on a new pilot now. Have you gotten to see that? No. No. He's because no. he Disney. He was saying on he did like an interview the other day. It was like Disney moved up his pilot like six weeks because they're like we need to make animated stuff because our live action stuff is shut down so it sounds <laughs> it sounds like his new pilot they're pretty pretty confident in it um so that'll be interesting to see if if a the show's in the same universe as milo phineas and b what it's about obviously no i didn't know nothing about it yeah but so, um <laughs> you know, they could they could use something new yeah you know? i don't know how, how the other shows are doing would you want to come back for another show in the same universe, or you kind of moved on to other parts of your career? Do new stuff, but uh, I always like working with Dan. Yeah. You know. Um, I don't know. You know, make me an offer. <laughs> <laughs> so you see how much... I'd have to show do. up and sit there. What? I've been here the whole time. <laughs> you have? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're already making Milo season three. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things Josh mentioned that I thought was really cool about uh, the plan for Milo season three was the whole, you know, the theme songs is it's my world and we're all living in it. And season three was going to go back and reveal that Milo was the one who caused the big bang that, <laughs> that, that started everything. And I was just like, Oh man, I wish we had gotten to see that idea play out in a third season. But well, you know, um, any, anytime they introduce a trope that I'm just like, uh, Christmas is like, uh, it's not that I don't like Christmas. I'm just like, uh, a uh, zombie episode. I, I'm like, could someone else do the zombie episode? I just <laughs> I'm done because at that it. point, at that point, it had been we'd been zombied to death on on so many levels, and then time travel is always just so annoying to me because it's 
everybody uses the Back to the Future time thing. So, so I finally got to uh, make fun of time travel with uh, them hitting themselves with a peach. Yeah. It never came from anywhere. <laughs> it's just like it steps outside of the acceptability of time travel. Well, I think what's what's fun about Milo is it kind of takes like a buffet style to the time travel. Like there's no real consistency. It's like sometimes doubles are okay. They can exist. Other times, but doubles are not okay. They cannot exist. And other times it's, it's, it's kind of, you get like a taste of everything. Was that the pistachio pistachio episode? Yes. Missing Milo. That, okay. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about missing Milo. Cause that was my my favorite bit in that is where they, they get away and the pistachio grabs them. Did you get him? Oh, yeah, they're right here in my hand. Where? Look closer. <laughs> yeah. I will have my moments. I, I said uh, anytime any character says, hey, everybody. That's that's one of my jokes. Hey, everybody. When the mind, they, they wash the makeup off the mind. Hey, everybody. I can talk. <laughs> hey, everybody. I'm in a diaper. <laughs> so the hey, everybody jokes are yours. Yeah, any anytime anyone goes, hey everybody, that's probably my that's joke. Good. So with with missing Milo, what was it like to uh, co-direct with Bob? Did like each of you take like twenty two minutes and just kind yeah. of run with your section? Bob, and... Bob opened missing Milo, and uh, I did the second part. So I built on, you know, it was already written anyway. Oh so, yeah, yeah, because this year um, I was working for the nice thing is a lot of the models were done and stuff like that. Um, there was a big enough gap between the two episodes that when I was presenting uh, our animatic, um, I had to do a, rather than show them the first part again, I did a brief encapsulation. And that's the thing that I, I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I did. I did. It's, it's really funny. So go check it out on Twitter uh, at Hello Fathead. Um, you can see he, <laughs> he shared it there and it's basically their pitch reel for, or not pitch, but like their recap of the first yeah, episode, I didn't, first part. Of I didn't use any actual artwork. I just pulled artwork off the web. So the it's amount, like, the amount of different pictures you got for Milo, Melissa, and Zach. <laughs> just, just so the first one was the first one was Hey Arnold, and that <laughs> yeah. that just started them off. It's like Melissa, Zach, and Milo. Hey, it's hell good. It's just like you found anybody with like a fin of hair. <laughs> <laughs> that was that, that, that was the Milo for that. It's so stupid. I found a picture of a guy with his head in the can. <laughs> Man, those and then like for pistachios, you like put a picture. <laughs> and I use the uh, the time machine was always like a bong or, a, but uh, yeah, I get to the point where I'm uploading this thing and it's like, is this fit for children? And I'm like, I don't know, because I was just trying to crack up the crew. You know? Yeah, but uh, it w- it was really funny. We uh, I ran that. Everyone loved it. Showed the animatic and. Yeah, the mood just kind of stabilized. Oh no! <laughs> well, to be fair, to be fair, the animatic has you have to handle your story beats in an episode like that. Like that's not an eleven-minute comedy session. That is, you're trying to tell the story while balancing the comedy, which is something that I think Missing Milo did really, really well. Is you yeah, have we, uh, you have the comedic beats, but it also hits the tense and the emotional parts when it needs to. Well, that's just it with the uh, the emotional beats on uh, Infinius uh, really resonated with people. Yeah. And uh, it's something that I probably wouldn't have done on my own, you know? Yeah. But that's the stuff that resonates. And on, on Phineas, there was something for everyone. The kids loved Perry. The, the dads love Doof, poor Doof, you know? <laughs> you just unstoppable moron. Oh, my, my, my dad loves Doof because, like, he catches all the references that I won't get from growing up in the 80s. Or, like, he'll, he'll make a reference to something that I'll just, like, totally miss. And that's what makes it so much fun to watch together. They did a gag where he's like, uh, oh, I don't, I, I can't go get Vanessa. Can you get her? Well, how long does knee surgery take? <laughs> it's such a that. jerk. But we loved, we loved the idea of... Um, that they had a life outside of the cartoon. Anytime they referred to the cowboy hat or his wife is having knee surgery, you know, we just loved referring to stuff outside, which gave the characters depth. And it was just funny. It was yeah. Just it, like, made, it made them feel three dimensional. Like <laughs> yeah, he's subject to the same, the, uh, the, the hairdryer when, uh, when I went back to Phineas, 
when she's she's trying to talk to Candace on the phone and she's got a hair dryer on. It's like, and then it cuts wide and Dad's blown in the end of it. It's like you're right. It does sound like the ocean. Just coming out with little explanations for things. Like sometimes there'll be like music cues and like for you'll cut to Ferb and he's like, "What? I'm expressing my feelings through music." <laughs> well, that was the tennis ball thing. I like that. Tennis balls don't tennis lie. Ball. Tennis balls don't lie, and Belgie's like, Ugh, "What a geek!" You know, he's like, "It was funny." The fandom, this was this is probably totally unintentional, but in Phineas and Ferb effect, there's a part where they're having Milo. They're trying to figure out Murphy's law. They're having Milo juggle tennis balls. We're all like, "Tennis balls don't lie." <laughs> <laughs> it was like we're probably giving them too much credit. <laughs> I missed it. I missed that one. Tennis balls do not lie. Yeah, but no. So with um. Yeah, kind of going back to missing Milo. Um, what was it like to go from doing eleven minutes on Milo to having to do this? The first special is you know you get the full hour long special episode. Style. It's always a it's always a, a a bigger challenge. But the nice thing about uh, that much material is that you can really specialize on stuff. You can really give this action scene to Kyle. Yeah. You know? Did he did he really? board the the whole last? like uh schoolyard battle because that's like one of the most creative things in the whole oh, show, yeah. i think yeah, like yeah. they're using like sugar cubes and straight jackets and inflatable air mattresses and yeah that's all kyle kyle kind of runs off with it man that was and, wild uh, you just kind of just kind of plug him in and give him a mountain dew and stand back <laughs> you know yeah and away he goes um yeah that's that's what's kind of nice about it and the other thing is um, you used to have to, uh, oh, could I see what you're working on, you know, and then go look at the sheets and stuff like that. But with the server, it's like you could just open the board and look at it. Yeah. You know? It's like, what was the name of that guy who click, 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 boom, you got it, you know. And the other nice thing is um, if we didn't remember something about an episode or something that we wanted to refer back to, you can go to the web. <laughs> yeah, they wikis. We have wikis keeping track. Check out Wikipedia. It's like mm, check that out. It's Although like, sometimes it's wrong. Uh, it actually said that I uh, directed the uh, Phineas and Ferb movie. <laughs> oh, Candace against the universe. It probably just yeah, gave you the credit because you were on Second Dimension. I didn't even work on it. And then, I'm like, <laughs> and thanks, then, guys. <laughs> and then we found out. Oh, Bob Bowen did it, which was like that makes sense. And we heard. Uh, Trucker they probably just saw a Robert. You know. <laughs> Tr Trucker Ted is going to have a cameo in the movie, which is exciting all the Milo fans because we're like, yes, Milo. Well, Bob's Canadian. Yeah, Bob's Canadian accent. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt like that character came straight from Family Guy. Really? Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Cause he was like a Family Guy character to me. Cutaway gags, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, he did this one. Oh, 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 that was it. I had him go. Uh, it's like, yeah, they, they 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 flew over my house. What's the matter with you? What are you? Is something wrong with you? Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> then I apologize. <laughs> that was the life outside of what you're hearing is like. Yeah, there is something wrong with the guy. He's like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Trucker Ted's. Yeah, he's he's a fun character. That that, that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, and then. And, uh, so my daughter didn't get to do the voice of Melissa, but she did get to do the voice of Joni. Oh, Joni, she's Joni in the show. Yeah, Joni was the one who's like, hi, Milo, boom, gets hit with a football. <laughs> so it's like, she's, she's the one that anytime she goes near Milo, something tragic happens. I was <laughs> like, she's, she shows up in the diner in Fungus Among Us, and she's like, hey, guys, how's your day been progressing? Hey, Joni, we got to go. <laughs> she's like, what did I say? What did I say? That That's really, really interesting. Now, now that I can put the voice to, I can see how she would be Melissa. Yeah. Yeah, she has a. Uh, well, yeah. She did the uh, Melissa, the the Melissa that uh, they used on the show is great. Oh yeah, Sabrina Carpenter. Does a great job. Yeah. And and my daughter isn't a real actor. She's you know peripherally acting, so it wouldn't have been fair to a real actor anyway. Well, what I think is so funny about having this professional singer with multiple albums, Sabrina Carpenter on the show, and never once does she sing on Milo. <laughs> it's like... Right. Why didn't we ever sing? What the heck? <laughs> it's um, like, I know Weird, Weird, Weird Al is like, that's obviously a really, that's a big contract to get him to sing on the show, but 
It's like, you have two singers and then Aaron's doing the voice for Makai. It's like, that would be such a fun trio to actually sing, but... Yeah, sometimes you just yeah. gotta work with what you got. Well, um... Yeah, one of my favorite songs is the, uh... The episode with the, uh, Lumberzacks in it. Chop, chop, chop. <laughs> the, uh... That, that show has a good point in it. Um, I always said that... Um... When you're coming up with a story idea, don't just rip off Star Trek or do a parody of something you've seen. Draw from your real life. And Josh came up with this thing where uh, Melissa was missing her two front teeth because she got hit with a pop fly when she was young. Yeah, Josh was talking about that. And that's a that was a real moment in in uh, I, I think it was his wife's. I don't I don't know where it came from, but that was an actual genuine moment. Yeah. And uh, we expanded on that and got a full, like, two minutes out of it. <laughs> no, Zach, get... I'm a robot. <laughs> I am a robot. I am a robot. And then Milo sees that her teeth are missing and he runs into the door. Yeah. <laughs> because the door wouldn't break away after all. Yeah, it, it, stuff that comes from the heart is always is always better than, you know, a parody as far as Absolutely. I'm concerned. And that's a good example of that. Yeah. Um, that, that was a fun joke. It's like, oil spill here. That's not oil. That's molasses. <laughs> Nothing else to see here. Mr. What? what do I know? I'm a kid. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me molasses was flammable? <laughs> the hell do I know? <laughs> I forgot about that. I should watch Milo Murphy again. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, I think, I think you would, yeah, Missing Milo holds up so well. I still think it's my favorite episode of the show. That... This is like perfection in a in a bottle. What's what is the episode where uh, Belgeet does the Lumberzack song? That's that's the Phineas and Ferb effect. Is it? Yes. <laughs> I had a scene where uh, where Milo meets Phineas and Ferb, and I added them introducing themselves, and I put it into uh, little segments because I knew that uh, the network is going to want to use that chunk for promotion. Yeah. And I was told, well, that's not necessary. You don't need to do that. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing it anyway. And the network used it for the promotions. I'm like, what's going on? What happened here? What's, okay, so, know? yeah, this this is something funny. The promotion that the Phineas and Ferb effect got because of the year-and-a-half-long hiatus between season one and season two was ridiculous. Like, when it came out, they barely promoted the Phineas and Ferb effect here. Oh. It, was, it got, like, maybe one trailer, like... So, like, with my channel, what I do is I like I like to, like, break down everything. So what was happening was Japan, um, when they aired Fungus Among Us, uh, which is, like, the prelude to the Phineas and Ferb effect, um, they actually aired a trailer for the Phineas and Ferb effect in Japanese. Oh, I remember that. So what I was doing is I was going through and taking all these Japanese trailers that Disney Channel Japan was posting and trying to figure out what in the world was going on. And then, and this, this, is, this is Tales from the Fandom, um... What happened was, like, one day, the Japanese version, it came out on, like, August 10th. Keep in mind, for American release, didn't get it till January 5th of the next year. So this is, like, oh. six months between the Japanese and the American release. But, like, so the Japanese version came <laughs> out. We all watched it in Japanese, and then one of us in the fandom was trying to negotiate with this guy from Japan to get the English audio track so that we could all <laughs> watch it in English. So he ended up paying him 10 bucks, and so we got this really crappy audio track with the guy he's like snoring in the background he's like he's like not even watching and he's just doing it to get his 10 bucks and so we, we bring that audio track from japan over we sync it up and we all got the crossover <laughs> well did you post that uh it, it got spread around through google drive it was never we never got it on youtube but... oh shoot i'd like to see that yeah i can time. i think i still have the the ja and it's got like the japanese subtitles are all across everything and the audio is just like super tinny but it was like we wanted to see what happened. We had been waiting for forever. I with would that. say that uh, uh, Weird Al was great. It just oh he, yeah. If if, uh, if we could board with his voice, if we got his voice before the boarding, it's like we could do all kinds of stuff with it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he, he's, he's great. Totally. He, he's he's good at ad libbing. Uh, I don't know about that. I didn't really go to the the record sessions, but but. What he puts into the read is is really strong. Yeah, so he really. Think, yeah, he brings the character. I think he's like a cartoon fan. He's got to be. Oh, I mean, he's in so many. You know, like, have you seen him in? Uh, he there's a. 
Doctor Strange. Oh, everybody's using them now. And uh, Wander Over Yonder. He's like the banana with the top hat and, <laughs> and Wander. And he like he sings the whole song. And Oh, I will say uh, the Milo character was based on uh, Noah, the guy who... Uh, he was from Fish Hooks, right? Yeah, the Fish Hooks guy. Yeah. That was Dan's caricature of Noah, um, Noah Jones. <laughs> I think it's so funny that Milo was originally and Mikey, too. In the pilot, uh, Noah, I think Noah did the voice in the pilot. Really? I think, yeah, before Weird Al. Man, like, see, Milo, because Disney I never... Be wrong. Focused on another show than than on Milo, which is okay. Well, they had yeah. a lot of stuff. New Ducktales was really big because that was that was it. I think they threw all their support behind Ducktales. And yeah, every other show to go jump in a lake. Yeah, Ducktales, but, and then I want to say Big Hero Six started around that time too. And but that's not bad, you know. When when uh, when we were on Nicola, when we were doing Rocco, we had a lot of leeway because we had we had Ren and Stimpy as an older brother. Right, and, and all the eyes were pointed at those guys because they were, they were just asking for it, and we were quietly <laughs> getting away with, you know, a lot of stuff. And it, just the execs are like, "Yes, I'm done. The day's almost over." I would say ninety percent of the dirty jokes on Rocco were swampies. <laughs> really, that 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 checks. That checks. But uh, on Phineas, he was dead against dirty jokes, and like, huh. Well, I mean, that was part of what Phineas was as a show is they wanted to challenge themselves from a writing perspective. Can we do this without the crutch that so many other shows lean on to get an audience? Yeah, yeah it's it's easy to it's easy to get a laugh with a dirty joke. Yeah. You no, know, Groucho never told a dirty joke. Hmm? But you kind of think that he did, Groucho. You is know? this on Rocco or? No, Groucho Marx. Oh, um, I'm I'm lost. I don't know who. Or what, what we're talking about anymore. Do yourself a favor. Um, <laughs> he said uh, he was a famous comedian, one of the Marx Brothers. And uh, he said, you don't need dirty jokes. You really don't. And that's that's the way I always was. But on Rocco, it's like there they were. Yeah. I think they call yeah. it, what is it, hidden blue is the, the comedic term. Hidden blue? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It was so funny that, that he was so... So for it on Rocco and so against it on Phineas. <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe he grew in the uh, the thirteen years he was in uh, Britain. <laughs> yeah, right. Moved to the UK and got more posh. That was it. <laughs> we don't need this. You can tell more jokes about the Queen, but that was always how you would get Swampy's attention. If you if you did a show that involved uh, race cars, anything from Scotland. That's why we put the bagpipes in the Troy song. <laughs> it's like why are there bagpipes? Just to just to get Swampy's attention, yeah. Um, and anything English, Swampy oh, and I wrote. Swampy and I wrote the lady song, where uh, I forget who the actress was. She was on a show called Ab Fab. She's teaching Candace how to be a lady. So Swampy and I wrote that one. Okay, people in the comments, uh, we're doing uh, audience questions at the end, so just save them for the end. Yeah. Somebody's asking, like, do I need to have my questions prepared? It's like, yeah, but. <laughs> What? Oh, no, I'm not even looking at the comments. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the, uh, the question. The document, yeah. We yeah. kind of jumped all over, but it's all good. It's been a good conversation so far. Um, there there was one in here. It's like, which which show uh, do you think you could have done better? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah, it was and, like, which, so which one maybe were there too many creative voices in the soup? And one that I was thinking of while I was writing that, was game night because i think josh had said he took the script in a very different direction from where you directed game night um <laughs> and what, yeah. what ended up happening was cavendish and dakota had just gotten hired for a new job but then in this episode they were back in their original uniforms and their employment was unclear and as fans watching it was just kind of like what why who's telling them to stop the portals this pig is this the time travels what's what's happening here i was gonna say my uh my uh uh, the episode that I feel that didn't come out exactly the way I wanted to was uh, every single episode I've ever directed. <laughs> you know? It's like, there's always, you always look at stuff and go, oh, oh. I missed an opportunity but, uh, here. Yeah, I missed an opportunity here. I missed an opportunity there. Um, 
I don't really remember game night. I know we did a, a big song and there was a, another hole in the universe. And They end up in the dimension of spaghetti people. Yeah, that's that was a kind of a cliche gag. And they just never, they never explain how they got back, which on Milo, it's always interesting to see gags like that because, you know, the show is plot driven, but then to just do a, a throwaway episode with a gag where they're in another dimension is just kind of like yeah. out of left field. I like I like shows that play with people's personalities. What what would happen if you took this personality and put it in this situation? Which is so, fun to see Cavendish and Dakota in the whole board game situation too in that episode. Yeah, joining in with the board. We're gonna finish this board game. Which, Cavendish right? he cheats. He cheats. <laughs> if yeah, you I'm roll the hard. dice, you get sure. another turn. <laughs> nah, you know what? It's uh, it's a. Uh, I think I think every episode could be better. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes stuff works, and and as an artist, it's like, you know, projects are never finished; they're abandoned. Exactly. You just put them out yeah. when when you can do nothing else. To, yeah. To it's figure. like we're out of time. Okay, ship it. Yep. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Um. So you're also producer on Milo Murphy's Law. So I was going to ask, what does that role entail, and is it difficult to balance producing and directing, or is it is producing more like I was a producer on Rocco as well, or on Rocco, on uh, Phineas and Ferb as well. Basically, I was uh, I was writing a lot, and I wasn't getting any writing credit. Mm. Phineas. So uh, as rather than track down every joke that I put in every single episode, um, I just settled for producer credit. But on Milo. Um, we, we started out, um, I, uh, I set up the timing department on, on both Phineas and Milo, and we didn't have a timing supervisor at first. So in addition to directing the episodes, I timed, I was the timing super for a lot of episodes and, uh, worked uh, getting the model pack in shape and basically getting all the models ready from Phineas so that we could use them on Milo. And oh, it was did just you have to do any touch-ups with the different kind of, with the more cleaner art style or was it pretty? Oh yeah. 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 It's funny looking back through all the, all the uh, Phineas and Ferb stuff and you go, wow, that was rough. <laughs> well, Cause it, was, it did get it, better. It was a more loose art style when it started. It was very, you know, you could stretch and squash, I feel like, more because it wasn't as strictly on model as it became in later seasons. Yeah, there was a, a lot of stylistic stuff that that, uh, that uh, I put forward on shows. Um, as a director, yeah, you uh, just kind of make sure that everybody's all on the same page, you know. And yeah, all the elements of your team pointed in the right direction. And it needs to cross over with the other team. The other team needs to be doing you know, similar stuff. Especially on like the 45 minute episodes where you got to work together to get everything done. Oh yeah. Otherwise you get night and day. Yeah. You know? So one of the things, uh, from the Phineas and Ferb effect that got cut, apparently it made it to animation was this Ferb turned out to be a pistachion, uh, bit. And there was like a whole flashback. Can you, can you tell us more about that or cause that apparently it made it to animation from what Josh said. I don't, I don't know. Uh, well, we we kind of used that gag in Star Wars. Oh, where Ferb, Ferb turns evil, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I I have a feeling that's probably why it came out because we've done that, you know. Yeah. Before. But I I honestly don't remember. I don't re I don't remember. Oh wow. Thing. Sorry. No, it's it's okay. It's cra it's it's crazy. It's, it's a wealth like, of information. It's been like three or four years since you worked on it, right? Like. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. My old stuff. So let's see. Uh, just t uh, can you tell us some more fun stories from like Milo season one production, like deleted scenes, fun ideas that you thought like did, just didn't didn't fit into the episode that were still fun ideas, hardest episodes to complete, uh, that sort well, of. I didn't thing. Have, I didn't really uh, first season. Um, we slowly changed stuff. I told you about uh, um, you know like Vanessa um, becoming is, yeah <laughs> on Phineas. Yeah, it was uh, it was uh, it was just a lot of fun. I I I hate to simplify it like that, but uh, 
you know, everybody, everybody was, was very excited to do stuff. And we, yeah. we got a lot of new stuff coming in, a lot of new ideas and a lot of really weird stuff too. Yeah. yeah. You know, which was always fun. Do you know whose idea it was to have Cavendish and Dakota go back and clean out houses in the Renaissance? <laughs> <laughs> no, like I said, a lot of the decisions for, for Milo got made in the writer's room. Yeah. So there wasn't They'd a lot you could... there, yell at each other and Scott would lay on the floor and, <laughs> <laughs> they put things on the wall they take things down off the wall you know i've heard scott is a really fun person <laughs> yeah scott's a great guy scott's a great guy and jim uh, uh jim bernstein was in there too jim uh, yeah he's that. nobody cares wow. jim poor jim <laughs> i love i love how he tried to kill recurring raccoon in the one episode he managed to get his hands on <laughs> well that was uh yeah, the reoccurring raccoon was, uh, um, I forget whose idea that was, but that was, that was another internet thing. They saw a raccoon on the internet run off with a handful of Oh, that of was, that was Maria and Valerie. Yeah, yeah, Valerie and Maria. We, uh, and they're like, it's on the internet, look, 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 and I'm like, if you do things on the internet, it's going to flame out, you know? So we literally took that footage and just copied it. <laughs> you know it's like okay we got an example so we use that same you know just drew it as you know side by side frame by frame stupid raccoon running around <laughs> stealing everything just to make things stealing difficult everything. yeah did you direct yeah. uh did you direct the goulash episode yeah <laughs> that that, was, that, was that is a fun episode that's wild and you get to bring back love handle and norm and there's like a you got a new love handle song and there's like a future that goes eons into the future, and there's a war with robotic screech owls. <laughs> I like the uh, the uh, um, the the Marvel thing in there where uh, where Ultron is like coming into consciousness. What is this? You know, Red what is Trump? my mission? Gulash. Gulash. Yeah, that was a that was almost a direct rip off of that scene i you know i didn't even think about that but now yeah now that you mention it yeah that's... well that was it what is this what am i sensing what's going on paprika paprika <laughs> oh and you bring back the moon farm song in that episode too dan sings it as doof it's like houston we got a situation <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that was always the thing is trying to put in you know that's what i meant i was always sneaking in like little nods to things that you were a part of in, in the past. Yeah. yeah. It had its moments. I like that one. That was a good yeah. one. So I'm curious, working on Milo, like, did you guys ever get to hear the the full extended versions of some of the songs that never made it to to air? Because, like, there's a full version of Chop, Chop, Chop. It's, it's like, we don't know all the lyrics, but we know there's, like, a second verse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, all of it does. Even, you know, like, the, the theme song has a second verse to it. Yeah, I think the idea was um, that was always like DVD extras and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, yeah and I hope, uh, I hope Disney decides to release those one day because, like, to have the second verse for Chop 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 would be. <laughs> I was a DVD extra once. I had my uh, my uh, office covered with Post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that one. I, I I have I actually don't have the Phineas and Ferb DVDs. The only thing I remember seeing was on YouTube. Somebody posted like the mini doc of writing floor after floor, stacking steel, laying bricks, pounding nails, and moving up quick. Two by fours and Doris J's. Like so they brought in a documentary crew to film them writing that song. That's funny. I don't remember if you were in that one, but no, I wasn't. Uh, Martin uh, Martin was in there, I think. Ah, that would make sense. Yeah. With the boys. Yeah. So, yeah, let's see. Kind of going back to the list. Oh, yes, yeah, so what was it like to leave the story from Fungus Among Us and then have to come back with the Phineas and Ferb effect the next season and kind of pick up pick up the pieces? Because J- Josh mentioned as the writers, like, they had all these points on the board, Fungus got done, and they just left it, and then the next season they came back and they're like, all right, we got to clean this up, <laughs> figure out how everything fits. Straighten everything out. Was there anything like that as a director that was particularly challenging for, you know, bringing Phineas and Ferb back and, you know, having the animation team struggle to get those characters on model after not drawing them in forever? Well, the fun fun thing is, uh, it's it's just like, uh, it's just like an old friend is coming to visit, you know, now all of a sudden Phineas is on the show. It's like, oh, cool. 
but we did have to rework the models so that they would fit a little bit better. Not look too... But Candace next to Melissa, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know they're going to be in the same scene at one point. So we did tone down the uh, Phineas characters just a little bit so that they would fit into the same universe yeah. as, as uh, the Milo characters. Because Phineas initially was, was supposed to be very graphic. Yeah, know? it was very... It's a visual uh, show, and we don't try to fight it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I remember that we did rework the models, and there's the, the changes were so subtle. If you could see the lineup, you go, ah, ah. oh man, see that that would be cool. So bit of work. That was a good art director right there. You know? To be able to eye it, because there's like I think the best looking scene with them in it is when Milo's like he's suggesting to Phineas, it's like, well, we can repower the suit with this lemon. Phineas is like, oh, we we need more than one lemon. He's like, how about this bag? He's like, how about a radioactive watermelon? Like that scene. It's like the animation, like really looks, it looks like perfect in that scene, in my opinion. But I've I've, like I've watched it over and over. So they do like their watermelons. My watermelon. My watermelon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's in the movie too. Oh. <laughs> well, that's yeah. that's 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 that's, that's so my I'm watermelon saying. guy. I heard yeah. Milo was originally in the movie, but he had to be cut because his impact was like too negative to the point where he, like they thought people are really gonna hate Milo, if because like they got Al to voice. Apparently, Al voices a new character in the movie. Um, hmm. We all think it's one of the mushroom aliens. We don't really. They haven't really officially announced who he's playing, but um, originally he came in and he did his Milo line. So they they cut it in animatic. So hopefully, well, I didn't work on the movie, but my wife did. Oh, she did? Really? What'd she do? Well, and I can say that uh, uh, the farmer's wife is in it. Ooh. My, my wife does the voice of the farmer's wife. The woman really? that always has <sighs> the shit fall on her. <laughs> what about my dreams? <laughs> I think my favorite iteration of that gag is like in the Christmas special montage at the end. And he's like holding a present and she's just like, <laughs> and the present just falls on her. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just the in the in the closing thing is just a fun little detail things keep falling on the farmer's wife i don't know why she's the farmer's wife yeah all right but so let's kind of a... let's kind of move into uh season two of milo um so i know a lot of things changed one of the things that was interesting is it seemed like you guys had more guest storyboard artists like ron rubio he just came in and did like two episodes um yeah. stuff like that what was that like with uh, like maybe more people coming in and out on the storyboard team was that harder as a director with Kind of. No, you know, you get you get boards, and it's it's always uh, anytime you break in someone new, it's going to be different. I don't remember the Ron Rubio boards. I think that might have been one. Those of might have been Bob's episodes, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I had uh, I had uh, I had my team. I had Chris Yabara, who was just yeah stuff, yeah. And uh, I like Joe Scott's stuff. Joe is very practical about stuff. I think he did the whole dance sequence in the mid afternoon snack club. Oh, that's such a fun one, yeah. I think he did that one, yeah. Did he do the I'm taking a stroll sequence? That's one of my personal favorites. I love I'm taking a stroll. <laughs> and then uh, you know, Ashley, forget about it. She did great boards. Oh, she she, she like her her posing and like the cuteness that she brings to the characters always comes out in like, Yeah, what was the show? Gosh. She did uh Ah, uh, Bowie. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't remember uh milo so well oh man yeah you should it would, it'd be fun to to talk to you again after you rewatch it if you ever rewatch it <laughs> or watch an episode with me i'll tell you what happened hey what? yeah <laughs> but i'd say like man if we could if we could get away with playing the phineas and ferb effect without getting copyright claimed yeah right <laughs> no I, I remember having fun on that show it was uh it, it was uh it was kind of nice that everything was boarded out that all the tough decisions were made. That it was right, you didn't have to work with the board artists to get stuff like writing as well, like yeah. perfect, yeah. Yeah, but it's a it's a different atmosphere. It was a different type of show. And I think it totally showed. If you watch Phineas and Ferb and you watch Milo, you can tell the difference. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Milo's, it's a different beast. I think Josh described it. It's an odd duck. It's a hard show to pitch to your friends to watch. Because, yeah. and I think, I yeah, think that's complicated. That, that that might be part of why it didn't find an audience as well is just because of the premise that's presented in the pilot versus what it becomes. Um, 
Well, the, the thing is, when you, when you do a complicated episode in the past, um, you might put in something, uh, and it has to be obvious so people can see it. But we always thought, well, Disney's just going to show this again and again and again, so you know, we can make it really complicated, and if anybody's interested, they can watch it again. But the problem is, if you make it too complicated, then they're not interested in the show and they won't watch it again. Yeah. So there's a fine line where uh, you can get people to rewatch an episode, and uh, you'll find more stuff buried in it. Well, it was always it was always tough because Disney Channel never aired season two. Like season two episodes got their seven a.m. premiere, and then they never aired them again. That was it. Sphere really? And, yeah, Sphere and Loathing only aired once. That was it. Well, I didn't know they were being so. So, uh, not generous. I, well, I know, because it's like, it aired one time, and this is this is really funny, is Star Versus was ending. It's like doing its series finale. At the same yeah. time, Milo was coming in. And I want to say it ended on the same day as First Impressions, um, which <laughs> is like the Young Kid episode. And I want to say First Impressions got better numbers than the Star series finale. Oh. After airing at like 7 a.m. So, like, I, I really do think Milo found his audience, but Disney just... Only ever aired the episodes once. I wonder why they did that. Which it's is almost like they're sabotaging their own show. You know? Well, it's baffling me because you spend millions of dollars to make this animated series, and then you never air it. Like, well, yeah, I remember being frustrated with Nickelodeon because they never uh, there was no merchandising. Oh, Star ended the same day as the season two finale of Milo, and Milo got better numbers on its season two finale than Star did in the series. By the way, Milo is up for a uh, daytime Emmy. Yes. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, day after tomorrow. We'll see. It's it's so crazy that it hasn't been officially canceled, though, because, like... <laughs> they could bring it back. It wouldn't be that hard. No, it wouldn't. That's, that's what's so baffling about them working to get Dan's new pilot up when my, they've already got the pitch packet for Milo Season 3, and... Yeah. Well, that's... there's... It, Things have really kind of changed. I think I think uh, producers now are like uh, they don't want to make any mistakes. They're afraid of making mistakes. The reckless attitude that we used to have making cartoons it's kind is kind of gone. You kind of want to play it safer. And everybody's playing it safe. And I'm like, well, that's not where jokes come from. That is, that's not how uh, that's not how comedy is made. But Disney, they have been treating their animation a lot better lately. They started an official animation Twitter account, posting behind the scenes and episode updates, and they're giving yeah. them weekly weekly releases with promotion. And I think it's they... funny. The last the last time I went to the Emmys, um, there was a down in the basement at the bottom of the stairs were all these social media people, like with three phones, watching watching the Emmys, and they they're all like using three different phones to tweet and. And stuff. I'm just like, wow, that's somebody's job. That must be tough. That's crazy. I don't know how much social media I can take. I mean, your 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 account is very popular, and I I don't know how you did it. You you got more followers than me, man. I just I just kind of I what? just engage with people. It's... Well, I went yeah, you know, like two weeks ago. I, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna put stuff up, and then no, I'm not. <laughs> so I just I just got a little. Eh. Hey, like I said, anything anything you see behind the scenes from Milo, we love this. Like, Phineas has plenty of behind the scenes stuff, but Milo, it's basically dry. There's no model sheets that we've seen. Like, what's so cool oh, is, like... I, I could have showed you a bunch of stuff, maybe. Yeah, like, so, like, with, it, like, Amphibia and whatnot they're doing now is, like, the creators, like, posting the model sheets on online for people to, like, work with <laughs> and design characters. Like, Milo, we never got any of this stuff. It was just kind of... On the model, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had uh, uh, two art directors on Milo, and uh, I don't think there was anything like really particularly special. As oh. far as like, wish I was better. I wish I was better prepared. I could show. You. Oh, look at this! Hey. No, no, you're good. You're good. Um, yeah. So let's see. Um, we talked about average turnaround time. Is there any episode you directed? We got that. Oh, what would you say is your biggest strength as a director versus Bob Bowen's biggest strength? Um, <laughs> I like my shows better than any other director. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, what I would do is... Uh, you and Bob just kind of take separate, separate paths yeah. for the most part. Well, he had his team. I had my team. Um, I would always, uh, like I said, I would always visit 
everyone at least once a day. Yeah. Just kind of pop in and see how they're doing, see how the show is. Um, no, I don't, I don't, yeah. you know, I can't really compare. Yeah. Um, so you got to direct um, Sphere and Loathing in Outer Space. So a couple questions about this. Did you know that it would be potentially the last time that we saw the Milo characters? Um, did you make any changes because of that? And then what were some of the biggest challenges on that episode in particular as the season finale? Well, I, um, yeah, usually, uh, usually networks don't let you do a season from a series finale. Yeah. Because they want to keep the show evergreen. Um, there was a series finale for the angry beavers where, where their, uh, their world slowly disappeared around them as people got laid off. <laughs> <laughs> like they lose, they lose color and then they, you know, they went to being storyboards. And, and uh, That's a fun finale. Yeah. Because they get a, the, he had a thing in the mail, and they did the soundtrack, and somebody put it up on on the web, and it's it's really funny. It's like, what's it like being over? You know, <laughs> because it's 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 about the same as anything, but uh, it gets a little sad when the checks get smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they want to keep the show evergreen, so so we did leave it open that Milo could come back. Yeah, you know. We didn't kill anybody, did we? No. <laughs> Not as far as I know. And I'm like, oh, Cabin Puss spinoff. Yes. Oh. Please, we need more Cabin Puss all the time. Poor, poor Cabin Puss. The fan that we, we fell in love with him, man. He's just... <laughs> I'll just be here on the ship. Fine. It's fine. <laughs> I did hear there was some debate about whether or not to put the Zach Melissa kiss in um, at the end of that episode. Do you remember any that, of that? Uh, uh, that little bit where Milo goes, yeah, that. that was Ashley. <laughs> they had the best time with that. I'm like, you know, if anyone's gonna do this, it's got to be her. Yeah, she was, always, she was always like really heavy into the shipping and all of that stuff. And I'm like, I, I, I don't. <laughs> you know, I like gags. The shipping thing is like, yeah, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, you know, but I, I understand people's enthusiasm for that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, Ashley did a great job on that one. The end of it. Oh, well, what was cool about that, that was, that was the first time the show didn't have its opening title sequence. You, you got to do the Sphere and Loathing song. <laughs> as Where he's floating through space. So, funny story, when I was watching that for the first time, I accidentally had my sound turned off. So I thought the first minute of it was just him floating in space with no sound and i was like how did disney let them get away with just him floating in space with no sound for the opening we would have put in <laughs> you know and then and then of course uh, i got to the parts that were supposed to be down. i was like oh wait something's wrong <laughs> but no that's that's such I, had a a fun scene, opening. I had a space you know we did all these space scenes and i had a space scene i i don't know if it's still in there but it was basically you're sitting in the back of the tesla car as milo goes by <laughs> wait what <laughs> you know the, how they shot the tesla car into space Oh, yeah, 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 I do think I know about that. So the Tesla car is like, you can see the dashboard and the readout and stuff like that as Milo floats by. But I think we had to cut that out because we can't show a car. I, uh, you know. There was, there, well, there was a fun action scene cut with the giant alien from earlier in the season that originally made the ship crash that I know got cut for time. Um yeah, that would have been in post. Like Perry, Perry comes in and he fights the giant, uh, the giant alien that comes out of the, the ship, which I, I like. That was that was one where like, it was weird because the way the ship was designed, you wanted to have the cage. I think it was like on the left, uh, yeah. so you could have the creature show up. But then, so that like in the episode before, you had the cage, and then and then in Sphere and Loathing, they just dropped the cage entirely and just put the thing back over it, since they didn't end up <laughs> using that part. There, walk away. <laughs> ship it let's get out of here yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but then uh yeah so sphere and loathing that was uh that had a lot of really great manky boards especially towards the end with the the G godzilla dog yeah we had to pretty much go over and get kyle and stand him up and say walk around kyle come on walk around <laughs> uh, <laughs> he just he would board himself into a question mark you know Oh, no. Like, come on, Kyle, go get some air. The poor some air. He's got to draw, like, the hundreds of Milos. Well, he's he's a dedicated. He is just 
hugely dedicated. I'm very yeah. excited to see what he's done on Candace Against the Universe. Oh, so I'm... hold on to your hat. <laughs> I've heard stories. I've I, I've heard well, there there's one of the teasers and there's like these aliens running around missing their upper halves and Candace is shooting like a t-shirt cannon and I'm just like <laughs> Man, this this is gonna be wild. <laughs> yeah, that's that's something you don't want to do is weaponize Candace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also I've heard super super big doctor is uh is gonna be interesting. So, well, I don't know. H have you gotten to see a preview of the movie though? Like, no, you no. you haven't. <laughs> I uh, I helped write one of the songs. Oh, so you did you did do something, but it was like a repurposed yeah, I was on, song. I was still on Milo, and then there was a songwriting session, so we sat there. It was a, a, a battle song where, a patriotic battle song where uh, the lyrics to the song accidentally give away their plan. Like, <laughs> they think we're attacking on the left, we're coming up on the right. You know, like, they're really bragging about their, yeah. their battle plan. This is our battle song. Dan said there was one song repurposed from Milo that was gonna appear in the movie, which is interesting. I don't know. I don't know if it'll be chop chop chop. That's my guess is chop chop chop. But we'll. Yeah, see. you know that was probably the most popular. But no, it's got to be substitute science teacher in space. She's got to float by at one point, right? Re oh yeah, is that that or Sphere and Loathing? I could see them repurposing Sphere and Loathing at some point with with like hey, Doof, be, Doof flying through space. Maybe it'll be the opera. <laughs> maybe maybe Phineas and Ferb are seeing the opera and that's the hey what we had uh, in the opera episode uh, when everything starts going bad um, Amanda was breathing into a paper bag <laughs> and then it goes like really bad and the bag just goes <laughs> I guess I I'm a baritone and now it's time to fight I'm a mezzo soprano and it all ends tonight <laughs> actually you sing actually, between a tenor and a bass and that makes you a baritone your hostility is misplaced <laughs> say what, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was fun mezzo soprano Brano is our family and... name but we yeah. all sing in baritone that makes us all the same we are all baritone it's funny the uh, voice actor the person who did the song was doing a uh, James Gandolfini imitation. Yeah. Well, kind of, kind of like up, up here like. There's this also is... issues with my mother. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't expecting that, you know. There's one but bit he... in that episode where there's like a, there's like a part where it looks like there's going to be the super long gag with things hitting each other, and then they cut back to the Dan Swampy characters, and he's just like, "Oh, that rope tree just slipped because I didn't tie it all that tight," but I was looking. <laughs> the person who bored that episode released the boards and like that was the original gag was for them to say oh that could all happen and then it does happen and i'm just like it's so much funnier that the rope just slips <laughs> Instead. Instead. i think that might have been an ed board i think that was ed rivera was on that one yeah i think it might have been yeah so um i kind of gone through um let's see so you talked about what songs you wrote for Milo. Um, so yeah, most recently you worked on Mirror Royal Detective. Is there any difference between directing 2D animation versus 3D? Anything that's changed? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's a, a preschool show, so they, uh, the amount of notes that you get are infinitely more. Yeah. Uh, additionally, on Mirror, we had a uh, cultural consultant uh, which would give notes. It's like, you can't do that. In India, that's flipping someone off. It's like, oh, shit, sorry. sorry. Yeah. No, it's like, because I know, like, in uh, in uh, uh, Arab countries, you can't, you can't, when you sit, you can't cross your legs and point the bottom of your foot at somebody. What? That's it's crazy. considered an insult, yeah. Um, I'm like, oh, thanks for telling me. Yeah. <laughs> um. So that was that was kind of weird. Uh, Sue Parado, who was director on Phineas, uh, was uh, supervising director on that show. So that was that was pretty easy. Sue and I work well together. Yeah. Um, the show it's preschool, and preschool is like still very fun. Yeah. Um, the the mirror character had these uh, two little mongoose friends that were fun to play with. So we had a lot of fun making them dance and stuff and making oh, them yeah. The animatics were going really well. So uh, they came back with a focus test and they said, 
here's the thing. Uh, kids really like small animals, to which we're all like, no kidding. <laughs> Did you see the uh, the Into the Unknown documentary about the making of Frozen 2? Like, they got back from the test screenings, and they looked at the favorite character sheets, and it was the little salamander, like the fire salamander, who wasn't even on the, the option. People wrote him in. And so oh. they're, they're, they're like, oh, I guess I guess we got to put more of that fire salamander in Frozen. That's just it. I mean, you can sit there and predict what people are going to like, but you know what kids like. They love animals. It's like Exactly. Easy. It's like, how did you know that? And I'm like, because I got them, kids and animals. <laughs> they like animals. Exactly. I pay attention to kids, you know. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a new wave of executives. I remember at Nickelodeon, we didn't have a lot of executives. There were, you know, there were notes. But uh, at one point, there were like twice as many executives. And then there were like four times as many executives. Yeah. And... Uh, it's, it's tough when you're outnumbered like that. Yeah. It'd be really funny if this happened. Well, you know, that's potentially this. Yeah, I agree. And everybody's just like hacking away at it. So our rule was always don't, don't not let's not, let's not bring no into the room. Yeah. Let's, let's just, uh, if you have a problem with something, what? not in front of the execs. Don't talk about it in front of the execs. Let them notice it. Yeah. And then ignore them. Because that always works. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think you know it's 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 the delicate balance of you know the execs they do want to have creative input sometimes and you got to like work with them to. Well, everybody wants to do their job and everybody wants to feel important. Exactly. Everybody wants kudos for doing a good job, and if your job is to find stuff that's wrong with something, then the more stuff you find that's wrong with it, the better you're you've done your job. Exactly. You feel like you know you didn't just come to work and say that was good. I got right. But that's compartmentalizing responsibilities. And as a director, like I said, um, it was all of our show. We all were working on the show. Yeah. It is. If, it's a passion if project. Idea, if you've got an idea, say it. You know, yeah. run up the flagpole and see who salutes it. You know, if yeah. you if you want to do a bit that you think the show needs, knock yourself out. I'll hold your coat. You know, yeah, and I'll I'll back you when we try to sell it. If it if it fails, then we'll fix it. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's it's, it's our show. You know. Yeah. All right. So, um, do you have an ultimate goal within the, within the industry? You you talked about I think uh, before we started. You have a, you. Can I say this or no? Can I say what? Can I say what you were doing, um, before what quarantine? Was what was I doing before? Oh, I was pitching stuff. Oh, you, you, you had like a pilot, right? Or oh, I had a pilot at Nickelodeon at one point, and I I've, I've got like seven different shows. You know? Oh wow, prolific prolific yeah. writing outside of work. Well, I just got uh, I just got word about uh, my Roman show. Sony just passed on it today. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Every time I do a show, let me see if you can see this. Yeah. This is when in Rome. This is this is for adults. Yeah, <laughs> you can tell. Yeah. It's basically uh, two cousins kind of <laughs> going through the Roman Empire. My uh, here's another one over here, and this is this is cute. This is my daughter's version of a bunch of my characters. Aw, she's a good artist. Yeah, I really she's like her style. She's going to school for botany. I like her style better than mine. It's like it's like really like I should, I should just pitch this. Yeah, it's really clean and cutesy, and I really like the way she does the eyes too. These three are a show called No Tomatoes. What's that one about? <laughs> or if you if you no, can say, No Tomatoes. It's a it's a show about uh, it's kind of the anti Phineas and Ferb. These guys want to do stuff and they have no idea how to do anything. Oh, so they got to learn it and go through everything that. Yeah, it's and it and it uh, the pacing on it was really different. It's it's really deliberate and slow and idiotic, and. Uh, you think that made it hard to sell, or? Oh yeah, you know, I, no one's no one's listening to pitches from me. They want they want you know bright young kids. They don't want to hear a pitch from an old guy. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's, that's kind of the way it goes. Yeah, well, life. Yeah. <laughs> As long as as long as you're still finding work and doing something you love, right? Yeah, 
yeah, still, I'd rather be doing this than, you know, working on the loading dock. Hey, and you got you got to the point where Sony had to pass on the show. That's that's good enough in and of itself, right? Like, you, you got yeah, you that right. far. You'd think. I had, uh, you know, I pitched at Netflix, I pitched at Sony, and a lot of times it's like, oh, we've already got a show that we're uh, considering that's like that, you know? Mm, and so coming up with yeah. something, just original ideas are difficult when you get with you got so many people making content well what it is is uh everybody is is subject to the same uh influences right and it's it's gonna happen i mean the automobile was invented at the same time like in three different countries exactly exactly so when i go to disney and say here's this show it's uh you know it's this boy and this girl it's a little like the x-files and it's a northern town it's like Oh, we've already got something like that. It's going to be called Gravity Falls. Right? Uh, <laughs> no, my my show is better than Gravity Falls, so I'm still like mad at Gravity Falls. Oh, now I see the animosity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's just it. I mean, it's I'm I'm a very competitive person. So, yeah. yeah, you want you want your idea to come first. Though I will say, Bill Cipher is a pretty is a pretty great villain. <laughs> oh, the, uh, the Illuminati. Tri- Demon Triangle. <laughs> yeah. Illuminati. Yes. <laughs> he was on the back of the dollar bill or something, right? Yeah. The all-seeing eye of Cheops. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, uh, so what advice would you look uh, give to anyone looking to break into the animation industry as a timer, director, producer? Like, where, where would you say they start? I would say uh, stay out of it because you're going to end up <laughs> my job, you rotten kid. I would say be flexible, you know? Like Focus with your creative vision or just with people? Like I know you mentioned like, you know, being nice will get you far, obviously. <laughs> well, the people that make it, the people that, that really do run off and get their their stuff, and I could name several, are are uh, uh, driven, you know, my way or the highway kind of thing. Right. But for every Seth MacFarlane, there's a hundred people who who were just as focused and just as dedicated and just couldn't get anything off the ground. You couldn't know? get the luck of the draw, yeah. Seth MacFarlane, by the way, is a very nice guy. Oh. Um, he's he's amazingly creative, an excellent piano player. And uh, I haven't talked to him since he became a billionaire. Wow, but he's a billionaire. He's got to be, right? I know Alex Hirsch, he's very my way or the highway with Gravity Falls. Like He, he fought for so much stuff with Disney on that show well he's at he's at uh, netflix now pretty much doing the same inspiring people in the same way um the the thing is if you're nice and you focus on the show instead of the politics you probably never get ahead <laughs> really that's a very cynical attitude well no but, it's, it's good to know you know if that's the way you get in you don't want to focus too much or get too emotionally invested in the show you know if, if the politics are important well that's just it I've, I've always focused on the show and I like I like entertaining yeah you know? and uh, I have been doing it for you know like 30 years so so something's working yeah um, also flexibility as far as um, the way things are shit changes roll with it yeah um, a lot of people from my generation, earlier generations, never got the hang of working on Storyboard Pro. Or just on digital in general? Right. Digital in general, the way the new process is. Every show is different. Every, I've, uh, how many programs have I had to learn in my career? Probably like 30 different programs. Yeah. You know, uh, Cubicom, Photoshop, D-Paint. Uh, storyboard Pro, Harmony. Yeah. You know, whatever the latest thing is, yeah, learn it. And, you know, teaching, you know, giving yourself in the spare time, you know, the time to learn that thing and to improve yourself in that way so that you become, you know, have all these things in your tool belt to use that yep. make you Absolutely. easier to easier to sell yourself, right? Absolutely, yeah. But the nice thing was, in the old days, you got to learn on the job. I learned on the job. I didn't go to school for animation. <laughs> yeah. I, I learned on the job. I went to school for communication (laughs) yeah totally not my thing um after college i i had a million different jobs and then you know i finally found the animation job and that was what you like uh, it isn't really like that anymore 
now it's you apply online with a million other people and nobody looks at the stuff that that gets applied online yeah it's it's more about who you know the you got to be in the building and that's where this uh the virus thing is kind of tough everybody's yeah. working from home and i don't mean to be you know oh give it up it's like no no once once you start uh doing it you can do it forever exactly because now people know you and you're a part of it which is yeah and honestly the best way to start off with is an internship yeah come on, come on out uh to nickelodeon do an internship over the summer yeah uh, you can you can you know nose around every department and, and well maybe not this summer but uh, <laughs> you know what i mean yeah learn, learn from everybody that you can and make friends and in, in all the different places there's a lot of resources. The Animation Union has a lot of resources. They've got a lot of classes. My friend Pete Michaels is teaching teaching a class in how to pitch shows. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, just stay flexible. That's all. Yeah. All right, um, so if you guys have any questions for Robert, go ahead and throw them in the comments. I think we're going to go through a couple um, just, like, random favorite stuff. So, um, yeah, favorite uh, moment that makes you emotional rewatching. Is there ever... A scene that ah. you rewatch and like gets you emotional or not? Nah? Oh, Phineas and Ferb, you know. Yeah. Um, I love the scene where Phineas gives up, and uh, Isabella says, "This isn't the Phineas that I fell into this situation." <laughs> <laughs> where she just blows it. Um, um, I like the scenes where Phineas yelled at people. <laughs> In all the specials, it was like, "Can get on the bike? Get on the bike!" Where he just like loses it and goes outside. Oh, that that became a meme. Get on the train. <laughs> yeah, but uh, um, I, one of my favorite little scenes is when uh, Milo accidentally high fives Zach in the face. That's oh, Murphy's law. Yeah. He's like, "Oh, I'm sorry. Let me use this." And Zach's like, "No, no, no, no we're cool, man. We're cool. <laughs> yeah. Why are you high fiving alliteration in the first place?" Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we got our first question. Do you or the other minds of Phineas and Ferb and Milo? feel responsibility to create progressive content regarding depictions of women, people of color, disabilities, um, etc. How do you balance that with paying, uh, playing to audience expectations? Well, it has to be sincere. If you're pandering and you get caught, you're burned. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I really was listening. Like I said, the, uh, the female characters, I have sisters, so I always play female characters like my sisters, and I know them very well. Yeah. What motivates them you know you know it's it's tough there is the the divide between and that's where it was nice having having uh you know aliki and and kim and and you know sue on the team is they could they could vouch for the the female perspective and i right. could listen and do it that way um i always did feel bad about poor Belgie taking a lot of crap but we turned that into sort of a rough older brother sort of situation yeah um on mira um we did have a cultural consultant telling us not to you know what might be thought of as offensive in india but yeah. additionally we had um uh, sort of a bollywood dance choreographer that we could refer to and it was like oh man because up until that point the only thing that i had been using is this one clip of a bollywood number it wasn't Richard. robert Benz, robert ball <laughs> no. I, that's on my website too the actual clip and i think i i think i did it i think i tweeted it um, yeah if you look at the opening shot of that it's like we took everything from rubber bands rubber balls yeah you know we're not uh we are very conscientious about about that but uh i think it it has to be sincere yeah definitely. you know because Pandering, kids. pandering is almost worse than. And kids will catch you every time. The little kids. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh man. All right. You let's know. see. Um, progressiveness regarding the creative team. I know so many people who aspire to go into animation, but have concerns about having so few role models as directors. Um, hmm. like on Milo, would you say the team is pretty progressive as far as you know the people on it? On Milo, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. Um. Basically, uh, uh, as far as role models go, uh, my, 
personal role models were based on content and not necessarily who they were. Mm. Uh, I was kind of sniffing around um, the remake of The Boondocks. And uh, I went in and, and uh, looked up uh, the guy who, gosh, what the heck is his name? And uh, I listened to some of the messages because I remember the boondocks. I never, I never watched it, but I remembered it. And some of the messages that he had were like dead on. Yeah. And I, and I totally agreed with him, but for me to walk onto that show and say, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, eh, to say the, what, what comes out in the final product isn't always reflective of the people who made it is I think, I think that's what you're trying to say, right? Like, yeah, like it's, this, it's important to have role models, and I think that's that's totally solid. When, uh, and I've heard stories about that. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg was saying when she saw her first another black character on the screen, she just about look, look, they yeah, exist, exactly. They exist, you know, and I, you know, uh, it's that's never been the case. I'm always just looking at the cartoons, and the cartoons when I was a kid, it was like it's a dog and a Dog you know. and a cat and Rocco. <laughs> it's a, yeah. So, yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, is there a character team up that would be fun to explore that you haven't already? I.e. Car- Candace and Sarah or a team up to return. Mrs. Morosky and Scott, Perry and D.O.G., etc. <laughs> Perry and D.O.G. Hmm. I think Candace and anyone. I think if uh, Candace and Melissa got together, that'd be kind of fun. To just have like a day, a day with them. Yeah, where Melissa just kind of goes, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, kind of straightens <laughs> it up. And then, like, she meets her friend Stacy and goes, what's wrong with her? I was like, I know. What's wrong with both? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, it was so funny because when Vanessa shows up in Milo, we were all surprised you guys didn't take the opportunity to, like, have a Vanessa and Sarah episode. We were all like, well, you get, you got Vanessa here. Let's, let's, let's see Vanessa meet Sarah. Teenage team up. <laughs> you think they get along? Probably not, but I mean, isn't that the fun? Vanessa thing? is so goth, and and uh, Sarah is just so you know, oh, doctor's own everything, you know. Yeah, it's like I don't think I don't think Vanessa would have a lot of patience for Sarah. That's true. <laughs> you know, probably just like out of my way. I got shit to do, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I love the voice of uh, uh, Vanessa. That's uh, oh actually, Olivia Olson. Her singing voice is just straight up magical it's martin's daughter yeah yeah no you know it's funny uh, scott has his little mildred babies and at the end of milo season two he like opens his coat and he's got like three baby milk curtains <laughs> <laughs> that's fun it's like he and he and the milk carton got busy <laughs> um this is you, know, you can't answer this but it's like would you consider moving milo to a different network that's not disney or would that be really complicated <laughs> Well, anybody that makes it would still have to pay Disney, and there's no way that you would make enough money to pay Disney back on that. Nah. And besides, Disney won't let go of it. Exactly. Even if they don't do um, anything with it. Well, you never know. I mean, uh, um, all it takes is one new executive who wants to take a chance. Yeah. The uh, you know the executive who's like, "Can I like the cutting of Jeff? I'm going to make you a star." That exactly. It's like it's like, wait, why did we drop this show? You're, you're telling me oh. the numbers were better than Star. Somebody finally picks it up, coming in, and it's like, as an executive, the best way to keep your job is to keep saying no. Yeah. The second, you put your name on something, it has to be the best thing ever, or all the other executives are going to burn you. Yeah. So um, it's a it's a rough life, and that's why I don't go above that pay grade. Yeah. Because you, you don't want to have to deal with that. I'm like, tell me tell me how long you want it. and I'll make it there. I'll make it. Yeah. yeah, I'll do it. Was there ever talk about making a second Phineas and Ferb movie after Second Dimension, but before Candace? Oh, there always was. You know, Dan's got a bunch of stuff in his... I heard that they Disney announced the live-action Phineas theatrical film that never... Like, that got announced, but that never made it to screen. Do you know what happened with that? No, I you know... um. The live action Disney doing live action stuff of their cartoons has any of it been good? Any good? <laughs> Jungle Book? Did you see Mowgli? Jungle Book was fine. I enjoyed Jungle Book. I mean, like, it's it's one of those where it's, it's like there's was that Mowgli or Jungle Book, the one where like the, their mouths were going. Uh, uh, that's that's awesome. they're the same. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I mean, like you look at you look at the live action Kim Possible they did for Disney Channel, and it's like. 
no. Well, one of what what the executives are doing now is they're afraid to do new stuff, so they're bringing back old stuff. They would rather bring back Alvin and the Chipmunks at Nickelodeon than do something new. Exactly. And they're like, we need something that's really popular, like SpongeBob, and it's like you don't. You haven't canceled SpongeBob. It's still going. SpongeBob was new. That came. That that's new. That's why it was popular, because they hadn't seen this before. Right. Uh, that's what made it popular. Not not that anyone was in love with SpongeBob. Yeah. I mean, and then then Disney invested in the dual the dual isekai with uh, Amphibia and Owl House, both being Teen Girl in Another World. <laughs> Which uh, I, I think it's so funny that those both got greenlit back to back because <laughs> they yeah it's weird i keep going and, and they're, they're like oh we've already got something like that it's like maybe they forgot how to say that for those guys <laughs> <laughs> let's see uh, uh i think kim went over to uh, she was on owl, owl house for a while owl house the- i've seen like the first episode but i need to get into it more i've heard it's pretty pretty fun show yeah um was uh would stacy jenny or coltrane ever make an appearance as milo and the gang age <laughs> always they're friends yeah they're always gonna be friends you know yeah. i don't know about jenny jenny's kind of jenny's like hardly in it and then her brother being Django. i didn't even know that until like like a, w- a month ago <laughs> like yes. this couple months like jenny and Django. <laughs> yes. or well um um yeah Django. that's a uh, swampy's kid yeah um they didn't even yeah when when uh, dan and swampy put their kids in they don't even change their names i know well it's it's so funny because you have the fireside it's the it's the maze episode of phineas and ferb and yeah. it's got little melissa the new fireside girl who comes in with isabella <laughs> <laughs> and she's like getting through the maze um yeah. did you take inspiration from doctor who for the way time travel works sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy milo's letter the peach sometimes the timeline changes the defeated king pistache john and Derek. uh josh did <laughs> time travel uh yeah the peach um that was just me sticking my finger in the whole time travel probe you know <laughs> sticking my finger in the belly button of the whole time travel thing because people are like well if you do this then that you know and they're explaining shit and it's like eh. josh was like for season two we really tried to make it a less complex story because we were so tired of keeping track of all the plot points and then season two ended up being like more complex yeah i know <laughs> It just kept it kept getting more and more uh, complicated and involved and, and uh, sounds like you so you got the Cavendish and Dakota they have to get fired they have to get rehired then they have to have a status quo then they break up then you have to have episodes with them separately and you have to integrate them into those episodes separately and then on top of that you got Doof and Perry you have to integrate and then they have to break up and then they have to get back together and then you got I mean, the that's why they didn't reshow the shows because it's like you show this one and and uh, Cavendish and Dakota are together but. You know, the last one I just saw, they were they broken up. You know, it's like yeah. watching Agents of Shield out of order. You know, oh, Agents of Shield is like, so good, man. Do you watch? Is he it? alive again? Shit, that guy's alive. <laughs> <laughs> Do you watch Agents of Shield? We did. We watched uh, first season, but uh, my daughter's uh, uh, kind of turned on it. Gotcha. Yeah, like it's, when you get to like season four and Ghost Rider and stuff, it gets it gets wild. It's a lot of fun. Oh they, yeah. The writers, Marvel, just kind of stopped paying attention to them. So, so they went in some really wild directions and had a lot of fun. We had um, so uh, Brick and Savannah originally was um, Colson. Uh, what's his name? Greg. That was Clark Gregg's voice for Brick. He did it. He did it originally. What? But then he backed out because he wouldn't be there. He wouldn't be available for um, you know any pickup lines or or ADR that might come up. Wow. So the guy who played. The guy who played Ward on Agents of Shield stepped into that uh, role. That's so wild! I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, uh, Agent May and Ward were uh, Brick and Savannah. Yeah. And I know they have real names. I just I don't remember them. Oh no! Yeah, that's that's good. That's, it was Brick and Savannah. Um, this, this is why I'm not like don't have my own show. I don't know people's names. <laughs> so this is going back to Phineas and Ferb. In the first episode, there were a few live action sequences. Were those intended to be a part of the whole series? Was that a stylistic thing that you guys kind of wrote out? Like when the coaster's falling towards the earth and you use like an actual video of the real earth <laughs> instead of... That's Burbank, by the way. Yeah. We're just Yeah, somebody took a picture out the airplane window and we just used it. Um, I know we did a... Uh, in the... Uh, uh, 
we couldn't do live action footage on Phineas. Um, but like, what about like the episode where they're doing the movie and you got the picture of Ashley Teasdale when they're doing the princess movie and they just kind of like <laughs> animate the lips. Oh, to dream. <laughs> to... Yeah. That's funny. And, and the uh, caveman episode, I forget what that one was called. I think it was boyfriend from 10,000 BC. If I remember. Well, no, the, uh, where we went back in time. Oh, uh, it's about time. It's about time. Fossils. Dun, dun, dun. No, no. <laughs> it was uh, Phineas and Ferb were cavemen. Oh, uh, oh, what's it called? And you see the Tristone area. Tristone area. Tristone area. That was funny. That was uh, Antoine and the Leaky boarded that one, and they pitched it uh, while I was on vacation. And when they pitched it, they said, they said, uh, you know, so he needs, he's trying to do this. So he, he's doing this, you know, and it was supposed to be all grunts. <laughs> and uh, I came back from vacation without seeing the pitch. And I'm like, I'm reading what it's supposed to be. And I'm like, how's anyone going to know this? You know, I, it's one where the, 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 you need the tonal inflection and the voice performance for that to really come across. As yeah. Otherwise. So, so I, I created a cave language, um, Finnabuck and Gerb. You know, Finnabon, uh, curb. Can talk in Charka. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of sounded like the buzzwords for all of this. Let me put that in. And then, uh, but Dan and Swampy appeared in that episode in little cutouts. Yeah. Uh, still frames. Take a picture and then acting. Because we couldn't do live action. They wanted to do live action where they're like, this episode isn't going anywhere. You know, like they're trying to. But they had the... to take out the frames because of the rule. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. Realize oh, that was. That. Uh, yeah, that was all on a camera. My, uh, my wife took the pictures. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's good posing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny that Disney would be like, "Yeah, we want to do a Phineas and Ferb live action movie after so long." Be like, "No live action." Yeah, who would you get? You know. Yeah. It's like uh, there were rumors that Jim Carrey was going to play Doof at one point. Um, could you imagine? I don't know if they were ever true, but that was that was what was floating. That can't be real. <laughs> no, I want to see. I want to see the Russian Insane Asylum episode. Yeah, the opening. I want to see. I want to see uh, Dan go in there and get the diary from the insane Russian girl. All right, who, who is a character that always makes you really excited whenever they're in an episode? Like a character that maybe doesn't appear all the time, but whenever you see them in an episode, you're like, oh, yeah, it's, it's good to see them again. Oh, I don't know. I like Joni. Joni, <laughs> yeah. For obvious reasons, yeah. Yeah. Um, did the Milo writers ever think about how Milo packs his backpack? Well, we, were, we always treated it like uh, Felix's magic bag of tricks, you know. You know, the funniest thing is when I first watched it, I thought, I, I, the first thing I thought was Dora. That was, I don't know why. That was, that was just like, oh. Just like, I'm the map, I'm the map. I yeah. Dora, but yeah. But I think, I think some of the, some of the, uh, some of the writers thought about the, uh, you know, Mary Poppins bag. Yeah. Know, opens and she pulls out a, a lamp, you know. <laughs> they just love that stuff. The kitchen but, sink uh, was in your backpack? No, I think that came from the girls' bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the backpack was weird. It's like uh, um, like on Rocco, um, as the show went along, uh, people quit using Spunky, his little dog. Yeah. They just quit drawing him because he wasn't very exciting. And... And that's how, how I thought about the backpack was like, oh, shit, did we leave that out again? <laughs> <laughs> and this is like, remember your backpack. I feel like that was what happened with Susie and Phineas and Ferb, because she was like the only character that didn't abide by the Dan Swampy rule, that no characters are mean to each other. Like, she was the yeah. only one that broke that rule, and so they just slowly wrote her out as the show went along. I think she might have been a uh, Chris Hedrick invention. Yeah. Chris Hedrick was one of our, uh, one of our board guys. And he's he's the guy that's that virtually boarded uh, a lot of uh, dude. We're getting the band back together because he was a musician too, and uh, he does good. The uh, fabulous song he boarded that one, you know. Dun, 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 at the no, end. no, no. This is all wrong. Finally, <laughs> the, the spirit of rock will call out to you. 
Yeah, I think I think he came up with Susie that that she was just this this little kid that that was Candace's nemesis. Little brat, yeah. Yeah, just a little. But uh, yeah, but it was uh, her boyfriend's uh, little sister that inspired it. Made it even worse. Do you remember? But, yeah, the... it was, and that, that's probably why she disappeared because it was it was mean, you know. Yeah. Did and, do you uh, remember the the Melissa's hamster nemesis that was in the original pitch for Milo for a good long time? No. Josh likes to talk about this. And Melissa originally had a hamster nemesis, and it made it so close to becoming a regular part of the show, and then eventually. Yeah, this is stuff that probably all blew out in the writers' room before I got. I got before through. you just sat yeah. in there, and they're like, "Hey, welcome back." Yeah, like uh, yeah. So Scott and Josh and uh, Jim would always. All right, let's see. Um, circles. This was writers' thing, but like, was uh, Isabella originally going to have more in the crossover? Yeah, she was. We we kind of know about that. Um, is there a Phineas and Ferb episode that you worked on that never aired that you wish had? No, they all did. They all aired. No, not as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, what about the what about the one with the Russian insane asylum? The lost episode. Yeah, the lost episode. Um, now we we oh yeah some some did fall out of rotation because they weren't working. Um, but eventually we did them later. You can uh, some shows it doesn't matter what you do they're just diseased from the beginning. And you gotta, you just gotta take them out in the field and put them down, you know. <laughs> but uh, what we would do with shows like that is just like drop them out of rotation and forget about it for a little while, and then put them in at the end. Come back which, to the uh, idea. Yeah, which I think is why uh, we had such a bunch of weird shows at the end of Phineas. <laughs> like Return to the Second Dimension and One Hundred One and Do Four. Yeah, I, I wish Return to the Sem Second. It was fun, but I wish it was better. You know. Yeah. I I, uh, I do like the uh, all the convoluted reasons we pretend to be divorced. We get double the amount of discount coupons in the mail. <laughs> yeah, I do like that song and, and the other one where uh, 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 there's a big doof number at the beginning. No, I think that got cut. Because the, the, the song at the beginning of that one is about sports. It's just like they don't know how to play sports, and so they're trying to figure out their sports. Yeah, I wrote that one in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> I I played the ukulele, and, and I drummed on the ukulele case, and then it's just like, chip it. Yeah. Um, I thought I thought that was funny, that they didn't know how to play sports, so they just play all of them at once. And, and then, then it goes uh, like into the rules, like, I have to do this and this and this and this. Yeah, and then uh, the person reading the rules was our animatics editor, Lauren. Ah. And I, I think she they actually used her in the final song. <laughs> That's so cool. I mean, that was basically how Aaron got his singing role on the show. Is Dan was like, we need a younger voice, and so Danny just had his son sing. And <laughs> yeah, before you know it, he's singing the last song of the series. Yeah, that was fun. He's a good guy. I like yeah. that. Danny Jacobs is a great guy too. He uh, just got married. Oh yeah, keep going. Oh, he oh. just got married. Oh, he just got married. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Um, somebody's asking, uh, this is probably another thing you didn't have a lot, but what went into deciding the ships for Milo? Was it mainly a storytelling decision or was it just, <laughs> it kind of, you know, that that's, uh, in, when you're producing a show, when two characters get together, it really kind of just kills the dynamic. The second they consummate the relationship with the kiss or, you know, admit that they're boyfriend and girlfriend, it's all over. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Is that um, why you kind of try to dance around it? Because like, there's this fun line in Escape where Zach's like, Milo, get up here. This is starting to feel like a date. Or no, Melissa's like, Milo, you got to get up here. This is starting to feel like a date. And Zach's like, you wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, it, it's it's weird. I mean, they do that in all shows. It's like when, you know, in the old show Friends, when Ross and Rachel got together, it just killed the dynamics. So then they had to break up. And then there was like animosity between them. Yeah. But because nobody explores, um, you know, the, the fun, weird things about being with another person. Yeah. You know, in that sort of a relationship. It's like, I, I hate the zoo, but, but you do. You like the zoo, so now I got to I have to like the zoo and go to it, yeah. I like the zoo, it's great, yeah. 
So did you ever think about that? Like, if you had to do a season three, like now that you've had the big kiss moment and Milo's teased about it, like actually addressing that, or is it just going to kind of be like shoved under the rug? <laughs> You'd have to address it, right? You have to yeah. move the story forward. It's like if they brought back Phineas and Ferb, would we just pick up at the same summer, or would we, would we go from act your age, right? You know? or would we, you know, add a new character, which just usually kills stuff. <laughs> it's like some cute little hey i'm the i'm the crazy cute little kid and it's like ugh. yeah those those adding new characters is tough i'm trying to think if uh phineas added irving in season two and because i think he was part of the original pitch it worked um yeah and they did you know, they didn't uh, do him in season one because they wanted more diversity so they brought in balji um and isabella instead no isabella was part of the original pitch but it's funny when uh, the the first episode the kid the the fat kid who goes that was awesome. That was uh, that was going to be Buford. <laughs> really? Yeah. But we changed the design, and then I saw I saw that he pops up like in the incidental pack all the time. It's just like mm, there's the kid who says, "Yeah, it was awesome." <laughs> but he went to a the, that model went to a special pack because if you use them, you have to use the original voice guy. Right. It was Bobby Gaylor the for voice it. person. And then you have to like go back in time and go, oh, they're they're like thirty years old now, and they don't sound like a kid anymore, you know? Yeah. How many how many Hey Arnolds were there? There was one Helga, but there were like four Arnolds because he kept growing up. Really, I didn't yeah. realize that. Well, we were lucky enough on Phineas to keep um, to keep the same voices throughout. Yeah, you yeah. hear him go through puberty, and I actually think his voice post puberty is the more iconic Phineas that everybody remembers rather than the... Yeah. Well, you hear it, yeah, you go back and, and watch that first episode and go, oh, they were so cute. Yeah. <laughs> they were so cute when they were little. And Thomas Sangster, although I don't think Thomas did the voice in the movie. Of who? But, uh, for... Oh, no, he, he didn't do it for the crossover or for the new movie, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, Arrigo Jun David Arrigo Jr. now. Well. Which uh, that's a story that I'd love to hear about why Thomas didn't want to come back, but I think that's probably on the more hush hush well, side. The thing is, for him, it was probably a big pain in the butt if you think about it. He had one line per episode. Well, yeah, but like, come on, how much money is Disney going to throw at you to just go in and reprise your role as you know a major character in their franchise? Right? It's got to be like a decent chunk of change, right? Well, it's not always about money, you know. Well, that's true. Probably has something else going on or whatever, and yeah, uh, you know. I don't. I don't think I ever met him. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, what episode are you most proud of that you worked on? This could be for Milo and for Phineas. Oh, which... summer belongs to you is my summer. Favorite. Summer belongs to you. Yeah. And I liked. I liked. Dude, we're getting the band back together. That had a lot of moments. Yeah. On Milo. Just... On Milo, I liked the opera episode. The smooth operator. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair and loathing. That was fun. That, uh, from what I remember about it. Yeah. Although I like Game Night, too. I don't know, I don't know if that episode's any good. I, I'll probably watch it again and go, oh, brother. <laughs> I remember I remember liking that. I remember liking the uh, Secrets and Pies. Yeah, Secrets and Pies. Uh, because who doesn't like the Lumberzack song? <laughs> you know, it's so funny. They got uh, Tyler Mann. He plays Max, uh, one of the Lumberzack rivals. And in the Battle of the Bands episode, they do a whole version of it, Saw, Saw, Saw. And they actually yeah. record the whole version with Tyler Mann singing the entire song in his beautiful <laughs> singing voice, and we will never hear it. Because <laughs> oh, no. it just plays in the background. Uh, and it's just one of those, it's like, ah, oh, I'd love to hear Tyler Mann singing Chop, Chop, Chop. <laughs> <laughs> I like Snack Club, too. That was fun. Oh, yeah, Mid-Afternoon Snack Club's good. The, uh... Yeah, I had a mix of the song, We Can Do What We Want, and it was like, the cutting on it was like, and uh, it got, Sliced. it got uh, fixed. Mm. You're, not, you're not allowed to flash scenes in children's cartoons because it could lead to uh, epileptic seizures. And they have a thing called the Harding Box, which will tell you if a scene is too short. Huh. And for the life of me, I don't know what it is. Is it a box or is it just somebody guessing and blaming it on this thing? And I used to tease Anne, our, our, our uh, post, uh, 
uh, editor Ann Harding. Yeah. Uh, about it, and I'm, I'm like, "There's no such thing. There's no such thing. That's just a lie." She's like, "It's true. It's real." So we, I kind of give her crap about that. All right. Let's see. Um. That one's a little specific. Uh, what if Love Handle comes to mentor just getting started? <laughs> <laughs> you, you think there's still a band? I mean, they got together for that one concert. Would they still be a band? And they, come, they come back and sing about the giant 3D scrapbook. <laughs> oh, right. Right. Mm, yeah, well, they would have to, wouldn't they? And then they sing at the, the dedication of the goulash thing, too. So I guess they're still together for... The uh, yeah the the main guy Steve Zahn, I think he was in uh, he was in that Tom Hanks movie. Uh, oh, what was it? That thing you do. Did you ever see that movie? No, I haven't seen it. It's an adorable movie. It's it's like the nicest rock and roll movie ever made. And Better than School of Rock. Well. Uh, our composer Danny Jacob worked on that movie, not School of Rock, but uh, that thing you do, ah. because he showed the actors how to pose with their guitars. That's <laughs> so cool. He actually taught them like some riffs, yeah. so like the actors playing and singing, and I and I heard this in the interview. It's like they're playing and singing. And it looks nothing. And then it, it pans up to their head, and they're like, I can quit pretending to do chords now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think Danny uh, coached them how to look like they were actually playing their guitar. That's really neat. That thing you do, it's a fun movie. Um, do you have a character that you relate to the most from Milo or Phineas, or that remind you the most of somebody in real life? Uh, you know, every every character, I you know, it's kind of a dull answer, but I, I put me into every character. I'm I'm in Candace. I'm in. Melissa. Yeah, you find out what part of them can connect to you as a person. That's how you direct, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, as soon as you find their weakness, you know, that Zach doesn't like fish. <laughs> <laughs> Not just eating it, just he doesn't like fish. In general. And it's like, why do you hate fish so much? Hmm. But uh, I, I really like Milo. I liked his, probably because I like Weird Al so much. Anybody who's optimistic. Oh, yeah. You know, and Phineas, you know, forget about it. They don't come any more optimistic than that. <laughs> Although a lot of people would say, well, Doof, you know, and as a dad, it's like, yeah. Doof a lot is of, such a dad. Yeah, I put a lot of, I put a lot of me in Doof too. Yeah. Um, you know? Somebody says, I have one question only. How is your day been progressing? <laughs> oh, oh, watch that person. I have a feeling they're a pistachio. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody asked, "Do you remember at the car wash and the excellent mole plot?" Also, the line, "Oh no, and it, it's a giant, hideous giant mole." <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, that was Mike Dietrich who that one. And the guy has like a giant mole. He's like, hey. <laughs> Not you, mole. That mole. I like the car wash episode. Now, that song was uh, was fun. You know, um, another song I liked was uh, "Let's Spend Half a Day Together." Let's take half a day and be together. That was a, uh, we just wanted to write a pop song. It's like, you have a half a day. So it's like, so we wrote a song about everything you could do in a half a day. We could split and, uh, a half a cheese sandwich and take Kate half Pearson. of you. They got Kate Pearson from the B-52s to sing it. Really? Like, that is so cool because, I mean, I, I saw the B-52s at a bar. <laughs> I mean... That's that's how how long I've I've really liked that band, you know. You know, it's crazy. You know, these shows address the interconnectivity of all things, and you know, it, it comes back around to even like just I saw this band at a bar one time, and now they're they're singing yeah. the show. Yeah, now she's doing my song. Hey, that was really cool. Martin and I wrote that one, and uh, originally it was on the piano. So we were writing, we were actually writing it like a Go Go's song. Uh -huh. If you. If you I think to I've listened to like one or two of the Go Go's songs. Yeah, but um, for her to sing it, if I knew they were going to get her, I would have written a B fifty two song. You know? Yeah, and just have someone talk like this. All right. <laughs> Patrick asked what it's like directing D, but you're not a you're not the voice director. Swampy's like the voice director. Well, I've done voice direction. When, oh, you have done voice I, directing. 
Yeah, yeah. That's well. That was one of the other things as a producer. If Swampy usually did the voices, and uh, if he couldn't make it, Dan would sit in, and if Dan couldn't make it, I would sit in. Ah, so did you ever get to direct D? D. 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 Bradley Baker. Oh shit! Yeah. Well, <laughs> D's D is crazy. He's not. <laughs> I worked with him on uh, on uh, Mira. Um, for the Wii? <laughs> uh, Benicula. Ah, that makes sense. He's, man, he, if there's a show with an animal, he's in it. <laughs> yeah, he's he's great. We went to, uh, oh, it's so funny. He's, he's uh, uh, I won't get into it, but he's, he's like one of those guys, most voice people are always on. Yeah. And he can do any voice. And when he would do, oh, what did he do? He did like the uh, Sarlacc or something like that from the Star Wars episode. And he's like pulling his throat and his face. <laughs> it's like, dude, stop it, stop it. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, and somebody's quoting the line from the crossover. What's wrong with your neck? <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Um, somebody asks about Elliot and Bradley. Do you like the scene where he's like, oh no, I spilled my marbles all over the growl. <laughs> I love that scene so much. <laughs> Not gonna happen. All right, all right. Stop, citizen. That's dangerous. And then he vacuums and then the one just goes in the sewer. That was, I just, um... Uh, I, I, I guess I was just bored one day, and I'm like, you know what? This scene is just going to go on way too long. Oh, is is the Terry in that episode where they're like, Terry? It's like, I have feelings, man. Was that was that a personal thing? Was that a bored artist thing? Because that was one of those, that, like, he's like... I got feelings, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where did that come from? Uh, Terry was uh, one of our timers. Oh, we were, okay. We were just making fun of him. I, I would always put people on the crew, and I was always put their names into it. <laughs> Uh, Doofenshmirtz's upstairs neighbor, Mrs. Thompson, was my neighbor when I was growing up. She lived next door. Oh, in Second Dimension. That's so cool. Mrs. Thompson. I hear he's divorced. Oh, that she remembers. <laughs> that she remembers. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were always putting in names like that. Um, well, some of us, you know, can't afford designer jeans, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was that was a throwback because you had the Romeo and Juliet sort of reference with. Uh... I was trying to explain that to my daughters. We watched that episode last night. I told you. Yeah. It's the Capulet bar mitzvah and the uh, and <laughs> the Hatfields or the <laughs> the Hatfield. You're the Hatfields wedding. Well, that was that was uh, Joe Arancia, um being a wise guy. That's an underrated special because that's actually the only time Monty appears outside of the context of Vanessa, which is one of the yeah. things that I really like about it. And it also explores uh, the love muffin further than we've ever really seen it before. I think there was a gag in there where they knock somebody out and it's like, ooh, now you get all his health. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, dude, you play way too many video games. <laughs> well, it's so fun to see Rodney. Rodney is one of those characters that I feel like is just like a really underrated Phineas and Ferb character. Well, that is, that is Joe Arancia. That uh, is? <laughs> Anytime Joe did a board, he'd always put Rodney in it so he could make some voice buck. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, really. All he's doing is Marvin the Martian. <laughs> yeah. You Different Schmerz, what are you doing here? Different Schmerz, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the one. It's like, so to you, a building settling sounds like somebody breathing out. <laughs> and now our building suddenly has the urge to warn Carl. <laughs> Oh, that's one of my favorite bits from that one. I live in a weird building. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, one of the other professors, uh, I talk about Mike Dietrich, the board guy. The uh, Dr. Dominion. <laughs> that is Mike Dietrich. That's a caricature of him. I don't have a Napoleon complex. Napoleon had a me complex. <laughs> of course, the love muffin bylaws which govern us all say to enter this pageant, you must be this tall. So disqualified. <laughs> And our, uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, designers, Celeste, is one of the bad guys. There's a caricature of her as, as one, of the, uh, one of the evil love muffin people. That's great. 
I mean, my family ended up in the, uh, they did a caricature of my family in the uh, steampunks episode. But uh, I, I have been, they've put my caricature in every show that I've ever been on. And some of them I don't like, (laughs) but, but I don't take them out. Like you there's know. there's some like very like Josh Josh's is pretty obvious Jim's is pretty obvious because he's got the whole nobody cares Jim bit. Poor Jim. <laughs> this will raise well, important just, ethical questions as we continue to develop technology. Jim is Jim is like super smart, you know. Everybody's, yeah, that's what Josh said. He's just like a wealth of information. Like, <laughs> well, you know, everybody's everybody's clever, and, yeah, and everybody knows a few things, but but Jim just happens to know everything. And and what makes it worse is he's right. <laughs> <laughs> you can't and, uh, argue. Yeah, so like Joe Arancha, he might he might go and, and start explaining something in a little more detail than you care to uh, be party to. <laughs> yeah. Um let's see. Or Some, Jim. Somebody asked, what was what was the point of Milo Murphy's last season one leading up to the crossover? But that wasn't really something that you were involved in writing, you just kind of directed it. What was the what was the show? Just what was the point of the season one leading up to the crossroad. I think it was just to meet Phineas and Ferb. That's kind of not, well, um, not a deep when question. Come, <laughs> well, when you come to the end of season one, you always like to add stuff that will entice the executives to give you another season. Something new. Like like Josh trying to make Melissa a full-on pistachio. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just it. I mean, <laughs> you have to you have to resolve stuff. You can't leave them hanging in entropy forever, you know. Only for a so year and a half. <laughs> the motivation, the motivation for doing that is is purely a survival instinct, I think. Yeah, you know? just to make sure that oh well, we have to renew you for season two if you're going to bring Phineas and Ferb in. Yeah, I used to uh, I used to uh, time on a show called As Told by Ginger, which was a uh, Klasky Chupo show. And uh, it was one of those shows that was in three acts. And I liked the writing on the show so much. And they would send me an act, and I would do an act. And then yeah. the next week, they send me an act up from another show. And I said, would you send me the animatic for the other acts? Because I want to know how this ends. It's like, <laughs> I like the show so much, I wanted to watch the whole show. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. <laughs> we've got a lot of people catching up with, because I'm just kind of reading through the questions. Uh, will there be a coot? Not tonight. Um, <laughs> well, and Dan, the only... Yeah, apparently the writers, this was something from the writer's room, but they're like, well, I mean, Dan said he did it to include Phineas and Ferb characters in Milo, but the only ones that really appear, Doof and Perry. Josh was talking about how the writer's room pitched, like, everything that you could think of to bring Phineas and Ferb back at some point in season two, but Dan Swamp just never felt it was justified. Um, well, yeah, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of secondary characters and such. Yeah. There's Mike, there's Mike D. Hey, there. there he is. <laughs> yeah, we well, are going over there. Yeah. Um. But uh, the uh, one fun pitch Josh had mentioned was that uh, like they were gonna have an episode where just every single Phineas and Ferb character appeared, but it was only in the background. Like the entire episode just played out, but like <laughs> every single Phineas character is gonna appear somewhere in the episode, just n- no speaking lines. We did a uh, I did a show that included every character in this one musical number. Was that that was Roller Coaster the Musical? I think that was. Oh gosh, jeez. Oh, that. Geez. That had like eh. That took a lot out of us, but that was <laughs> I really got a kick out of that episode, you know, making a musical out of Roller Coaster. It's like here we are visiting Roller Coaster again. That one has and some great I, songs. And then I dropped the Roller Coaster on Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was your bit. Yeah. To drop that's so cool. Well, it, it was probably in the script. I don't know. I don't remember if I made that one up, but uh, yeah, you know what? It was probably in the script. But, were you saying uh, were you were you saying that you need to leave or I don't know if I missed that or you could stay on for a little longer? Well, I can stay as long as you want. Cool, cool. Um, I had dinner. <laughs> um, let's see. Somebody asks. Okay, this is a Phineas and Ferb question. What did Jeremy like about Candace? What I like about you is no right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Jeremy was just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Well, Candace, uh, we tried to keep all the characters endearing. Yeah. You know, except for Susie. Screw Susie. <laughs> and and Candace, for all her faults, for all of her manic behavior, um, 
she had good qualities too. And yeah. we like, well, maybe Jeremy saw that. She's yeah. got a heart of gold. She turns into a complete bubblehead when he was around, like the first couple episodes. It's like, Ooh. hey, you want to go skiing? Oh, I'm afraid of chairlifts. Cool, later. Come on, Dee Dee. She's like, <laughs> no, not Dee Dee. She's like, yes, I'm your Swedish cousin. Dee Dee. That was, um, I think that was Bobby Gaylor. Um, let's see. Was was any of Doofenshmirtz's arc in Milo Murphy's Law planned when Phineas and Ferb was still in production? No. No, we didn't. <laughs> When we were working on Phineas, we didn't. He <laughs> didn't know about Milo. You know about Milo Murphy. It's like, <laughs> yeah. But uh, once once Milo took off, and we were using a lot of the backgrounds and material from Phineas. So yeah. and people started speculating: Are they in Danville? And it's like, yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They just live on the other part of town. Um. Somebody asked, "When is Ferb's birthday?" That's uh, it's February 29th. That's. Yep. Um. Yeah. Would you rather? Best, would you ask? Uh, on the same day that. Uh, four years no, earlier. Mom's, mom's birthday is the same day as Vanessa's. Uh, I don't know. I read <laughs> it in a fandom thing like yesterday. <laughs> um, would you rather spend a day with Milo and the gang or Phineas and Ferb? Oh, all of them. All of them together, yeah. Well, I think I I like the Milo character, but you know it'd be a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like Phineas's enthusiasm. I'd like to hang out with those guys. What's What's your favorite future for Doof? Checkers with Perry and a midlife crisis, high school teacher, agent with Alka, or Professor Time? <laughs> well, you know he's all of them, right? Yeah. You know, he could be Professor Time and just kind of jump around back and forth. Yeah, we always like to talk about what's the order? Is it Doof 101 and then the Alka files? Because Doof 101 implies that he got he was offered prison time and then he had to do community service as a teacher but then what's what's with the crossover and where is that set in the fall after the summer did he finish his time as a teacher what happened well because he's professor time none of that is relevant exactly exactly pops in, he pops out when he wants all gets and, written over and doofenshmirtz for everything that's against him everything that goes wrong he just keeps coming back Heinz law <laughs> like Heinz law it sounds like a salad. <laughs> no, let's see. Um, people are talking about some of their favorite songs. Robot Riot, Ballad of Klimpaloon. Did you direct Robot Riot for Across the Second Dimension? With that huge battle scene with those wild storyboards? With like every oh, invention? Yeah, yeah. No, that was uh, Kyle Minky. That was Kyle. <laughs> That's not surprising. Again, it was Kyle, yeah. Anytime you need that big, that big wild thing. Yeah. yeah. Robot Riot. Yeah, that was a good one. Gosh, I like that one. Somebody's saying their version of the going to the zoo song is Strangled at the Zoo. Strangled <laughs> at the Zoo. Strangled at the Zoo by Cavendish. Oh, I couldn't stand that song. <laughs> you hated the zoo song? <laughs> couldn't stand it. I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> it became a big running joke, that's for sure. Got actual squirrels in my pants. <laughs> squirrels in my pants. <laughs> um, somebody's saying, I love the Half a Day song. Yeah, the Carpet Ride song from Phineas and Ferb is great. Oh, yeah. Um, the area, Aerial Area Rug. Yeah. <laughs> you can vary your view of the area from our Aerial Aerial Rug. That was supposed to be like uh, Aladdin, right? The Whole New World parody, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, that was Jay's, uh, Jay Lender show. Yeah. Um, Elliot and Bradley should team up more. <laughs> I like it, yeah. I think Bradley was hugely underrated. Um, but it's Vincent, you know. It's, somebody's uh, somebody's asking, you've you mentioned a couple things, but is there anything that you can tell us about Candace Against the Universe? <laughs> nope. Sorry. Nope. Nothing. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I know a few things, but <laughs> I ain't got... Hey, wait a minute. Oh, oh. yeah. No, yeah, you're good. Hey! You got a job. You got a job? No, he, uh, Mike Dietrich did. Ah, oh, sweet. Mike, Mike Dietrich's art is, um, he's, uh, he's older than me, so he's, he kind of grew up with head comics. Um, um, uh, what's his name? The keep on trucking guy. <laughs> See, now I'm forgetting names again. Yeah. But, uh, 
he just got on the Freak Brothers. Ooh. Yeah. All right. Um, on character arcs, do you think there's room for Doof to be accepted by the Murphy family or Bradley to warm up to Milo or Victor Verlezer to get either comeuppance or redemption? Victor Verlezer. Everybody, everybody likes Doof. And the only one who really had a problem with Doof was uh, Sarah anyway, right? Yeah. Martin was very sarcastic around him for sure, but... <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, it wouldn't take much for those two to bond on something. Yeah, like they were given that they're both dads. Like, yeah, and they... It seems like, yeah, they could just, like, go to the bar and have a good time, you know? Yeah. Kind of like Dan and Dakota. <laughs> doof, Doof and Dakota. Uh, as far as Victor Verlezer... <laughs> <laughs> He's kind of just a, a nasty guy. Yeah. Uh, what do you yeah. think of uh, Apple TV's Central Park having the two main kid characters wearing similar clothes to Phineas and Ferb? Uh, you know, I directed one of those episodes. Oh, you did? And and uh, I didn't get credit for it. What? Yeah. How does that happen? What? Well, I, left the, I left the show. Um, After you discovered that they were taking Phineas well, and Ferb. The reason I left the show was because they stole their colors. Really? That was, that no. was, okay, I was going to be like, wow. I know uh, one of the characters, uh, um, see, names, here go the names again. Um, I haven't seen it, so I can't, I can't help you there. It's, uh, you know, the, the pilot that they showed me for Central Park was fun and lyrical, and the music is really good. Yeah. And uh, as the show went along, they just made it look like Bob's Burgers. And I, I love Bob's Burgers, but compared to the pilot what this thing was going to look like and what they ended up with i'm like it was really disappointing and that i mean that happens and like you said you know networks they want to know familiar so if they're going to introduce a new show you might as well take the animation style and i think that's that's true even of milo is you know take the phineas animation style to help sell it same thing with like solar opposites taking rick and morty style central park taking bob Berger's style it's yeah just, well, that's just it. Everybody's trying to establish their brand. And what is the Nickelodeon brand now? Does it look like, uh, does it look like uh, Loud House or does it look like, you know? I think that's their biggest cartoon right now. Is T I think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the other one. That's, ah, you know, that's funny. Rise of I, uh, uh, Dan and I both worked on the original uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. It was on networks. We were both uh, storyboard cleanup. That was... <laughs> Years and years ago. That was back when you couldn't digitally clean up, right? And it was like you had to... Literally draw over other people's drawings. Right. And if you screwed up, you screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, will Poof and Plots ever be accepted to Love Muffin? And is Muff Love Muffin disbanded in Milo Murphy's Law now that Doof isn't evil? No, Love Muffin is like Hydra. <laughs> They're just, they're just always underground. Cut off one head, another another caricature will pop up. <laughs> and then Doof was never really part, of, you know, he was part of Love Muffin, but he was always at odds with them. <laughs> yeah. Like when uh, when they uh, moved the sun, or when they pulled the earth away from the sun, he was kind of... <laughs> He was kind of against them from the beginning. Yeah. So he's like, he's quoting like, you sound like a bashful Santa Claus pitching softballs to a girl in a bikini. <laughs> Joe Arantia. I'll well, tell you that. You don't know what that sounds like. You know what's funny is, is uh, I can, uh, when you when you go on uh, D, D Plus, when you go on Disney Plus, yeah. you look at the episodes and the pictures, they freeze frame for each episode. I can tell you who drew every one of those things. Really? It's that yeah. that distinct? That's well, wild. because I remember them, you know, and, yeah. I, and I know people's styles, and sometimes their style really does go through there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> under no circumstances will anyone say bananas for cabanas. Wow, we got three job offers. I told you this guy was good. Wow. Dude, yeah. That is sweet. Um. He, he, Family Guy, holy shucks! Is that show still going on? Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> I worked on it uh, before it got canceled and came back. I love how Dan's like, yeah, if I'd never got Phineas, I'd probably still be there on Family Guy. Well, 
Yeah, Seth offered him a lot of money to stay because Dan was his musical number guy. Yeah. That's and you got you got to become that guy for somebody. That's how you that's how you really make it. It's like, you know, you become reliable enough for somebody to give you a call and just say, "Hey, can I get you to do this?" And it's like, "Yep." We had this uh, uh really there was a, a, a song sequence, Give Up the Toad on Family Guy, uh, first season. You guys have probably never seen it. Yeah. But it was in such bad shape. Dan and I went back in and just gutted it and redid it. Yeah. We worked on that one. All right. Um, will there be a Milo movie? <laughs> well, if they don't renew the series, I don't know why they would. But... It's weird. It's like they want to bring stuff back, but they don't want to keep going with stuff. It baffles me that they didn't promote the heck out of Milo Season 2 having Doof. That seems like such an easy promotional... Like, throw that in on, like, just an ad-up that Perry and Doof are in it, and, like, <laughs> air it more than once. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they... Uh, I think they... Uh, hang on a second. They just don't take the fandom into consideration. No. You know? And and they should because, what the heck? Exactly. You know, my uh, you know my daughters they they just love things that that I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, it's like getting invested in the community and talking about the show. Yeah. Yeah, and if and if and and honestly, uh, I worked before the internet, and since the internet, it's so good to know that someone's out there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we making shows yeah it's just us like smacking tennis balls into the ocean we never heard anything no feedback anything like that well it's it's so cool now that like i can you know do this interview with you and all the different people worked on the show and learn about it and you know just make videos like all that's with the you know growing up with the internet it's been like it's been really <laughs> neat to be able to do yeah i think uh um did you ever talk to uh valerie or or uh... no I, I reached out to her but i didn't i didn't hear back um, yeah. it's, it's one of those where like I try to get uh, the contacts that I can but if not then it's like eh. I would yeah, like she's... to get Dan and Swampy here on here at some point I think uh, I think I think they've seen my stuff I don't know <laughs> Dan Dan follows me on TikTok <laughs> that's where we are <laughs> you follow him no he follows me oh. on TikTok it was like it was like whoa that was, that was yeah. yeah he's been goofing around with TikTok lately I'm like uh, <laughs> okie dokie <laughs> yeah it's like uh yeah just do another uh rap video yeah he's he's in lots of quarantine raps um did, when we did the first rap video for phineas um there was a line and the timers nobody knows what they you know little secret in the biz nobody really knows what it is or something like that yeah and then they stick their heads out and go what <laughs> and my timers could not hit their mark for that <laughs> video <laughs> like na, 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 what and they like come out like a half a beat late and it's like you guys what the hell technology so groovy put it in the animatic and make it a movie yeah that was a uh, our crane shot was sue in a chair and i'm pulling the chair <laughs> um thoughts on mike henry stepping down as cleveland brown Cleveland Brown? That's, I don't know. I'm lost. Oh, on Family Guy? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I don't know. I know, like, next to nothing about it, so. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Is there something to that? He's not, uh, he's not actually black, but he's doing a black voice. Yeah, that's, that's kind of been going across Hollywood lately, is they're replacing white people with black roles for... Uh, well, they actual... should. Yeah. What the hell? You know... It, it, I always, I always uh, liked my storyboard uh, crew, my team, my artists take on the script. I would look at a script or an outline and think one thing, and they might come up with something else. And it's like, you have to take that into consideration. Right. If somebody is going to do a voice, they're going to add to it. And the more authentic it is, the better. Yeah. You know that's true. Yeah, exactly, and that's why Kristen Bell stepped down from Central Park too. Oh, and I heard uh, um, Olivia Olson was uh, shooting for that one. Oh, really? Oh, perfect for that. Man, that would be so great to see her on a big. Uh, I mean, I know she got on Adventure Time, but like this would be like 
That'd be what really a pain, big. What a pain in the ass, though. She'd have to ADR like the first season. Because I think they're going into second season on that show. Oh, yeah. In Central Park, she'd have to go back and. Yeah. Um, I just didn't want to buy Apple TV. No, that makes sense. I got My H. It was the third episode, so I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your opinion on Dan's cover of Bad Guy as Doof? The, the Billie Eilish oh, song? <laughs> I didn't see it. No, no. Yeah. No, it's, it's wonderful. It's great. You can't <laughs> think. It was, it's funny. Uh, Dan had a band. Keep uh, Left. Keep Left, yeah. And it was named after somebody found a sign. It's a street sign somebody had up. Look, keep going. Oh, it's called oh so that's why the album was Signs from Felding. That makes sense. There it is. Somebody, Felding, found a sign. But uh, he would, uh, he and the band would always play at the Ice House. And they had, they had one song that was like really good. I don't think I ever told them that. There's, but there's, that, there's some, in, there's a, there's some interesting stuff. There's one song that is very interesting. It's called I Took Your Mom to Disneyland. It's very not 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 peachy. <laughs> Yikes! But uh, yeah, the uh, uh, Michael Cole Ross, um, his friend from that band, and I think another guy were uh, they wrote the theme song for uh, Phineas. Yeah. Um. Somebody's saying, have you seen a? Uh, have you seen the Random Ring shorts they've been doing on from Disney TVA or no? They're like little no, shorts what? with Doof and. Uh, Oh yeah, I did. I did. I saw one. It looks like Kyle's been boarding those. Oh really? Yeah. That well, no. Um, or or was it like Harmony? Was it kind of like puppets? Like it 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 looked. It wasn't Flash. I'll say that it wasn't Doof's Daily Dirt. Like how stiff and kind of. It was. Long. It was more fluid than they than previous stuff they've done. Like when the Doof's Daily Dirt, that was like obviously somebody threw that together in Flash, but like. <laughs> There was, there was one episode of Milo. I don't know if you directed this one, but I can I could just it, like we all saw. I was like, okay, this was there was zero budget because actually used puppeted for parts of it. It was Free Fall. It was in season two, and it's like all sky backgrounds, and like as they're falling, it's clearly just puppeted like they built puppets for the scene, and it's just like, oh Milo. <laughs> yeah, that was my episode. That was your episode. <laughs> At any time they. Anytime they come up with a, you know, you're going to save money, so you have to save money on an episode. And it's like, well, just do one where they're all falling through the whole thing. And I'm like, okay, sure. We'll make it work. There was an episode on Phineas where it's like, it all takes place in the dark. And it's like. Okay, but that one, that one was fun. I liked the eyeball animation. Well, I, didn't, that was... I didn't work on that one. No. <laughs> but the the uh, free fall, it was kind of uh, an episode that we worked on to keep us busy between seasons. Yeah, because like, you could tell it was written from season one because there were a few things that probably should have been tweaked. Like, I think Cavendish and Dakota call him the Murphy kid instead of just Milo. It was like what they called him before they knew him. And Oh, good eye. There's good some... Eye. Uh, but the, that might have been when it aired because we didn't make it, you know. Well, no, that. no, you, cha you changed it to the Cavendish and Dakota. Their banner, I'm sure, was supposed to be like, eat pistachios or something, but they changed it to don't litter our planet. For the aliens who are littering oh, the planet. Wait, your sound dropped out. Oh, can you hear me? No. I... Test, test, test one, two. It's showing on I my. Can, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, no, but the banner on the edge of the plane said like, uh, "Don't litter our planet." Like they were trying to stop the aliens from littering the planet <laughs> for their <laughs> mission. So like, you, it changed a couple things, but I think there are probably some script tweaks that just from it being a season one script that didn't get made. But I mean, it happens, you know, it's, you got to ship it. <laughs> it's... Fix my spelling. Uh, there we go. He's very excited about getting a new job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, One of them is a show that I'm on, but it'll only run till August. Is it like, is it getting a proper finale or? Are they just no, this, this show, uh, the show that I'm not talking about that I'm working on is, uh, they really missed the point. The writing is really bad. Oh, uh, I, I, but it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill the premise that it was it's a living. I'm waiting on something from DreamWorks. I was supposed to hear it today, but they put it off a week, but, uh, a Very project I'm kind of excited about. All right. Um, I'll oh. This was one. Uh, did you ever hear anything about the Isabel and the Fireside Girls spinoff? 
That'd be fun. That'd be a good way to go. I, no, I never did. And I want to say there was like a Variety article about it at one point where they brought it up and then it just never came to fruition. Well, what other secondary characters on on Phineas or on Milo could have their own spinoff? You know? Cavan, yeah, Cavan Puss the series. Okay, I'm in. <laughs> please, please. Get the... the most, the most uh, despised character in the world. Um, uh. how, how do the crew members, other crew members, see the Phineas and Milo wikis and like um how do they like feel about the fandom surrounding the show well it's weird a lot of the people on milo didn't work on phineas that's like, true yeah uh chris yabara never worked on phineas but they knew the show i yeah. mean some people knew the show so uh it was uh we really did have to represent the show on milo and they were two different styles they really were so it was a little, it was a little complicated, and uh, sometimes they didn't understand uh, the positive nature of the characters. Yeah, you know? it can be tough to write for you know the positive writing style, of Dan and Swampy. Yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. Yeah. absolutely. All right. Well, I think that is about all the questions from the stream. So thank you so much for coming on and doing the interview tonight. Sure. What is three yeah. hours? What the heck, man? Yeah, exactly. No, but it was fun. We covered so much stuff. It was it was a great chat. Oh well, good. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good. So, uh, yeah, so thank you guys so much for watching the stream, and uh, be sure to check out latest videos on the channel. We got some stuff about amphibia as well as um, Candace Against the Universe. There's a new. They're dropping a sneak peek on Saturday at the Comic Con online. So go and watch that. And I'll make a video about that after it comes out. Ooh, I want to see it. I want to see it. Yep. All right. So <laughs> see you guys soon. And bye.